Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Ariel Bowser. I'm calling to order this uh, meeting, uh, this hearing of the Committee on Economic Development. Today is Wednesday, April the 24th. It's 1010, and we're located in room 412 in the John A. Wilson uh, building. The purpose of today's hearing is to uh, take public testimony and testimony from the government on the mayor's FY 2014 budget proposals for two agencies in the committee's um, purview. Uh, we have conducted six hearings throughout the month of April, four of which took place on Monday. Um, these hearings allowed the public to weigh in on specific issues and concerns related uh, to the mayor's proposal uh, to inform the council's decisions uh, moving forward. Today we will hear from the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development as well as the Department of Housing and Community uh, development. Uh, let me say a few things about the Department of um, Planning and Eco the Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development. I uh, will also refer to it as DEMPED. Um, DEMPED assists the Mayor in the coordination of planning, supervision, um, and execution of programs, policies, proposals, and functions uh, related to economic uh, development in the district. DEMPED sets development uh, priorities and policies coordinate how the district markets itself uh, to businesses and developers and recommends and ensures implementation of financial packaging for development, attraction, and retention efforts all across the, dist the district. DEMPED works to achieve its mission by focusing on outreach to the business community and neighborhood stakeholders and by forging partnerships between government, business, communities uh, to foster economic growth uh, in the city. Um, that strategy is centered on three major priorities, attracting business, revitalizing neighborhoods, and creating jobs. It's proposed that the Deputy Mayor's Office will receive a total increase of $3.8 million, a 9.1 increase compared to FY13 for a total operating budget of $46 million. That's a 9.1 in uh, a nearly a 10 percent increase compared uh, to last year's budget. This increase is largely attributable to costs associated with 23 new employees as well as step increases, fringe benefits, and a cost of living adjustment. The mayor's proposed capital budget for DEMPED during FY14 is $124 million, an increase of $58 million or uh, more than 53 percent, more than 50 percent from last year's capital budget, which was $66 million. The six-year capital plan for DEMPED is $301 million. The capital plan includes seven active projects, McMillan Sandfield Tracing Site, a Skyland Shopping Center, St. Elizabeth's um, Walter Reed redevelopment, the new communities at Berry Farm and Lincoln Heights, a new WASA, a DC water facility, uh, and an economic development pool as well as Poplar Point. There are also interesting policy changes in the mayor's budget, including a plan uh, to repeal 70 or to cancel the $70 million of financing for Great Streets. Uh, which we will want to hear from the Deputy Mayor about. So during the next several hours, uh, we'll discuss these proposals as well as um, allow members of the committee to ask any questions uh, to the agencies to provide the council greater insight to the mayor's proposal. Um, so with that, we will turn to hearing from members of the public. We'll follow the committee's normal rules, allowing members of the council to ask um, to have a round of questions and a statement at the beginning, um, and to hear from the public witnesses. We acknowledge members of the public um, to speak for three minutes, uh, and then we will hear from the government. Um, the government will be represented in the case of DEMPED by Victor Hoskins, who's the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. If you haven't signed up to testify, you may do so um, by speaking with my clerk. Um, and let me call the first panel. Michael Lee? Is Michael Lee here? 
Cheryl Court, Marjorie Goldberg, Aquanetta Anderson, Commissioner Aquanetta Anderson, Jessica Fulton, Simone Hostin, Nessa Pula Sittle, Chris Carter, Alex Nyhan. Any members of the public who have been test signed up who would like to testify? Okay, we'll begin with you, Ms. Court. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bowser. Um, my name is Cheryl Court, and I'm with a nonprofit called Coalition for Smarter Growth. We are a regional organization based in the District of Columbia, focused on ensuring transportation and development decisions are made with genuine community involvement and accommodate growth while revitalizing communities, providing more housing and travel choices, and conserving our natural and historic areas. Um, in this part of my testimony, I'm going to discuss, uh, I'm going to address uh, DEMPHED's um, budget. Uh, our, our main message is that DEMPHED needs to recommit to leveraging public land dispositions for affordable housing. We're greatly disappointed in DEMPHED's reduced expectations for affordable housing in new public land dispositions. Given the increasing challenge of housing affordability for our residents, we urge the Council to ensure DEMPED recommit to leveraging public land dispositions for affordable housing, including for very low-income households. In our 2012 report, Public Land for Public Good, we show that the district has and can do great things with its city-owned land. We are disappointed that DEMPED is departing from the practice of the past decade to ask for 20 to 30 percent of affordable housing in public land dispositions that are affordable to households earning 30, 50, 60, and eight, up to 80 percent of area median income. We are also surprised that the Mayor's Housing Task Force dropped any recommendation to make the most of public land sales for affordable housing and sent this issue to a future study list. Under DEMPED's current leadership, commitment to affordable housing in solicitations for public land division has steeply declined. DEMPED no longer asks for a specific percentage of affordable housing or specific income levels. Instead, DEMPED asks proposals to comply with or exceed the inclusionary zoning law, which is already required for most residential development. IZ seeks a minimum of 8 to 10 percent uh, set aside at 50 to 80 percent AMI, though much of the income targeting ends up being at the 80 percent AMI level, to compensate developers receive a 20 percent bonus density. Given that the city can and, ha and used to leverage the value of its own land to subsidize housing, we should expect much more from public land deals. We recommend that DEMPED restore the earlier practice of asking for 20 to 30 percent set aside for income with income targeting at 30, 60, and no more than 80 percent area median income. The drop off in affordable housing in public land disposition solicitations as a priority is particularly surprising given the administration, how much the administration has put emphasis on renewing efforts to preserve and create affordable housing. Public lands are an important tool for creating and making the <clears throat> for creating affordable housing and making the most of this opportunity through leveraging the value of the district's, the district's land for affordable housing. The public land disposition and development requests should clearly ask for and prioritize proposals that, that offer substantial amounts of affordable housing, including units to those earning 30 percent of AMI. As was the practice in the past, we, we ask that requests specifically specify that the city seek, is seeking 20 to 30 percent of a total number of residential units affordable to, to 30, 60 to 30 and 60 percent AMI for rentals and up to 80 percent for 80 percent AMI for home ownership. We suggest, as we do in Table 2, which I've submitted to you, as we submit Table 2 as a model. In addition, we ask that DEMPED better coordinate with other agencies to pool resources to ensure the production of affordable housing at deeply affordable levels as a part of a larger mixed income or all affordable development. I'll uh, address my DHCD question, uh, testimony at that time, but that's um, the 
what I wanted to communicate to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Court. Ms. Halfon, I, I will have some questions for you. Ms. Fulton? Yes. Thank you, Councilmember Bowser, um, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Jessica Fulton, and I'm the Outreach Director at the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. We're a nonprofit organization that engages in research and public education on the fiscal and economic health of D.C., with an emphasis on the policies that affect low- and moderate-income residents. I'm here today to ask the D.C. Council to include reporting requirements for the New Communities Initiative in the Fiscal Year 2014 Budget Support Act. This will help improve transparency and public awareness of this initiative. Currently, it's difficult to tell how well this complex and long-term effort is working because even basic questions can't be answered. Outdated plans with outdated goals sit on the websites associated with the project, and it's unclear what progress is being made, how much is being spent, and if funding is sufficient. By requiring the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development to report on the condition of each of the new community sites, as well as plans and expectations for the future, the D.C. Council can ensure that new communities moves forward and meets the needs of D.C. residents. The program um, is one that attempts to revitalize subsidized housing sites in the surrounding neighborhoods in four D.C. communities, Park Morton, Northwest One, Berry Farms, and Lincoln Heights and Richardson Dwellings. The new community's guiding principles include one-for-one -one for replacement of existing subsidized housing units, giving current residents the opportunity to return if they're displaced during construction, mixed income housing to ensure long-term viability, and a build-first approach to minimize displacement. DEMPED should offer an annual summary of the status of each new community site. This would include details on financing, including how much money has been spent and for what reasons, and how much money is expected to be needed in the future. The annual update should also include information on the number of residential buildings, their completion status, and the number of units by income level. Each new community site is proposed to include also a number of amenities and services for residents in these communities. A complete summary would include information on the status of each of these planned amenities. For each current new community site, we recommend that DEMPED be required to provide information on the status and timing of all projects being built or renovated on the original site footprint. In addition, we suggest the DEMPE report on how many residents have been relocated, as well as how many have returned to the original site following new construction. The report should also include financing details for each on-site development, including total development costs and expected revenue sources. At each of the new community sites, D.C. has begun to move residents into new housing. Moving forward, DEMPE should be be required to report on this housing. We suggest the reports include the number of units and income mix to ensure that affordable housing is being maintained in each community. We would also suggest that DEMPE report on the status and timeline for each individual pro project and the financing details, including development costs and sources of revenue. The initiative includes a number of planned amenities for each site, such as playgrounds, recreation centers, and libraries. DEMPE should report on the plans and status of each amenity for each new community site. In addition, annual reports should include details on financing, including proposed sources of financing for future plans. Because amenities are a large portion of the new community's initi initiative, we feel that it is important to keep these projects on track. The initiative also includes a human capital component. It funds, new, it funds community organizations that provide case management and other resources for new community's residents. The annual report should include details about each program, including the number of residents served and the types of services offered. To ensure effectiveness, DEMPE should also report on the outcomes of its human capital programs. The New Communities Initiative is a major undertaking for the district involving significant public dollars and impacting the lives of thousands of low-income residents. Annual reporting will make this initiative more transparent, allowing the public to assess its impact and determine whether public dollars are being used effectively to improve the lives of its low-income residents. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Bowser and all the members of, the, of this Economic Development Committee. My name is Christian Carter, and I am the owner of New Columbia Enterprises, Inc. Um, NTE is an established firm of multiple professions and areas of expertise. We currently provide temporary staffing for over four district agencies. In the past, we have provided third-party staffing for the State Department's Procurement Division. We have also provided program management and community outreach for the newly built National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Headquarters in College Park at the University of Maryland. Under my leadership, NCE provided project management and outreach services for the small temporary facility projects like the design demo build 
for the Washington Hull Gates and the Washington Castles Tennis Stadium on the Southwest Waterfront. Madam Chairwoman, I have a personal and business interest in testifying today. I am a small businessman of Washington and have particular interest in the St. Elizabeth East Campus project. Before I get any deeper into these matters, I would like to say that my testimony has no interest in making accusations or pointing blame at DEMPED in any way. Actually, I feel that Deputy Mayor Hoskins, Brian Kenner, Jackie McDonald, and her procurement team is making considerable progress in the areas of being sensitive to CBEs in the community here, in this difficult community for CBEs here in Washington, D.C. Furthermore, I feel that it is our job as community members to keep this very sensitive topic in the forefront of this agency's goals among the other important issues that they have to deal with on a daily basis. As I said earlier, it is my in my testimony that I have personal and business interests in this St. Elizabeth project. My seventh generation father, Jacob Moore, a slave abolitionist and businessman of Hillsdale Southeast, <coughs> was a very influential force in creating what became one of the nation's first affordable housing development models directly after the Civil War called Potomac City, which is currently called Berry Farms. Also, the Jacob Moore Cemetery served the St. Elizabeth, Anacostia, and Berry Farms community area for over one century. So hopefully you can see my inherited interest in the progress of this project's impact on our surrounding communities. Also, Madam Chairwoman, with my firm being the apparent lowest bidder for the St. Elizabeth Community Outreach Solicitation, I would like to make the Deputy Mayor's Office aware that I am extremely excited about servicing the St. Elizabeth community with extraordinary performance. This concludes my testimony, and I thank you for your time, and I hope that DEMPED will embrace NCE with the same excitement as well. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Um, let me start with uh, you, Ms. Court, because you provided the, the committee with a, 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 a table um, that supports your testimony, and you're very specifically asking, and I'm assuming that you're asking that we deal with this in the Budget Support Act of um, requiring DEMPED or getting an answer from the Deputy Mayor today about why DEMPED is not uh, using its public land dispositions to achieve our affor affordable housing goals. Is that your testimony? Correct. Okay. Um, so what you've uh, submitted to the committee, and we'll share this with the Deputy Mayor as well, so when he comes up he can respond to it, is that um, in the Williams administration, and you don't, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you meet in the entire time, uh, you say that there was a 20% set aside in public land dispositions, 5% uh, at 30% AMI, 5% at 60% of AMI, and 10% at 80% of AMI. And so is that for all public land deals? It was, a it was the goal. It wasn't always the case that that exactly okay. happened, but okay. that's, um, uh, it certainly happened many times, and it certainly was a solicitation. <clears throat> was it, uh, when you say it was the goal, did it appear, was it a directive from the mayor? Was it a mayor's order? How, how did, uh, how was it codified? It appeared in solicitations. For it appeared in all in the, the solicitations. In the LDAs, or Got for it. the public. The okay. And so you report here also that in the Fenty administration, um, the goal was even greater at 30% set a total set aside, 15% at 30 percent of AMI, so that's also a larger percent yes. um, in the very in the lowest income level, and 50 percent, uh, 15 percent as well at 60 percent of AMI, um, the the middle bracket of um, income levels, and then you also refer to the Anacostia waterfront land laws um, that required a 30 percent affordable housing. Uh, set aside 15 percent at 30 percent of AMI and 15 percent at 60 percent of AMI. Um, so, and in, in then you report that in the current administration, um, the, the set aside is only per the inclusionary zoning requirements of eight to eight to ten percent. Um, uh, explain to me what what you think the Gray administration is doing in their 
solicitations? Well, unlike uh, the administration has continued uh, very specific percentage set-asides for, say, LSDBE uh, contractors, um, but they've dropped uh, a numeric target any specificity basically for affordability targets except to say to meet or exceed inclusionary zoning standards which um, complying with the law is required by any parcel that is subject to that law it's, it's most of the city not all of the city not downtown development district but um, uh, most properties and most developments would end up being su subject to inclusionary zoning so our concern is that it seems that uh, the administration has shifted priorities away from affordable housing as a uh, priority on uh, public lands and simply uh, suggesting that applicants apply, comply with the inclusionary zoning law, which would be uh, any developer would be obligated uh, to comply with IZ if, if their property is subject to IZ. Well, you know, to play devil's advocate, what I imagine one might say is that we didn't have exclusionary zoning until recently. Right. <clears throat> uh, well, that's fine. I mean, these these properties would also be subject to inclusionary zoning, but the city doesn't have to sell its land to the private sector. So we ought to get some pretty substantial public benefits back. And I would think that inclusion that affordable housing would be top among those. Okay. Got it. And so. Um, We've also heard from the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute about uh, new communities. As you know, we're focused on it, and your recommendation is to include some reporting requirements in the BSA? Right. Okay. So we'll, we'll look at um, seeing how we can fit that in. I think uh, that we have certainly learned that we need to know more about new communities, what the targets are. Um, actually, I'm still kind of waiting to see what the, the adjusted timeline is. I'm not sure that I have that information from our last hearing. Um, so we'll figure out where we are with that and how we can make um, that information transparent and open to the public. So thanks for your focus on, on that as well. Um, and Mr. Carter, I don't know that I have any additional questions. Uh, your testimony is you want to be involved at St. Elizabeth's. Absolutely. Okay. I got it. Loud and clear. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. your testimony. Are there any other public witnesses who wish to testify on the mayor's proposal for um, DEMPED? Okay, we'll hear from the government. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hoskins. morning. Well, we're ready when you are. Okay. Very good. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Bowser, members of the Committee on Economic Development and staff. I'm Victor Hoskins. The Is your microphone on, Victor? It's on, yes. Okay. I, I think okay. the volume I think I was down. Better now. And let me, let me just make sure our support staff knows that we're going to be looking at you. So the camera should be on the, on the witness. Okay. Thank you. Ready? All right. Very good. Um, as I was saying, I'm Victor Hoskins, the Deputy Mayor of Planning and Economic Development for the District of Columbia. I'm pleased to testify before you today uh, to both highlight some of the accomplishments from fiscal year 13 as well as share our agency's proposed fiscal year 14 plan. First, I would like to thank all the public witnesses for their testimony. Much of our work um, would not be possible without their input. 
Second, I would like to thank um, the members of the Committee on Economic Development for their collaborative spirit on our work. And finally, I want to thank Mayor Gray for his One City vision. Um, and I'd like to express my appreciation to my staff, um, the staff of the Economic Development cr Cluster, for their tireless work. Um, often I receive credit for their great work. Um, without their leadership, our work would not be possible. Leaders like Brian Kenner, my chief of staff to my right, Jeff Miller, my director of real estate, over to my left, Dave Zipper to my immediate left, director of business development, Nick Majet, uh, my director of DCRA, Lisa Mallory, my director of the Department of Employment Services, and other outstanding DIMPED cluster leaders. Um, their work really um, is what, what helps us get to the goal line. Over the last two years, I've had the opportunity to meet many ANC members and community organizations and residents um, to discuss the challenges in economic development. And it's really through this community engagement that my team and I are able uh, to make informed decisions about the direction for economic development and growth for the District of Columbia. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget submission focuses on three priorities. One, growing and diversifying the economy. Two, educating our children and preparing our workforce for, the, for a new economy. And three, providing the quality of life for all residents. Our work at DEMPED supports all three of these important priorities. Let me start with an overview. The Office of the D Deputy Mayor of Planning and Economic Development has two primary components, real estate development and business development. Additionally, we are responsible for the management of the efforts of the Industrial Revenue Bond Program um, headed by um, Will Liggins and the D.C. Workforce Investment Council headed by Allison Gerber. My office is directly responsible for economic development for the city and managing nine cluster agencies working in and around the planning and economic development for the district. Our budget allocations, both operating funds and capital funds, provide the resources to support the economic development activities of our agency. From, for business development, we have an expanding role in being a bridge to the district's creative economy. The office has been increasing its sector development work in business development to attract, nurture, and retain businesses such as small, local, corporate, tech, retail, medical, and government contracting. For real estate development, we are leading the redevelopment of several large projects including the former Walter Reed Army Medical Center site and the East Campus of St. Elizabeth site. In addition, we are focused on furthering neighborhood development through such programs as the Great Streets Initiative and New Communities. To share more, I'd like to begin with Fiscal Year 13 review, and I will start our, with our real estate uh, development efforts. Since I began my tenure as Deputy Mayor in February of 2011, DIMPED has been working diligently to move real estate development projects forward, many of which have been stalled for decades. Through the Office's economic development efforts, 57 real estate development projects have been completed under construction or anticipated to have groundbreaking. These projects include the Costco at the Shops of the Dakotas, um, which, is which was completed, uh, City Center, which is under construction, and St. Elizabeth's Gateway Pavilion, which will break ground um, within the next month. The real estate development projects, when completed, will result in 1.7 million square feet of retail, 1.39 million square feet of office space, and 5,070 units of housing, of which 1,807 are affordable units. In addition, DIMPED's real estate development portfolio has created 10,544 construction jobs and 12,246 permanent jobs over the last two years. And this has been evidenced by the drop in the unemployment rate um, from 11.2% now down, um, reported last month, to 8.5%. Currently, DIMPED has 33 projects under construction, including City Center, City Market at O Street, Park 7 at Minnesota Benning, the Convention Center Hotel, New Communities 2M Parcel, and the Boilermaker Shops at the Yards, adjacent to the Yards Park. These projects will deliver 1 million square feet of retail, 665,000 square feet of office, 3,421 units of housing, and 1,077 of those units will be affordable um, over the next few years. Twelve of these redevelopment projects have anticipated completion dates of 2013, including 360 H Street, 360 degrees H Street, the Heights on Georgia Avenue, and new communities of 4800 Nanny Helen Burroughs. In addition, the real estate projects currently under construction will create 8,700 construction jobs and 9,200 permanent jobs. 
the Industrial Revenue Bond Program, which supports institutional partners in the district, saw an issuance of over $320 million worth of bonds in 2012, 1,371 construction jobs, 814 permanent jobs, which assisted various associations, universities, and charter schools in, the, um, in undertaking the needed renovations, expansions, or refinancing opportunities. In 2013, to date, the IRB program has issued over $426 million worth of bonds associated with 11 projects. Approximately 10 more deals are in the pipeline for the remainder of the year. When all these projects are completed, we will have created a total of 11,925 construction jobs, 13,060 permanent jobs. Connecting real estate development with business development is crucial um, to how we grow and expand and diversify our economy. One of my major goals as Deputy Mayor has been to expand the business development sector of DEMPED to target international opportunities, focus on specific growth sectors of the economy that will lead to future prosperity, work to better attract and match retailers to existing projects in the pipeline in order to reduce retail leakage outside of the district, and to focus on the needs of area business owners, both large and small. To further these goals, DEMPED has accomplished the following. One, launch the district's first ever comprehensive five-year economic development strategy to realize six transformative visions through 52 initiatives that will create 100,000 new jobs and one billion in new tax revenue over the next five years. Two, in conjunction with the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership, DIMPED has held several bus tours for retailers and brokers to learn more about locational opportunities in wards four, five, seven, eight, and throughout the district. Three, we've worked with the Council to pass Technology Sector Enhancement Act to improve the, the D.C. tech incentives. Four, we've attracted Fortify VC, the region's first uh, technology accelerator, now fully operational and graduated its first 12 businesses. Also, 1776, a co-working space for growing tech companies. Five, we've launched an, an aggressive Great Streets funding program for small businesses targeting ma major uh, underinvested retail corridors like Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast and Georgia Avenue. And sixth, establish the DC China Center to create a new focus on foreign direct investment, tourism, international education, and technology in the district. And that's just to name a few. The Workforce Investment Council has been transformed over the last two years and has undertaken a range of reforms designed to strengthen accountability and performance of the district's workforce system. The new five-year state integrated workforce plan establishes a new vision, mission, and goals for the district's workforce investment, and the WIC is working to implement this strategy by establishing new standards for service delivery in the D.C. American Job Center and overhauling requirements for providing of adult and youth training programs. In addition, the WIC is moving forward quickly to implement the Workforce Intermediary Pilot Program approved by the Council, engaging employers in hospitality and construction sectors to identify training and placement strategies that will help hundreds of D.C. residents find and keep family supporting jobs in these industries. Fiscal Year 2014 Priorities. Looking ahead to the remainder of fiscal year 13 and into fiscal year 2014, my team and I will continue to push forward to move economic development projects and initiatives to realize Mayor Gray's vision for a diversified economy and a skilled workforce to fill the job opportunities we create. I would like to share with you our goal for, uh, for the upcoming years, our goals for the upcoming years. I'll begin with affordable housing. Affordable housing. Mayor Gray has committed $100 million to affordable housing. Of that, $86.9 million will be allocated toward housing the Housing Production Trust Fund in fiscal year 2013 and fiscal year 2014, and $13.1 million will be allocated for fiscal year 14 in accordance with the recommendations of the Affordable Housing Task Force. Workforce Investment Council. This budget includes federal funding under the Workforce Investment Act to support the Workforce Investment Council and to carry out oversight responsibilities with respect to the district's workforce system, including implementation of new policies for adult and youth job training programs. This budget also calls for 1.6 million of local funds to support the workforce intermediary in fiscal year 2014. The intermediary has been a, cr a crucial tool uh, to add to our playbook 
as we create a pilot program to train and match district residents in targeted industry sectors. The workforce intermediary will help us build on the successes we have seen with the Mayor's One City, One Hire program, which has placed more than 5,700 D.C. residents at more than 891 hiring partners by allowing district agencies to engage with employers and develop long-term strategies to support the growth and competitiveness in key sectors. Business development. The five-year economic development strategy launched this past fall includes a roadmap and distinct goals um, to implement six visions for the district's economy which includes making the district the most business-friendly jurisdiction in the nation. The sector-led approach of the strategy relies on both public and private sector associations and universities to realize the goal, the goals. DIMPED has been taking an active role in beginning to implement 20 initiatives by the end of the summer and will continue to pave the way for implementation of all 52 initiatives, which we believe will result in 100,000 new jobs and $1 billion in new tax revenue. DIMPED will continue to support the success of the D.C. China Center to encourage international trade, such as foreign direct investment in the district, and companies expanding their portfolios to include work in the district or abroad in China. Additionally, it has, been, it has become a great uh, resource for our universities to, to also seek technical business assistance and expand upon their university partnerships in China. Last month, I led a group of representatives from George Washington University, the University of the District of Columbia, American University, and Howard University on a trade mission to China. And as a result, Howard University is exploring an innovative concept to educate business leaders about business opportunities in Asia, North America, and Africa. Real estate development. A number of real estate development projects will continue to see progress in fiscal year 14, including Skyland Town Center. All outstanding litigation has been successfully closed at the district level, and relocations continue to move forward. We anticipate uh, a surplus disposition of the site this calendar year, and we look forward to working with the Economic Development Committee to move forward with this long-anticipated redevelopment. The 2014 budget includes $40 million in capital funding for major road, water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure to improve the site. McMillan Town Center Complex. Our team continues to work closely with the residents and neighborhoods in Ward 5 on the McMillan project. Over the next five years, the proposed $47.8 million in capital budget funds will help to accelerate this site into a world-class development that will create linkages between institutions like Washington Hospital Center, Children's Hospital Center, Trinity, and Catholic Universities, to thriving communities like Stronghold, Eckington, Bloomingdale, and, downtown, and the downtown core. Walter Reed Town Center. Demped issued the request for qualification for a master developer for, Walter Reed, for the Walter Reed site. After selecting qualified respondents from among the nine firms that responded to the RFQ, district officials in early May will issue a request for proposal. During the review period over the summer, the responding firms will present their development proposals to the community. A winning developer will be selected no later than mid-fall after an opportunity for the Advisory Neighborhood Commission uh, to comment. HUD continues to evaluate the Homeless Assistance Submission, and we hope to have a final um, approval soon. Currently, the Community Advisory uh, Group has been assisting with the potential interim uses to present to the Army. Programming a facility that is currently owned by the Army can be challenging, and I recognize and appreciate the time and the effort of those working towards achieving practical interim uses for the site. The 2014 budget includes $1 million in capital funding to support staff and outside consultants, in addition uh, to required studies, such as the environmental studies that may need to be performed with support of the district. St. Elizabeth East Campus. The 2014 budget includes $29.5 million for infrastructure construction of roads, sewer, and other required improvements. The Gateway Pavilion Project, due to break ground this spring, is an innovative food and retail pavilion that will serve a range of interim uses and allow the visitors to experience the site as a redevelopment is underway. It will also serve the community as well as the estimated 3,700 Coast Guard employees who will occupy the 1.5 million square feet on the new Department of Homeland Security campus starting this fall. The Gateway Pavilion will be one of the district's first net zero projects and is scheduled to open this summer. 
In addition to the major projects that I've mentioned above, DIMPED has released six solicitations this year for projects including 965 Florida Avenue, Berry Farm, um, Hill, Hill East, and the Historic Franklin School. We look forward to selecting developers and working with the council and the community to move these projects forward. Moreover, we'd like, we'd like to release an additional 10 solicitations later this year, which will be negotiated in fiscal year 14. Our focus on economic development to create one city for the entire district is a pillar of the Gray administration. I look forward to our continued collaborative effort, efforts in creating one city. Much has been accomplished, however, there is still much to be done. My team and I now would like to walk you through a quick presentation covering our budget and priority projects that I have discussed. We look forward to taking questions from you once we have concluded our presentation. Thank you. Thank, Deputy Mayor, I do have your presentation. Um, which part of this is related to the budget? Pardon me? Which part is related to the budget? All of it. I, know, I just noticed some of this from the, the last hearing. Yeah, it's to give you context for what we're doing. Okay. So you want to go over all the slides? Yeah, because it relates to fiscal year 14. Okay. Uh, you know, the development process is, is very long. I mean, some, some cycles are 18 months, some are 36 months. So when you see what we've done, you can see how it relates to what we're going to do. And that's why we've laid it out this way. We didn't include 12. We only included uh, fiscal year 13 going forward. No, I appreciate yeah. that. But we have um, separated the hearing so that mm -hmm. such that we can talk about the performance last month. Mm -hmm. which we spent a lot of time doing, which yeah, was yes. very instructive for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could, as you go through your slides, just be mindful of what we've gone over already. Yeah, um, and, and this so will be quick. Can, so that we can focus on the budget yeah. items. Yeah, this will be, be quick. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, first of all, we are, we're going to walk through um, our, our budget itself, and then we're going to walk through real estate development projects, uh, some of our business development activity, our economic development initiatives, and our workforce development. Next slide. So we have 33 major projects under construction right now. Um, we've created over 8,000 construction jobs, um, 8, uh, 835 units of, of housing, um, and 382 affordable units right now. Our workforce investment launched its, um, its first funding of the workforce intermediary. Um, that's going to happen this year. And unemployment has dropped, as I mentioned earlier. The district continues to receive the best of um, recognition um, from a number of sources, including Forbes, Kaufman, Urban Land Institute. Um, these are just some of them. Number one, strongest economy in the U.S., number one uh, for U.S. tech hotspot. Um, and we just recently received uh, number one in startups per, uh, per capita in the United States. Um, this just provides a just a small overview of, of our operating budget. Fiscal year 13, it was for, roughly 42.3 million. Uh, proposed for fiscal year 14 is 46 million dollars. Um, the majority of that increase uh, is related to a, a, a sort of step up as it relates to the uh, full-time employee number that we are allocated. In fiscal year 13, it was 61 full-time FTEs, and in fiscal year 14, we are proposing to have 84. Uh, full-time FTEs. Um, in addition, just a, a few highlights on um, some of the, the items that we focus on in fiscal year 13 from our operating budget. I think the Deputy Mayor spoke a little bit about uh, on the business development side, we had 1776. We had some neighborhood tours. Um, the workforce intermediary um, continues to be an important component of our workforce strategy which we anticipate having a few um, RFPs released this year specific to the hospitality sector. Uh, the Bank on DC program continues to be successful. I think to date we have uh, helped uh, some of the underbanked residents in the District of Columbia open more than 4,000 new accounts, which we estimate has saved about 3.5 million in fees for those, for those individuals. Uh, the picture to the right shows the medical forum that uh, the mayor recently hosted. Uh, to talk about uh, medical institutions here in the District of Columbia. And then finally, we've got our H Street Grant Program, which I think to date has awarded close to a million dollars worth of, of small businesses uh, to help diversify the retail opportunities that are along H Street Northeast. <laughs> I think the Deputy Mayor covered many of the, the existing uh, capital budget highlights that we uh, 
have been focusing on, on in fiscal year 13. For fiscal year 14, um, you know, we've got Walter Reed um, uh, Army Medical Center. We, we we're waiting for the, the HUD response, but we have we are continuing to move forward in terms of interim use uh, planning for the site. Uh, Poplar Point, uh, the Capitol Riverfront uh, area, we have a, an opportunity to continue to try to uh, move forward with the development um, potential in the Capitol Riverfront area. St. Elizabeth, we are continuing with uh, much of our road infrastructure as well as completion of our um, temporary pavilion that will be located uh, there later on this year. Uh, continuing with the new communities uh, initiative in the four targeted areas. And then finally, Skyland, um, continuing to support the pre-development and infrastructure needs of that project. With that, I will turn it over to Jeff to talk a little bit about real estate. <clears throat> uh, good morning. Um, if you turn to the next slide, the next slide shows sort of a snapshot of where we are today with projects that have been recently completed, projects that are uh, under construction, and uh, groundbreaking that we expect uh, in this year. And uh, the importance of this map really is to show how widely dispersed across the city our projects are. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows the, the activity that, w that we're undergoing right now. I think the big numbers to take away from here are we have 57 projects that are completed under construction or uh, about to go undergo groundbreaking, um, the vast majority of which were not even being considered uh, two years ago. Before you start, um, continue, it just let me uh, request, yes. um, because there are a number of slides I might break, break in. On Please. this uh, slide 10, is there a, a spreadsheet of these projects that you can uh, give me? Certainly. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, in response to some of the prior testimony today uh, about our uh, uh, delivery of affordable units uh, of the projects we have under construction now, um, about 35 percent of them will be considered affordable units. So I think that's a, that's a, a pretty substantial um, meeting of, uh, of an internal goal that we like to set. Uh, and finally, um, the total, um, total dollar amount of $4.7 billion, which is a considerable amount of investment in the city. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is another map that is really uh, very difficult to read, unfortunately, but um, we will go through some of the details of it in a second. But this is, again, showing how widely dispersed the projects that we have under construction are in the city. Uh, both, uh, and that dispersal includes not only geographic dispersal, but also the kinds of projects we're working upon, and then also the size and scale of the projects. Um, next slide, please. Of the projects we have under construction, again focusing on affordable housing for a minute, um, about 30 percent of the project of the of, uh, units that we we will be delivering uh, from this batch of 33 units is about 30 percent. So again, I think that's a laudable goal. Um, and then again, 3.6 billion dollars worth of development that is currently under construction and should deliver in the next two years. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is again is a, as a map uh, to show where we're, what we expect to be completed uh, in the near term in this year, and we can go through the details of that in the next slide. Uh, 368 Street is uh, uh, a, a multifamily and mixed-use deal with a large, giant grocery store over on 8th Street Northeast. 77 H Street is a similar project with a, a significant amount of multifamily uh, above a Walmart over at uh, 7th and uh, New Jersey and H. Uh, city center parcel A consists of about 2 million square feet of mixed use, residential, including condos and apartments, uh, office and retail. Uh, the Fort DuPont Nation, uh, Nationals Baseball Academy. The Her Home, which is in a, uh, a restoration of an historic building in Georgetown. Lincoln Heights, 4800 Ninny Helen Burroughs Avenue is 70 units of affordable housing. Uh, Eden Place is 29 units of affordable. Um, Northwest 1 to M Street is over 300 units, of which 93 are affordable, so again, about one third. Uh, the Capitol Street Firehouse is a, a new restaurant restoration of an existing building. Uh, Progression Place, we've already delivered the um, office portion, which um, uh, um, includes the housing of the United Negro College Fund, and now the uh, 200 units of um, a multifamily are being delivered there this year, again, of which 51 are affordable. 
uh, the Heights on George Avenue, we have 69 affordable units delivering, and the Yards Boilermaker Shops, which will be 43,000 square feet of retail. Um, the Deputy Mayor has uh, touched upon our real estate pri uh, development priorities. Um, we do have a, we have a solicitation that has been received for as an RFQ for uh, the Walter Reed Army Medical Center, for which we have had uh, nine responses. We hope to have a short list uh, to share with uh, with you in the next uh, five to ten days. Uh, the St. Elizabeth's Gateway Pavilion, University Anchor and Innovation Tenants, um, those are all RF, uh, RFPs and R or RFPIs that are uh, either underway or will break ground within the next 30 days. Um, Skyland, we're moving ahead. We've begun demolition and we'll be conveying, um, conveying the land to the developer within this next fiscal year. New Communities Barry Farm, we received solicitations from seven interested parties on a design build process. And then on New Communities Northwest One, uh, we will be having an RFP uh, solicitation for that that will go out this year. Uh, in the following slide, you get a sense of where we are today with our outstanding uh, solicitations. At 965 Florida Avenue, which is next to Howard University, um, we've had two responses and it's under evaluation. On Berry Farm, as I mentioned, that we've had seven responses. Um, is there gonna be a decision on 965 Florida Avenue? Um, the two developers are meeting with the community within the next uh, 15 days, uh, the ANC, to present. Is, that's not, no, I'm thinking of something else. What is the parcel uh, across from the Shaw Library? That's uh, f uh, parcel 42, and we should be indicating a, uh, a developer for, a chosen developer for that uh, by next week. And what is the status of um, the Fifth and I project? Fifth and I, the, the revised solicitation for that project will be going out uh, Thursday or Friday of this week. Fifth and I? Yes. So this was one that was canceled and you're going to reissue That's correct. this week? Is it because you don't have it on here? Uh, no, but this is, this is, these are projects that we already have that were RFPs have already been, already been issued. Parcel 42 was issued, frankly, over a year ago, and, and we, we didn't think it was relevant to talk about in the 2012-2013 budget. So do you have a list of projects that are going to be issued this year? We do, and we can share that with you. Okay, because that's what would be relevant for this budget. And, um, and for your information, we'll be having an event in May to uh, roll out those projects to the um, to the private sector um, in a in a form similar to what we did last July. Okay. Uh, on Hill East, um, we are meeting with the community today uh, to present this uh, project, or the developers will be meeting to present the project to the community on that project. Again, that that project remains under evaluation. Um, the master developer, we should have a short list that we'll be issuing to the developer and to uh, you uh, by the end of this week. And St. Elizabeth, we, we continue uh, to have a solicitation open on the academic and research anchor, and Franklin School um, is also an open solicitation where we'll be having an information center with the, with the interested parties uh, Friday at 10 a.m. at the site. So does a short list at Walter Reed mean all qualified developers? You said you hit nine. So if nine are qualified, that's the short list? No. No. But there will be a short list. It's shorter. Yeah, it's shorter. But so what makes it, shor what makes it shorter? You know, we reviewed the qualifications um, uh, that were that were frankly and, and some of the questions that were frankly required to be responded to, um, and some developers uh, had that experience and some developers uh, didn't or weren't able to respond to some of those questions. Okay, so some aren't qualified. That's correct. Okay, so all of the qualified developers will move forward in the process. That's correct. Okay. And that concludes my real estate portion. Um, thank you, Council Member. I will be um, I'll be very brief in terms of uh, the business development section. Uh, if you go to the next slide here, um, just provide some brief context in terms of, of what uh, business development has been has been focused on, which really informs what we're going to be doing in the next year. Uh, you're familiar, Council Member, with the, the, the five year economic development strategy, um, which came out last November, and uh, that has as its goal, creating 100,000 jobs and a billion dollars in new tax revenue over the next five years. That's sort of our game plan, really, for DEMPEN, especially for the business development team. So that we're focused very much on implementing the initiatives within it and achieving the broad visions that are outlined within that strategy. Um, a, few, a few of the other very important initiatives ongoing right now or have been concluded very recently, 
the bus tours that, I know that, that we work on with the DC Economic Partnership to bring retailers to emerging retail areas in wards one, four, five, seven, and eight. The tech sector work where we have attracted Fortify.vc, the first tech accelerator in the entire region. Instead of going to Sterling, Virginia, they came to downtown Washington. The launch of 1776. I know the founder uh, spoke with you during um, during our oversight hearing uh, about the new tech hub that's located on 15th Street and L Street, which we're very excited about, particularly because 20 percent of the seats at their new startup school will be allocated to unemployed uh, district residents referred by agencies in UDC. I've also worked with DOES to help unemployed residents get jobs at Union Kitchen, the new culinary incubator. Just a couple of months ago, that that opened. That's in Noma. And we're very much focused on foreign direct investment, particularly around China, as the Deputy Mayor mentioned. Uh, we were just in China a few weeks ago meeting with uh, investors there. And on the federal side, since one in four jobs in the city is with the federal government, we've looked at uh, expanding the central employment area with the General Services Administration, or GSA, to include the East Campus of St. Elizabeth's as well as Capitol Riverfront. Then finally, um, we've been working with partners at DSLBD and the Small Business Administration to help small businesses in D.C. access federal uh, funding opportunities. That's where we've been over the last year, and, and then I know we want to be thinking about the fo uh, looking ahead. So the next slide will outline really priorities for the next year. And as I mentioned, we're really thinking a lot about the five-year economic development strategy. Our goal is to have implemented 20 of the 52 initiatives by the end of the summer, and we'll certainly be talking more about that. Uh, and, and we've got partners really from across business associations. Many universities have stepped up to take part. And um, we've been very pleased by the, uh, the interest across the private sector community and nonprofit community working with us on this. Uh, obviously, diversifying the economy with the tech sector uh, is one of the key sectors is a big priority for us. This summer, we've worked with tech companies to uh, take in summer youth employment program participants. And uh, we think that's a great way of making sure D.C. residents can take part in the, uh, in, in the emerging sector that's growing. And then, of course, St. Elizabeth's, where we think there can be a real tech hub. That's one of the initiatives in the five-year economic development strategy and is a big priority for our work as well. Um, just a month ago, the mayor attended South by Southwest, a major tech conference, uh, and we're there to support the about 250 to 300 D.C. residents or, D or D.C. tech employees who are, who are participating and gathering there. And looking ahead, we're really focused on some new sectors. Eds and meds is a focus for us. I know we talked about that again, again in the, uh, the oversight hearing. We had a forum really uh, right in uh, Trinity College focused on Macmillan just a month ago and working with hospitals and universities that haven't really worked together to figure out how we can create a global medical hub, which again is part of the economic development strategy. And we partner, we're partnering more and more with Destination DC around tourism attraction in the hospitality sector, which is another goal within the strategy. And then finally, we've been doing more and more around this international investment attraction piece. We've spoken before about our work with China, where uh, we, a month, excuse me, a month ago, we met with three of the five largest real estate developers in China, exploring their interest in coming to Washington, working with us there. We've also met with sovereign wealth funds in China, uh, from Singapore, and from, from Norway, although those were back in this country, trying to find those institutions that have the capital to invest to get projects moving forward. And, uh, and, and, you know, looking at two, I should just note that there, there'll be, you know, with the D.C. China Center, we do think there's some more opportunities in the coming year, uh, particularly because it will be the 30-year anniversary of our sister city agreement with the city of Beijing and Washington, D.C. And uh, that presents some unique opportunities, we think, around a whole host of initiatives that we're really now getting ready to explore in more detail. And I believe Thank that you. brings me to IRB. Sorry, please. Deputy Mayor, I am gonna um, I'm gonna ask you to wrap up. So okay. if we could go quickly here, and then uh, we'll have some questions for you. Yeah, just wrap up. Yeah, you can go ahead. No problem. William Lee is director of DC Revenue Bond Program. Um, as was stated before, uh, this year we closed on a little over uh, in 2012 closed on a little more than 320 million in taxes and bonds, and so far to date. We're at a little over 426 million with approximately 10 to 12 transactions that will close between now and hopefully the end of fiscal year 13. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. I do have um, some questions, but I am going to turn first to my colleague uh, from Ward 5, who's also a member of the committee, um, and recognize him for uh, a 10 minute round. And before you begin, Council Member, I understand that um, our first panel went kind of quickly, and we may have missed some members of the public who wish to testify. Um, so I'm going to give you that opportunity um, when, uh, after I finish my first round with the Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Bowser. Um, and, and Deputy Mayor, thank you and your staff for the testimony. You, you obviously touched on uh, uh, an array of programs and initiatives uh, with which the agency is engaged, which is, which is all great. Uh, I'm here um, uh, primarily, uh, Chairwoman Bowser. Uh, I join you to discuss the critical role that Deb Head plays uh, in the promotion of neighborhood-based economic vitality. Uh, and the things that Demp Head is doing in that area. And so I wanted to focus my question on uh, primarily two, two areas, McMillan uh, Development uh, San Filtration Site, which you talked about, but also Great Streets uh, programming. And so um, you all have jurisdiction over McMillan. You talked about it in your presentation, but I wanted to get the, a status update uh, in terms of where you are on, on that project. Very good. I will have... Um the discussion of McMillan conducted by Jeff Miller and um, then uh, Andre Byers will give an overview on the um, Great Streets Initiative. Thank you, Council Member, and uh, thank you for your focus and continued support of us on, on, on McMillan. As you know, um, we had a change of, of timing and plan that was driven by the temporary use of the McMillan site for DC water. And that has caused us not only to um, change the way the site is configured, uh, but also how it affects historic preservation, how it affects uh, conversations with the, com with the community. So we have re um, revised the plan. We think it's a better plan. The park itself that was uh, four acres at one point is now seven acres of park. Uh, we think we've done a considerable amount of, uh, of historic preservation on the site. We did take it to the Historic Preservation Review Board last week or two weeks ago, and while we're waiting to hear back from them, we think that they, were, they received it favorably. Historic preservation is the first step we need to take before we put it through a PUD process, um, at which point there will be lots of public inter interaction with that. But we, but we have been delayed by that, and our budget today reflects that uh, expected delay. As it also reflects the fact that we've had to spend considerable amounts of money uh, revising the plan multiple times, first uh, in conversations with the community over the last couple of years, and then uh, substantially changing it also after the DC water um, uh, uh, discussions. And so um, the, the fact is we expect to submit for PUD here um, by, the, by the middle of summer, and that will get the process going. Um, and you know we are focused on it, and we are working through our agreements with the developers so that we hope to be able to bring at least one or two or all three of those agreements uh, in front of council, if not by the end of the year, then by spring of next year. Well, you answered actually several questions that I had asked, uh, what, what I had planned to ask in, the, in that response, so I appreciate that. I will ask though, um, how is the work with the community going? I know there are a number of interested parties, you know, folks who who represent communities that are adjacent to uh, the site and, and just the working group that you are planning Certainly. how are things progressing? I mean, the, 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 no, well, well, I think first of all, I think the community in general has been very favorable, favorable. and we've gotten ANC votes before on a prior plan. This plan is considerably improved. The, the anecdotal feedback we've gotten on that uh, has been very positive. Um, I think that there continues to be there are they do continue to be voices in the community that um, um, continue to have concerns about the historic preservation of the, of the project, um, and we are trying to be sensitive that, to that as we as we um, proceed. I think that the community will continue to have a voice as we go through the PUD process. And, and the FY14 capital budget allocates, I believe, 47.8 million dollars uh, for site redevelopment. And, and what part of the project will that will those funds support? The way we've structured the deal is we are the master developer and we will be selling finished pads off to the finished development pads off to the individual developers. And so we will be providing the infrastructure for building roads, putting in uh, uh, sewer and water, uh, putting in gas and things of that nature. And that is the, um, so all the public space areas, oh, by the way, also including the historic preservation and the park itself. So all of those areas uh, are being funded by the district at this point. 
Yeah, I, I did want to. Yeah, I just want to add one small thing. Um, the why we had um, ended up working with DC Water uh, so urgently on this site. It had to do with the flooding, as you well know, um, to to create um, and prevent flooding um, in that area. Uh, and that was that was really why the delay. I think all the community understood that that there was a greater goal in mind um, to really solve a problem that had been sitting around for a hundred years. No, so, I appreciate you uh, putting that in, in context, uh, mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor. It's, it's something that uh, that that. Um, I know full well from living in the area and, and having toured yeah. the, the the damaged homes of a number of residents mm -hmm. who suffer from from the flooding damage, and so um, we, we had opportunity to take the mayor out and, and, and walk to see some of that. And so the response through the the flooding task force uh, was was one of the engin engineering solutions was to do this project. At minimum. So I appreciate uh, you putting that in, in context for the folks who may be at home viewing it. I want to shift. Uh, since my time is, 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 is waning, I want to shift to the Great Streets programs. Um, the proposed FY14 budget restructures Great Streets funding uh, by eliminating the remaining uh, retail power area uh, TIF funding. And so I want you to, to, to talk a little bit about uh, the proposed restructuring and, and how uh, the program is going to work uh, going forward. Yeah, so again, Andre Byers, director of the Great Streets Initiative. Um, so the, the um, the goal is not to use the debt service for grants or loans. Uh, it is the mayor's preference to provide the public assistance uh, in the form of streetscape improvements, uh, infrastructure improvements along the corridors. And so that is the, uh, the goal, as, as we've shared um, with, with you as the chairwoman in the past. Uh, TIF along Great Street's corridors has been a difficult tool to utilize just because of the, the structure of it, where it's more adept for larger scale development projects. Uh, and so s instead of continuing to allow that money, that, that funding and TIF authority to remain um, and sit, the, the preference is to go ahead and use that uh, in the form of streetscape and public infrastructure improvements. Well, they're, they're, you know, you're correct to point out that a number of the uh, retail priority areas did not access the TIF uh, uh, funding um, uh, that had been allocated for them. Mm -hmm. Um, 8th Street utilized its funding, but there are a number of ones that did not. I know that uh, 7th Street, Petworth used some of it, but the proposal is, is to, to, to eliminate the, the TIF, but in favor of $5 million in PAYGO uh, annually to support Great Streets. And I'm, I'm curious uh, as to how the reduction, or at least that approach, uh, is, going to, uh, is going to work and how it's going to operate uh, such that the, the projects uh, are going to be able to access that $5 million, and, and how are they going to be able to fund the efforts on the multiple great streets? Yeah, no, it's a good question. So the what, what I want to re uh, stress is that this does not eliminate TIF as a tool. Uh, with the um, converting of the TIF authority into PAYGO, it does uh, provide a little relief uh, along the, the debt cap, uh, the pressure along the debt cap. So if there are TIF-worthy uh, development projects along the corridors, we will still and will continue to promote TIF as a tool along the corridors. So it doesn't eliminate TIF as as a, as, as a way to bring development along the corridors. It just it does uh, take that money and allow us to do more streetscape improvements. Okay, and and, and I imagine there's some, is there some level of coordination with with your office and and, and DDOT uh, for those streetscape improvements? Absolutely. So I th I think um, part of the the, the thinking is. We, we, we're really learning uh, from our experience on A Street, and the notion is to not, because I've been pressing full full court press from since I took over the position, and so then you don't want to attract so much retail, beautify existing retail along the corridors, and then you finally have corridors that are revitalized, lively, vibrant, and then decide to do streetscape improvements. So instead of doing it that way, the notion is to ramp up streetscape improvements uh, so that we can sort of prevent that and do it more in concert with one another so that we don't have that same sort of uh, disruption along the corridors. And uh, um, I want to ask quickly about slide number 15 that you all had in your presentation that talked about real estate projects that were under construction. And one of those listed is the North Capitol Street Firehouse. And to my knowledge, that project hasn't, hasn't, hasn't gone anywhere. And I know that, that uh, I think the RFP went out years ago, and it was supposed to be specifically for uh, the development to a restaurant. But, right. but to my knowledge, nothing has, has happened. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, and, and perhaps you all can provide some updates in terms of, of where they are on that. Um, 
the answer is we have uh, there there were some delays with the with the developer as to how that was going to be configured. The uh, they are now moving forward with a restaurant that we hope will be open by the end of the year. Okay, and so is, is, are they breaking ground anytime soon, or is is, is yeah, it's is my understanding they're in for permits right now. Okay, okay, well, that's good news um, because a number of residents along North Capitol Street, which is one of our yeah. our retail priority or, or, or it's one of our main streets focuses in Ward Five. Uh, those residents have really been longing for for more uh, retail op uh, options, and they've gotten some on the Royal Island Avenue First Street uh, neck of the woods. But the North Capitol Street is, is still an area where we want to yeah. increase more resources and focus. So that's good news, and I'm sure the residents in North Capitol Street area will be pleased about that in, 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 uh, in the future. So thank you, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Um, let me just. Uh, make sure I understand your comments on the McMillan project and what is coming to the council and when so there are two tracks we're working one is a uh, the actual development process and the entitlement process and then the and the second is our negotiations with the developer um, because the developers have three different product types actually four if you include the retail uh, grocery store that we're hoping to put there um, those developers, whereas we had originally looked at this as one uh, disposition with VMP, and then um, and then we would then amongst that party they would break out the issues in between. What we found is it might be easier to um, parse the deal into separate phases, um, so specifically now because some of those phases will come later in later in the in the development process. And so you may be seeing, and we're still trying to determine this, but we expect right at this point you'll, you'll be seeing three separate dispositions. And when? Um, we hope the first one will be by fall. What will be the first one? What's the first phase? The, um, the medical office site at the north of the site. And what is the second? Um, uh, most likely the, uh, the multifamily in the middle of the project. And then finally, the townhouse portion on the south side. So it will, it will move from north to south. So the district is negotiating with three separate entities, or is one entity that is going to be a party to all three deals? It'll be th the negotiations or the transfer of land will be with three separate entities. And the district is the applicant in the PUD process? That's correct. And when, it, when do you go in for that? We're waiting for the response back from the historic preservation, which is the first step. If they have, if they gave us a favorable uh, res uh, um, response to our presentation and our um, our development guidelines, um, then we can submit for PUD right away. And we assume that's a 12 to 14 month process. Okay, so let me let me understand, uh, Deputy Mayor, and I'm going to ask you to respond to this. So we we have um, language in the BSA, um, and we've gotten some conflicting, or perhaps I'm just not understanding uh -huh. answers from your office about your intentions with the TIF authority. Um, so is it are are you in support of the the BSA language as it was submitted? Sorry, this is the the same TIF. Yes. ESA Same where it question. eliminates the the retail priority area. I mean, I, I will let Andre so but I, but I think generally the response is that that uh, TIF capacity has been converted instead of Great Street. No, that, that's not my question, Mr. Kenner. My question is, you've reviewed the BSA language, have you not? Uh, I've reviewed the BSA okay. language, yes. And does, and Mr. <laughs> Deputy Mayor, are you are you in support of how that goes, or does it need any adjustment from from your point of view? Mm -hmm. So there, there is an errata letter that is coming to, right. to rectify some of the, the language. Okay. So let's talk about yeah. what needs to be corrected. Mm -hmm. what, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, Deputy Mayor, because mm -hmm. this is pretty significant, mm -hmm. okay? And I want to make sure that they're not saying, Bowser changed the Great Streets TIF, okay? <laughs> because this is your proposal, mm -hmm. and I want to be it real is. clear about it. There is authority to borrow mm -hmm. um, for certain identified and approved areas right and what this BSA says why don't you why don't you tell me what the BSA says mm -hmm. and how you want to change it and I'm happy to have mr. Byers go through it because I know this is your this primary is area of responsibility but I am going to ask you at that conclusion if you agree and what needs to happen going forward yes ma'am yeah, so the way the BSA language states it it so there are um, 
retail priority areas that exist already. So they're essentially uh, TIF districts. And so what the BSA language does is it creates additional retail priority areas that includes um, Rhode Island, and it also includes Bladensburg Road. And, and so it, in addition to those two new retail priority areas, it, it, it eliminates uh, the TIF authority for the remaining uh, portion that we still have. What is the remaining TIF authority? It is $69.1 million. Okay. And what are the identified TIF areas? So there is George Avenue that is around Petworth. That one has $10 million in TIF authority. Uh, there is the George Avenue and 7th retail priority area that has $25 million in TIF authority. There is the Pennsylvania Avenue retail priority area that has $10 million in TIF authority. There is the <coughs> Benning and Min Minnesota Benning retail priority area, and that one has $15 million in TIF authority. And then there is the H Street that was converted, and that one uh, had $25 million that was converted into grant making authority. But now it has no million dollars, or it has? Correct. Correct. Okay, and that's it. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Correct. That's it? Yes. Okay, when I add that up, I get $69.1 million. Correct. Correct. And there's Correct. also the downtown authority has already been transferred? It's already been on. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, I think the down, I think, sorry, I think the downtown has already been eliminated. Yes. Okay. All right, you may proceed. And so what the BSA does is it adds uh, Rhode Island Avenue and Bladensburg Road, uh, and part of the errata letter is to also include North Capitol in that language so that you would essentially have, in addition to the retail priority areas that I've stated, you would have these additional retail priority areas. Okay. And then the, the Budget Support Act says what about the $69.1 million? So there's no money associated with Rhode Island, Bladensburg, or North Capitol? Oh, because right. Rhode Island and Bladensburg is already in the BSA, and you are sending me something to request that uh, North Capital be added. Yes, to okay. include that, those as additional retail priority areas, yes. Okay. And in addition to those, it, the BSA language does prevent Gray Street's initiative from uh, expending any more uh, TIFs with that remaining 69.1. And so then that money would then be allocated for the use of DDOT and infrastructure and, great, and streetscape improvements. So it eliminates the TIF authority for great streets? It reprograms it, uh, if you will. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we just read it to be clear yeah. so that we're being precise sure. with our words? So basically it says that the maximum principal amount of bonds that may be issued is limited to the amount of bonds issued prior to March 1, 2013. So no, the maximum principal, there are no other bonds that can be issued related to TIF. Correct. Okay. Do I support it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so what does, you're saying that debt service then related to this borrowing, it's $5.3 million in a given year? Yes. Yeah. Yes, over the next 20 years or so, uh, it will be uh, around $5, 6000000 million uh, over the next 20 years. Okay, so this is showing up in under a, a DDOT um, line, not a DEMPED line. So it's converting the DEMPED's authority to DDOT. Right. And it is showing up as $5.13 5.1 million dollars in in this plan from 14 and it increases slight increases in 16 through 19 mm -hmm. um, for, for a total of 34 million dollars over this um, budget period okay and there are no in this line there are no allocations to Georgia Avenue Petworth Georgia Avenue 7th Street Pennsylvania Avenue Benning, Minnesota, H Street, Rhode Island Avenue, Bladensburg Road, or North Capitol Street. It's just in a bucket. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. How how would it be spent then? To, to be honest, I, th I think we probably have to engage DDOT as well to see how it would be spent because um, I know that this is going to be great streets streetscape work, which Demped does not really. Okay. Um, do, so. Do. <laughs> 
you know $5 million doesn't go very far at DDOT. Mm -hmm. So money, there will be no allocation by Great Street. Just don't know. Just don't know. Well, how could it? How could it be? Right. Yeah, I just, I just do not know. Deputy well, Mayor, if, you see where I'm going with this question? I, I do. I okay. do. Um, but I, I think it's something that we really need to sit down with DDOT and work out. Because this is what it sounds like, and I, I recognize the the issues that it's complicated for projects to ac access this borrowing authority. Right. That's why it's sitting there. Exactly. Um, and then we need to figure out a way to get it on the street. Yeah, and that has to do with the original program design. Okay. It was faulty. But the but it has been approved, and it has mm -hmm. support to have uh, spending on Georgia Avenue and Petworth, Georgia Avenue and Seventh Street, Pennsylvania Avenue, Benning Road in Minnesota, Eighth Street, Rhode Island, Bladensburg, um, in in coming North Capital. Mm -hmm. But if there's only five million dollars at DDOT, that may support half a project on one of these corridors. Yes. Yeah, so, so and over five years, it may not support anything on the rest of them. Yeah, so to your point, like, uh, take A Street, for, for instance. Uh, per block, it was about $3 million. And so I think the notion is to use uh, it as debt service so that you can capitalize, mm -hmm. uh, collateralize the, uh, the, the debt service so that you don't only rely on the $5 million. You're not only just allocating $5 million to the doubt per year. You're able to collateralize that and be able to do, use it more of a substantial amount in the beginning. So you you have sixty million as opposed to just five million because it's leveraging. Okay, so there's going to be sixty million to to go, go over these corridors. Uh, sixty nine point one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think originally that that amount that's been held on the debt cap was debt service. I mean, so that 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 is that five million dollars. So I think instead of using that debt service to support TIF capacity to the tune of sixty or seventy million, the idea is to use that debt service to support. DDOT Great right. Streets to the tune of 60 or $70 million on Great Streets, but specific for streetscape work as opposed to some of the small business development. Okay, so this $5 million in debt service is going to support additional $60 million in DDOT borrowing? Yes. And the, the amount may be, Roughly. we'd have to get DDOT to get the yeah. amount, but okay. it's the debt service number that, right. that now, is, is that going to be Is that showing utilized. up in DDOT's budget? The additional sixty million dollars in project. Again, we'd have to bring DDOT. Yeah. To, okay. To so I to have to know. tell you, this mm -hmm. makes me very uncomfortable, Deputy okay. Mayor. Not oh. knowing where it's showing up because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what it will. You have a lot of neighborhoods who who think that they have access to these millions of dollars for their corridors, and what you're doing is transferring your authority to DDOT, and we don't know what's going to happen at DDOT. Okay. Um, and so, now, this is also a different approach than the approach you've taken on H Street, is it not? Yes. So, I, you know, the last I heard, that was a you were happy with that approach. We, we are, and, and we continue in fiscal year 13. We've expanded H Street to, to four additional corridors, uh, and our and our thought is even in the 14 budget to try to expand it to even more corridors than that, um, to do much of the work that, that Andre and, and others have done along 8th Street. So we, we do support the um, small business development and retail diversification aspects of our original program, and we definitely want to expand that in fiscal year 14. Because it would seem to me that that $5 million, unless you, you, you know we're able to figure out where the additional $60 million is coming from from DDOT on these corridors, mm -hmm. but to give DDOT $5 million to support five corridors, you won't see it. It won't amount to anything. Why don't we clarify that for you and get back to you on that? Okay. Because what, what you reported to me at the last hearing about mm -hmm. H Street and mm -hmm. how you were able to convert um, that borrowing to grants that mm -hmm. really got to businesses mm -hmm. right. is helping the corridor. It is. And if there's only $5 million in a given year, now if it's $60 million in a year, that's something different but I, I just I don't see that in the DDOT budget okay we'll, we'll clarify that for you okay now let's go to the the point that was raised um, earlier about your how you set goals for development projects that uh, with the district's land for affordable housing I know we've talked about this or perhaps we didn't um, at a hearing um, 
about how you approach affordability for public lands mm -hmm. and what are the goals or requirements and what is showing up in the solicitations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jeff should probably address sure. that. <clears throat> so we are, um, when, we, when we put together our RFPs, we certainly reach out to the communities to figure out what their goals are as well. Um, and some of those goals are retail, some of those goals are parking, some of those goals are extraordinary architecture, and some of those goals are, are affordable housing. And then we have goals as well uh, in our office driven by uh, jobs, um, uh, tax revenues, and affordable housing. So we always include a requirement for affordable housing. Sometimes we, uh, rather than be prescriptive and say we need you to do 20% at X level, we will say please give us as much affordable housing as you can um, and tell us at what tranches uh, you'll, you'll provide it. So some f developers will come back at 20% affordable housing at say 60 or 80% of AMI and another developer will come back um, with affordable housing at uh, only 10 or 15 percent, but maybe 30 percent of AMI. And we are able to um, evaluate that, but we, we have given the developer flexibility at the same time, as well as balance some of the other needs that are required. For instance, um, there, is a, there have been desires in parts of, this, parts of town to put a grocery store in as part of a deal. A grocery store is very expensive for a project to do. So in some cases, if we ask for a grocery store, then affordable housing um, becomes more difficult to do economically. And we don't have additional subsidy right now to provide for um, the, a subsidy to, to, to promote additional quantities of affordable housing. So all we have is the value of the underlying land. And the land, depending on um, it, how much that land, the underlying land value is, is what we ask for in the, the total package of community benefits, again, of which affordable housing is one of them. And, and there is a, just, there's a variation um, in, by community in terms of requirements. Um, obviously, there's a floor of inclusionary zoning across the entire city, um, so that's, that's one level. Uh, but, uh, for example, in Reservation 13, there's, what, a 30% 30 30 30 affordable requirement. Um, in a, a project that we're doing right now on uh, 7th Street, um, it looks like it's going to result in a 20% affordable um, in terms of an outcome. So what we try to do is we actually try to tailor to the community because we don't want to tell the community what it needs, but we want to balance that with citywide goals. And it's a very, you know, difficult process. The great thing is that if you look at our numbers and see the production, um, we're going to hit, you know, somewhere between 30 and 35 percent with what we have in our pipeline right now in terms of our total affordable housing that we're producing and how much of the and, 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 um, total amount of housing that we're producing and how much is affordable. Um, and that really speaks to um, how we've been working this balance. And it's, I'm, I'm, I'll be the first to admit, it's not easy to do. It's probably one of the most acrimonious processes I've ever been involved with in my entire life, um, in my entire prof professional life. But it's necessary if you're going to really meet the needs of the community. So, let me um, ask, let me so ask that's why there's a, the, the variation. Let me ask this question. Is, so is it possible with your approach to have a, a disposition of public land where there's no affordable housing? Mm -hmm. no. uh, not with the, I mean, even with the inclusionary zone, with inclusionary zoning, the law states that we must have a certain percentage of affordable above, housing. Above that, above inclusionary zoning. Uh, it depends on the, I mean, it, for, let me give you a for instance. At St. Elizabeth's, where the market rate is already within the in inclusionary zoning bands, we assume that most of that will be affordable as even as market rate. But look at back at some of the deals that you've completed. Yeah. Is, has, is, has it been the case that there's been, how many like public land dispositions have you done? Well, I've been here for a one year, nine months, and so I have it, so the ones that we've done so far that we're under negotiation for were in the 20% range. Okay, but how many have you done? Let's talk about one that's complete. Talk about, well, under construction, 2M parcel, so um, delivered, 2M um, parcel. But Fulbright that's, a, that's a new community. Yeah. Right, so that's a little. But that's bit part of our affordable strategy. Okay, but it, it, they they already had some requirements. So why don't you describe to me? Because I'm trying to get the, the the question clear. Maybe I'm okay. not understanding I'm just, the question. I'm just looking for a reference point. So I, okay. I, I hear your your 
I think your argument is we're we're exceeding the goals that have been outlined without having a rigid requirement. Yeah, I, I was just really just trying to present some facts. I wasn't trying to structure an argument. So my apologies if it sounded like but I was just trying to present what the I know, facts. and I'm, I'm just trying to yeah. look for an example of okay. how that worked or sure. didn't work. Sure. So if there is one. Jeff, you want to walk through? Um, yes, yeah, sorry. I was just thinking about one of our bigger projects, uh, City Center, and I was getting help from one of my project managers. Um, at City Center, um, of the apartments that are being delivered, 20% are being delivered as affordable. My numbers are high. We produce a lot. Okay, but when was that agreement made? When was what? The city center agreement. Was there an agreement? Was it in the agreement that it would be some affordable housing? Absolutely. Okay. When was that agreement made? Uh, May. Tom, go. Introduce yourself. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, good morning. <laughs> um, Matthew Troy, project manager at the Deputy Mayor's Office of Planning and Economic Development. Doing well. Um, the original disposition agreement for City Center was signed in July of 2007. Okay. Um, there have been subsequent amendments, but the affordable housing stipulations and everything like that was okay. codified. Okay. So that's in line with the the previous kind of goals. If it was in 2007, it sounds like the end of Williams, beginning of Fenty. Mm -hmm. right. So that that that's so what we're trying. What I'm trying to figure out in my mind, you know, I have a witness said that you know, you're not following with these goals, and you're telling me, but we are delivering them anyway, right? Well, when, so when, we, see, when we see parts of uh, 42 come out, I think you'll see what okay. we're talking about. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's one of the reasons why I like talking about our deals in context of what we're doing right now and what's coming, because I think it really does clarify, you know, the overall strategy. Um, and I, I think when you see the rollout on this, which is just, what, a week away? Yeah, sure. we'll be we'll able to share, share the, the, yeah. the uh, developer in a week. Yeah. Okay, so um, the program. So it is in I'll share, and I meant to share this with you before you mm -hmm. came up. Um, if there, and I recently looked at this because you know I've been working at the Metro at Wamada to make sure that their affordable housing policies are clear in their joint development process. Mm -hmm. Wamada's affordable housing policies only refer to ours. Um, so, so they will say, um, if we're going, when we develop WMATA lands, mm -hmm. that uh, we're just going to do whatever the, the D.C. government does. And if the D.C. government's stated policy is that we're going to rely on affordable housing and that's it, then it's hard for me to argue that WMATA has to do more. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So we have to kind of figure out, if, it, if, this, if you're delivering 20 to 30 percent, what's wrong with putting that in for developers to respond well, to. Well, let me just, on the, uh, for example, the uh, Reservation 13 area, which is a, is a 30 percent requirement. If, Wama, if we develop on that site or WMATA develops on their station site, then guess what? It's 30 percent. What we do is we respond to the community. That, what I'm trying to explain is that, you know, these are market-related questions. These are community-related questions. And it, unfortunately, it's just not one size fit all. Unfortunately, it's not a simple answer. When you create a floor like that, you, you give yourself no flexibility to really solve problems. I think that the hallmark of, our, of our, our tenure in the last 26 months, since I've been sitting in this chair, is an ability to deliver solutions at complex problems. That's really what we do. And we do that by being flexible with everyone. We don't, we don't come in with some draconian approach. And we have a floor. Um, and then we have um, a, a goal, and it, at 35 percent, I think it's kind of difficult to say that we're not exceeding um, what's out there. No, I didn't suggest that you were, but I do want to, to understand, especially with the solicitations that, that you've been working mm -hmm. on, right. um, what, what are we going to, in two years, will we be able to say the same thing? Will we say, based on the solicitations that you've been working on, that we're actually delivering those units? So that's the question, and it's not, yeah. it's not a, you know, just, just take it as a question. Okay, that's, sure. that's what it is. Sure. Um, but I, I do want this. Um, is it possible that you would dispose, that you would send us a disposition that only had the inclusionary zoning, inclusionary zoning units in it, um, and not other uh, affordability on top of that? Would your solicitation process allow a deal like that to be made? Well, I don't normally deal with hypotheticals. So. <laughs> okay. 
Well, we'll see, I guess, when the dispositions come over. Yeah. But yeah. what we'll be looking for, I can tell you, hypothetically, yeah. that, that that probably wouldn't be acceptable to mm -hmm. most people in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. That they are, they're looking for, if we are to sell our land, that we are getting more affordability out of it. And I get, I get your points, that these are not uh, one size. But believe me, I've been involved Absolutely. with enough things that people want, as Mr. Miller said. They want more retail. They want grocery. And all of that has an impact on the land value. Mm -hmm. um, so I get that. And I get the need to have uh, flexibility. What I would be hopeful about is that every solicitation would ask a developer to give us an option for affordability to have them evaluate it, to have them present it, and have those choices be part of, um, of their response. Well, we do. That's how, our, that's how our RFPs are written. But to have an option about affordability? Yes. I'm sorry, that wasn't clear. We, we, always, in, we always include a requirement for affordable well, that's, that's we're just, we're just not. I think I asked that well, at the but beginning. But we're not prescriptive as to the levels. That's it. Not with the levels. We don't, we don't prescribe the levels, okay. but we always um, um, set forth affordable housing goals, always. They're, that's in all of our RFPs. I think we can. That's correct. I, I mean, I don't. Just I don't, not at what, not how much. Yeah, I think the, the, the person that was testifying early was making a point about levels. And, um, you know, our, our goal is to, is, to, is to produce, and we think that the flexibility is what we need in order to produce. And, and the numbers, the facts, will out. Okay. Um, I think uh, I'm going to turn to your budget questions. Mm -hmm. And your, the, the largest increase in, in your budget is attributable to um, increased staffing. So will you tell us um, why you need that? Okay. Well, if you look at our, um, I'll, I'll let the guys go into more detail. I'll start with a kind of an overview. Um, when we created the five-year economic development strategy, um, we were very, very clear and purposeful about, um, about targets, um, particularly the jobs numbers and the revenue numbers. In order to produce those, um, we actually, I think my mic went off. Can we lose the deputy mayor? Are you on green? Hello? It's on. No, it's not. No, it is. it's back on. Okay. Yeah. Um, in order to produce um, the number of jobs and the number and the amount of, of tax revenue that we wanted to produce, we um, really focused on um, the, the two really broad opportunities of business development and real estate development. We identified the real estate assets that we had that we were able to move out um, uh, and move forward on and, and look at their development capacity um, and also the potential tenants, particularly on the retail and hospitality hospitality side um, that we wanted to attract uh, to the district because right now we have roughly a billion dollars in retail leakage and if you look at the performance of stores like Costco and others that are opening up it, it's very obvious um, that, that we are um, having a lot of retail leakage but with these we capture it so um, in order to do them we needed um, people to deliver them um, these projects um, many of them have project managers many of them don't even have project managers on them right now um, they are sitting on our, um, in our portfolio. In order to move them, we needed people. So that, was, that really explains the, um, both the business development numbers going up and the, um, the real estate project manager numbers going up. And then, of course, the, the administrative support that makes that happen. But on the specifics, I can turn it over to, um, to Brian. Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, Councilman Byrne, in the response, you asked us to sort of outline how or who those 23 uh, additional people would be made up of and you know this is our uh, sort of current estimation in terms of project real estate project management business development uh, we, as the deputy mayor said we need some additional infrastructure support uh, around contracting grants uh, and administrative support uh, some additional um, bodies to support the workforce <laughs> investment council and workforce intermediary as that continues to grow out and finally just one budget analyst also to help support uh, the deputy mayor's office and the economic development cluster you have anything else you want to add? I'm sure I will later. Okay. Good morning, Good Conrad morning. Bridges, Agency Fiscal Officer. Good to see you, Conrad. So how many total employees would that bring you to? I think that that, that takes our fiscal year 14 allocation up to 84, 84. 84 full-time FTEs. Has DEMPED ever had that many employees, Conrad? No, it What's has the, not. What is the high number? Low 70s. It was in the 70s probably five years ago. Do you have space for those? Uh, that many people? 
we have been creatively using our space. So, uh, <laughs> you know, people are actually working in smaller um, work areas, and, and we're getting there. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to accommodate, but we're getting there. I think we'll be fine in the long run. So you're not as your budget doesn't have any space needs, uh, additional space needs. Th there's no additional real estate costs uh, as it relates to housing those folks. No. We're trying to join in the sustainability movement of adding more people per square foot. <laughs> well, that's what they say. That's what everybody's doing. We don't need as much space. That's it. I don't know about that. They, yeah, well, see, that's how you have them packed in over here. So no space for you guys. Um, now. Are there additional uh, project managers being added to St. Elizabeth's? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. How many? Right now we have uh, we have two folks working on it. One folk dedicated full time. One po folk person dedicated half time, and uh, we expect to have another person dedicated half time as well. Are there any more people being added to Walter Reed? Right now we have two full-time folks working on Walter Reed, um, and to the extent that that is a requirement, we have capacity amongst those FTEs to, to lend a hand on that as well. What, uh, what are you responsible for? What type of contract management are you hmm. responsible for? So we've got uh, sort of an active um, a contract sort of administration function in our office. Our office again has independent contracting authority and so uh, for each of the St. Elizabeth's, Walter Reed, McMillan related projects we have um, individual contracts that we let and so many times we need, um, we, we have to let those contracts uh, look at bids and then actually award them and so we have um, currently a contracting office uh, that is made up of uh, three people and I think the idea is that we're probably going to need at least one more person as we continue to build out uh, and pursue additional projects uh, as well as other business development ventures that may require contracts we're going to we're, we're going to need some additional contracting support so this is all re related to you have do you know how much money you manage in contracts I have our contracts person here um, and I could probably look it up if, okay. if I could probably try to guesstimate it. But you I would think it. that this is comparable to other um, agencies who are managing contracts, the okay. dollar value that you're managing versus the people? I, I think we might be probably more, my guess is that we would, we're currently managing per contracting professional in our office. We're probably on the higher side would be my personal guess compared to the contract volume that we have. Again, one of the reasons why we're trying to add at least one more person on the contracting side. Okay, and the remaining three are some other type of uh, administration support? Correct. We've got um, uh, grants administration is another example. We have a one full-time grants person um, who's currently managing uh, the H Street related uh, grant program as well as the four additional corridors. Our thought again is that not only would we do those in fiscal year 13, but in fiscal year 14, we might try to add a few more corridors. And so we're going to need some additional grant-related support, specifically for Great Streets, probably. Who's responsible, um, and I'm, I'm turning to your second line here about the business development people. Who's responsible, and maybe it's in Great Streets, for um, being the champion for a corridor? So, champion. yeah, this is what I call a champion. Okay. Uh, I know everything about Georgia Avenue, right? Okay. I know what it needs. I know all the stakeholders. I know where to go in and, you know, try to get this retailer here. I know to call DDOT because this is broken. Um, and what I do every day when I wake up is I try to make Georgia Avenue better. Mm -hmm. Who does that? Yeah, the, the way that I would probably answer that is, um, so Andre, as our Great Streets um, director, has probably the most direct knowledge of day-to-day -day interacting with small businesses that are along those corridors. However, you know, through our, through our workforce efforts, our Workforce Investment Council and Workforce Intermediary efforts, uh, through our individual real estate projects, which are also located, many of them, on corridors in the district, you know, I think we probably take a more integrated approach to knowing the totality of, of what's actually happening on a corridor is probably not just one person, but it's probably within our office two or three people mm -hmm. easily touch 
um, one of these corridors at different points and engagement uh, and would have knowledge about you know individual sections of it. So how many people work in the Great Streets program? We've got three people right now working on Great Streets. And what do they do? Uh, they help to uh, do outreach and to right now currently administer the the sort of four corridor uh, program that we have uh, which is exclusive of H Street and then H Street would be the fifth one. Because what, what I see uh, is missing still, even in that description, is, you know, the, how the bids, right, the bids have been able to um, fund whole programs for their areas mm -hmm. with these additional um, fees that they collect for the bids. Um, so some of them have a research arm, some of them have a marketing arm, some of them have an events arm, some of them have a clean and safe arm. Um, but they also have an arm where people just attract retail and other types of business businesses to the corridor mm -hmm. um, and we can't have a bid on every corridor right. many of these corridors can't support it through additional fees um, and in some ways we've tried to mimic what the bids are able to do with clean and safe services here or this grant there um, but I, I, it's, it's, there's still something missing mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't know that you've described it. And I wonder, Deputy Mayor, have you considered having or trying to mimic, mm -hmm. or maybe it's even a relationship that you have with the mm -hmm. existing bids mm -hmm. to leverage some of their services to these corridors? Mm -hmm. Well, you should probably, and, and we didn't, we, we try not, you try not to go too deep in these, in these presentations, but maybe we should dive a little bit deeper into the, our relationship with the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and, and, and DSLBD um, because they really all serve um, as part of a, of, a, of a more comprehensive process. Um, and I'll just give a, for example, and if you want to drill down deeper, we certainly have David Zipper who can come up here and give you additional information. But the DC Economic Partnership is, is the why we organized um, the retail tours um, that had not been done before. This is something that's specially designed uh, for the corridors. Um, we, um, as we do this, we keep in mind, um, you know, the, the Great Streets program. I mean, as, as, as part of the, if, if you've ever been on one of these tours, it's fantastic. We have um, Andre Byers on there. He talks about the Great Streets program. We have the Chamber uh, on there. They talk about the Technical Assistance Program. We have the D.C. Economic Partnership. They give all the demographic information and talk about the retailers that are already interested in those locations. They actually bring the retailers. They actually bring the brokers. So um, our, 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 the way that we run it, we run it as a team. Um, and, and in this case, um, and, then you're, and you're talking about the Great Streets Corridors, in this case, it is Andre, Andre Byers. That's his responsibility to coordinate that entire team. Um, when he needs a certain deployment, that's what he does. For, and, and I'll give a little bit more detail. I, I, I don't want to go too far on this because it, you can get a headache as you go down because there's so many uh, points of touch on this. But we are going to um, ICSC next month. Um, and when we, we have gone to ICSC before. Um, and in our previous engagements at ICSC, there was an emphasis on um, larger retailers. Um, now we're now we're focusing on um, locally serving retailers, um, and as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why Andre Byers is going with us. Um, we really are trying to make sure that we address the needs of these corridors and. And not just in one part of the city, but throughout the entire city. And the way to do that best is by leveraging all the resources that we have and integrating them in terms of their deployment. Um, and if you would like, you want to give a little bit more detail, David? I'm happy to. Okay, great. Maybe talk about the design of our strategy for ICSC and how that integrates back into Great Streets. And, and our sure. Um, but, um, yeah, the, first I just wanted to, to uh, answer your you, uh, question you asked about comparing sort of bids with the services that we provide, because I think you, you raise a good question. You're right, the bids have staff that are oriented specifically toward helping businesses that are interested in locating within that area locate there. It could be a big corporate tenant, right? Mm -hmm. Or it could be a retailer, and they have staff full-time equipped for that. Not every neighborhood has that, particularly in outlying parts of the city. And that is, as Deborah said, it's really a role that we play um, in partnership with the DC Economic Partnership because they what often happens then if there's a, a corporate tenant that wants to be in a part of the city that doesn't have a bid if it does have a bid we'll probably direct them right to the bid and it will be fine if not we meet with the, with the company we then work right with the, this is actually written into our 
grant agreement with the economic partnership that they will help us identify possible real estate places where that company could go outside of a bid area often in that instance. And in the same vein, if it's a retailer, they'll provide a personal tour, will be involved as well. So and that, that, is, that, that relationship particularly kicks in when the areas under consideration are not a great street. Because if it is a great street, of course, Andre and his team are great that way. But we want to make sure that between us and the partnership, we've got covered really any possible place that a business would want to go. And obviously, the, you know, that, that, car that approach carries forward with ICSE. And I believe, Councilor, you'll be joining us there next month, too. Mm -hmm. That's right, which we're obviously looking forward to. And, um, and you know, this is the first time that we'll have a Great Streets representative there, as the Deputy Mayor mentioned. We also have DOES there and uh, the, the Director Mallory and Director Majette to speak to the regulatory questions that come up. Okay. Since your question? Yes, it answers my question, but I just want to make sure you're hearing me. I'm a, I'm, and, I, and the way that I say this, I, I always use this woman as an example. Her name is Roz Grisby, and she was the director of the Old Tacoma Business Association. If we had 10 of Roz Grisby's, <laughs> we would ha we have some very happy corridors mm -hmm. because she was just very unassuming, mm -hmm. didn't make a lot of splash, but she always found, and uh, good, uh, you're listening to me, Kelly, good. We always found ways to get people or businesses into vacant spots, period. She just did it. And the, but that's what she did every day, all day for that little area. Um, and so I just hope that we're thinking of ways to leverage that. Maybe there's even a way uh, to think about that TIF money and how that TIF money can support uh, these corridors for corridor champions that when they wake up in the morning, they think about how we get the right mix of businesses in here. How do we keep it clean and safe? How do we have marketing uh, and how do we do events to attract people mm -hmm. to the corridor? These corridors are suffering. They're suffering. Some of them are really suffering. Um, and we, we, we have to figure out ways to help. Okay, thank you. Um, and so the, a bit, while you're here, the additional business <laughs> development specialist would do what? The additional business that we are, let me make sure my mic is on. Yeah, so there, there's new sectors that we are wanting to focus upon. Um, and that was something I touched on, I think, very briefly in my presentation. But for example, right now we have no one focusing on the hospitality sector which is a huge part of the, the economy here. And we are looking to gain some leverage there, someone who can work closely with Events DC, Destination DC, the Hotel Association, and so forth, on opportunities to continue to expand that sector. Again, this goes into diversifying the economy, right? Uh, there's also a team that we're going to be uh, creating called the Corporate Assistance Team, which will start off with two people. And they're, the, they're going to be doing something that I don't think the city's ever really had before, but our competitors certainly have. When I say competitors, I mean Fairfax County and, and in Maryland, where they will be out basically knocking on the doors of major uh, tenants in the city that have leases coming due, just doing a check-in, saying, hey, how's it going being in Golden Triangle or wherever else? You know, are, you thinking of, you know, are you thinking about expanding? Are you thinking about shrinking? Are you thinking about moving? And basically making sure that we can minimize the number of large tenants that would leave the city and, uh, and, and help those businesses at the same time to expand and just find D.C. being uh, you know, the best place in, in the country to do business, which again is part of the, one of the central goals of the five-year economic development strategy. Okay. I think that's a very good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Look forward to working with you on it. Yes, that's a, that's a good idea. So let's um, move quickly to your expenditures related to DC USA, you expect them to continue? Yeah, we probably should have Rodney George, our project manager, come up. Hey, buddy. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rodney George. I'm the project manager for the DC USA garage. Okay. So in uh, FY13, uh, we do expect the expenditures that we have been spending over the last, on the average year, to continue. That's about uh, 1.8 million. And when, um, so those are utility payments. There are some other type of payment. Those payments are um, yes for utilities, uh, for the operator, and then for the um, pretty much the uh, the unit owners association, which pretty much uh, equates to common area expenses. 
And the, the Skyland expenditures, Deputy Mayor, um, there are $40 million in the budget for this coming year. Yeah, and when do, when do they commence yeah. and what's the plan? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, um, the, the idea is that we had previously been holding a certain amount of uh, TIF for the Skyland project, and instead of providing that support through a TIF, the concept now is to provide it through uh, the allocation that we have in our capital budget. So we anticipate that that will occur, start to occur in fiscal year, um, some of the pre-planning pre for it in fiscal year 13, but the majority of it in fiscal year 14. So you're freeing up the $40 million TIF authority yeah. for Skyland? The, the $40 million TIF authority uh, has been um, converted effectively to 40 and 40 potential for the project uh, in capital. Got it. Okay, I'm just going to go through the capital spending with you quickly to make sure I understand what's going on here. So for Berry Farm, is that the community center? Recreation center. Rec center. Rec I'm looking at $2 million in 2015. Uh, as you um, know, we did have a solicitation that we're going to be res that we we've gotten responses back from. That money is there uh, to provide um, funding for things we need to do associated with the development, including uh, planning, infrastructure design, and things of that nature. Got it. Have you um, met with Metro about the Anacostia Metro and how it, it can be um, complementary to Berry Farms redevelopment? We have a meeting with um, with the director of real estate for Metro. Uh, I think either next week or the week after to talk about. It. I know that there's a host of, of solicitate a host of uh, Metro sites within the district that that they're planning on doing something from a real estate perspective. So we want to have a, a comprehensive discussion with them about that. Okay, and you might invite them to um, present those parcels when you have your presentation in May. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. I have one every now and then. Um, the economic development pool, $1.5 million. Yeah, we were, um, uh, for some projects, we, we sometimes had unexpected expenses, uh, in particular things like market studies and appraisals. Uh, at the end of the project, at the end of the project. Let's try it again. We have a, hello, hello. Let's see if you could try to use the deputy mayors. There you go. Sorry. Is switch. it moved? Just switch to okay, good idea. <laughs> Sorry about that. We actually do want you to answer. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's fine. If you didn't, that's, uh, I have no problem with that either. Um, we, as an example, we'll have a project that will have an LDA that we've extended because we want to give the developer and the community more time, as an example. Um, many times we're going to have to continue to do market studies or get updated appraisals on the property so we can continue, continue our negotiations. We were finding that it was difficult to have capital allocated to do some of those studies uh, because we didn't have that specific project identified uh, in our capital budget. And so what we wanted to do is to have just a pool of, of a small amount of pool of, of capital um, that we could provide to some of these projects that just sort of pop up and we don't exactly know when we're going to need to spend uh, some of the, the money to support some of the studies and reports that we'll need to, to get the project complete. So this pool has a balance currently, doesn't it? I think it's seven million. Seven million is, is the is the balance. I think that there was a reprogramming that happened late last year to support the um, the West End project, 24th and L Street Northwest. Uh, and that's specifically to support affordable housing, um, the affordable housing for that project. Again, for, for that project, there were three big public benefits that the district was seeking, uh, a new library, a new fire station, and affordable housing. The land value was enough to get us a, a brand new fire station and a brand new library, but not enough. Uh, the land value was not enough to get us affordable housing. So this money is to support the affordable housing. So that's committed the seven million? It, it, How much of the seven million is committed to that project? It's the entire seven million. Seven million. So when is that going to be expended? So 
So I, I believe that there is current litigation on the project right now, which is precluding us from moving forward, and I don't want to say too much. Okay, I'm right. So I guess that's all that I can say is that when, when that litigation is, is concluded, we, we definitely want to move forward with that. And how much affordable housing does that buy? <laughs> Good afternoon. Did you check your wind turns? I did. Make sure it's What is going on with our sound here, guys? Mike Jeff. Hey, you want to sit here? Sure. They're, switch they're working on it? Yes. I'm sorry about that. They're working on it. It's okay? All right. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Again. Um, that would be 52 units of uh, residential rental at or below 60% AMI for the seven million. Okay, so this project has not commenced. It's still this project has not commenced. It has not commenced. So it's um, possible that the that that balance is going to be sitting there another year. No, um, what we're well, it's possible okay. um, in the worst case scenario. Um, we hope to get a favorable ruling in the very near future, um, in a matter of weeks. Cross my fingers, um, and then proceed to closing. Uh, by late summer, early fall, and then probably 30 or 45 days thereafter break ground. So the target is to break ground before the end of the year, definitely. Okay. Um, I'll go. Th uh, we talked about McMillan already. Um, the new communities. This this money is for Berry Farm in Lincoln Heights. No, it's not. It's for what is this for? And 14, 40 million dollars. <coughs> the. Um I'm not sure my mic is on. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, I'll actually. Uh, the, the the 40 million is going to support uh, a, sort of a, a host of of new communities projects. Uh, many times we have not concluded the the discussions with the developers, so we don't exactly know how much uh, would be allocated per project. But um, that money is all going to support the four new communities projects. That's in addition to the, the 86 million. So, so we um, when. When we met the last time about new communities, you talked about giving me a timeline mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how those are going. I don't mm -hmm. know that we've gotten that yet. We will do that. Mm -hmm. we, will, okay. we will do that. We'll schedule that for you for next week if, if, if that works for your schedule. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so Poplar Point, what do you have planned there, Deputy Mayor? Um, first, we have to hire a person. <laughs> so that's well, the it's 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 uh, become a priority in our office. We have uh, identified two project managers for the time being, as well as uh, enlisted the support of the Office of Planning in pursuing the environmental in, in impact study, uh, which will also include a master plan for the site. And so that money is there to support um, that master planning process. Thirteen million dollars. No, I'm sorry, the, the one million in the beginning. But to keep in mind, there is a um, a requirement to relocate as part of the entire process, relocate the uh, Parks, National Park Service uh, facilities that are on Poplar Point to areas in the city. And the $13 million is there to um, support that relocation effort. Yeah. Engineering studies. Have yeah. those facilities been identified, the, relo re the areas to relocate? Yeah. We are still in discussions with the Park Service as to where exactly they would go. There are um, several options that they're considering. Okay. St. Elizabeth's, um, this is all infrastructure money? Most of it isn't. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that, that's correct with the exception of the of, of, of funds that are being used for the construction of the, uh, the, the Gateway Pavilion. And that begins in this FY13? Yes. It should be in the beginning of the next 30 days. Okay, we discussed Skyland and the $40 million. When is the Skyland disposition coming over? We expect you to get a packet um, before recess of this, of, of, uh, in this spring uh, for the disposition of the site. And okay, so is that going to be um, before, you know, so you're not expecting any action before recess? I don't think we'll have time before recess to, to have any action on it. We expect you to take action in the fall. Okay, so you, you think we're going to get it just before recess? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, w Walter Reed, uh, there's $2.3 million here. 
What what exactly do you do with two point three million dollars and sixty seven acres? Um, well, as you know, we don't own it. Um, we are going through the disposition process, which we do not think will we don't think will own this and actually have uh, take title to it until uh, late 2014, fiscal year 2014. Um, we are beginning those discussions with the Army this year. Um, those, arm those negotiations are a little bit farther behind than we would have liked based on our initial timelines because of the um, approval of HUD. We've gotten our first feedback from HUD on the NOI uses, and now um, we've, we're going back to respond to those. Once HUD releases uh, the, the project or supports the project, then we can go into what's called our implementation phase of the project. Uh, and that implementation phase includes the disposition dis discussions with the developer, or pardon me, with the, with the Army. So um, can you share the HUD feedback? Has that been shared? Um, they did share. It was, it was more. They were, these were technical questions, frankly, about some of the NOI users. There were no issues with the users themselves. It was more uh, about the technical uh, submission. So um, we're responding to those. Okay. Can you share the the HUD questions? I'd, I'd be pleased to. I, I will okay. have to get my, uh, my. We're happy to share with us with you later. Okay. So the, how long have they had it, HUD? Yeah, we submitted in July of last year. So, and so, so we submitted in July, and they responded when? They just responded within the last two weeks. So that's six, that's far. ten months. So, okay. And then, um, <laughs> so we expect your responses to have a quick turnaround, I would guess, since it's been ten months. They said it would be nine months. It's been ten months. It's not bad. Yeah, again, Martin Combal, uh, Walter Reed LRA director. Um, for the HUD responses, there are some clarifications um, that were needed with the legally binding agreements, and we need to go back to the NOI users um, to clarify that information with them before we go back to HUD. So we're anticipating that I think a, a full response will go back to HUD within the next month, probably a month and a half, um, at which point we're hoping that HUD can turn around an approval um, shortly thereafter. Okay, so can you give us an update on this uh, Urban Land Institute study that you did? Mm -hmm. um, and Deputy Mayor, we understand that you know there's some confusion in the community about what these recommendations mean, mm -hmm. um, specifically related to new property taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, as you know, we have done extensive um, long-term planning for the site. So as part of BRAC, we initiated a reuse plan um, that was completed last year. Uh, we've been working with the Office of Planning to do a small area plan, uh, which went before the council uh, just the other month. In both of those plans, there's some general discussion about interim uses um, in, toward, in an effort to flush out interim and temporary uses um, as the site is developed, we decided to engage the Urban Land Institute that does something called the Technical Assistance Panel. Um, it brings outside experts in the real estate uh, industry to come and provide technical assistance um, around certain questions that a sponsor such as the district government would have. Um, so it, we posed a series of questions about what types of uses, where, where those uses could go, and what um, implementation structure would be needed to, to do that. Um, so the panel met for a day and a half, April 1st and April 2nd, to come up with some initial set of ideas around uh, that UL, the ULI TAP um, questions. So they, they made a presentation on April 2nd, and they are working currently on a final report, which we will not have until May. Um, and some of those ideas included pulling back the fence, um, opening up the Great Lawn area, um, allowing the community to come in and actually use the facility while uh, demolition and other activities are happening on other portions of the site. Uh, there was some discussion about the possibility of establishing a nonprofit that could um, use uh, essentially special assessment fees possibly from the Walter Reed uh, facility. Um, I don't. I, I don't think there was much discussion about going outside, but I think there was some confusion about whether or not a taxing district could go outside of the community um, to support the programming costs. Um, but it okay, so we, that was part of the discussion, and it was in some written recommendation. 
yeah, it, it will eventually yeah. come out in, in a final recommendation. I, I've, I've been involved with uh, these ULI groups for many years, back in the 80s um, and through the 90s um, in, in all parts of the country. And really what they are, professionals coming in, giving you their best ideas in a very short term. They don't have the benefit of what the community has in terms of deep understanding. They don't have the, the, the understanding of the history of the site. Um, many of the relationships, you try to brief them, give them as much information as possible. Um, and then you try to pull in some local professionals that, that may have that history. But, but in all cases, they're just ideas. Um, I, I was just involved in one um, at, at Gallia Dent um, where we provided a series of, of recommendations and it helped inform them about some decisions that they were trying to make. So really, they, they're, they're really just uh, recommendations. I got it. I just wanted to be clear. I've yes. been and participated in one of these panels before. I think they're great. I don't think people really understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you contrast the 18 month process of planning <laughs> right. with a two day Thank like you. thing, and Thank then you. people are like, well, "Well, what are we doing here?" <laughs> um, and then on top of that, they tell you that they might raise your taxes. Yeah. So that's a problem. So let, let's just be clear. Um, there's no proposal from this government that's no. going to say no. one mile to five no. miles outside no. of Walter Reed, no. we're going to pay for Walter no. Reed, no. okay? And that's not something that I would support in any uh, way, shape, yeah. or form. No, Madam Chair. Okay. <laughs> uh, if I could just add, we, we have been trying to go out to the community listservs to make sure that people understand the context of the UOI TAP. Um, so we, we will continue to engage um, with community members to make sure that they understand the purpose. Okay. Um, but. I think that what you've tapped into is that is, is there's a fear that there's no money for Walt to read. Right. And then your budget proposal mm -hmm. kind of supports that mm -hmm. and that there's no money for Walt to read. Um, and so what your panel also suggested is that interim uses and maintenance of the facility um, haven't the, the, that had that budget hasn't been contemplated either. So what did your panel come up with as maintenance costs on an annual basis? Um, they received a ballpark from the Army for the entire facility. However, um, I, I think the Army threw out a number about 10 or 15 million. We have received additional information that we are trying to go back and clarify that number. We do not believe that that number is that high. However, um, we, we need to coordinate with the Army to make sure that we have clear utility records, utility bills, um, contracting costs for um, lawn maintenance, um, security costs, and, and the like. So, Deputy Mayor, mm -hmm. based on um, what we heard Mr. Miller say, at some point in this five years, you're going to have responsibility for maintaining that facility. Yeah, absolutely. Before conveyance, before conveyance of the property to us, um, we will be we will address these issues, and we have time to do that. Um, and you know, many of us have been involved in large scale projects before. Um, we understand the complexities, and we understand the complications of you know of a DGS operating versus um, you know the Army operating versus a private contractor operating. So so we'll take all those into consideration. Right. But it it will be in the budget when it is required. We will okay. put it forward. Yeah, I'm going to make sure. Be I'm assured. Like probably this time. Um, because what, what, what we've heard is that we don't really know what's happening at Poplar Point with the relocation of the National Park Service. We don't know. We don't know where they're going. We don't know how much it costs. Yet they have $13 million in the budget. We know that we're going to get Walter Reed in the six years, and we, we're not prepared for it. You see what I'm saying? So I could stop. You don't Hello. agree? I, I, these microphones are very there interesting. There you go. There you go. They're You're very on. interesting. <laughs> I could see how someone could conclude that, and 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 it and it does seem to you know have a parallel logic, but they're actually very different projects with with very very different um, situations, um, and, and and I don't I don't think we necessarily have to drill down, but I do understand your perspective. Okay. I just want to okay. let you know I do and understand. And I want to make sure there's money for both when it's when it's needed, and I, I know that that's your goal. And we agree with you on okay. that, Madam Chair. So let's let's figure that out, um, and the community has to know that we're not trying to go to them to pay for Walter Reed. Okay, yeah, and this and is what this budget was, you know, you, you see where I'm going? If you yeah. put out, we're going to give you a special assessment, and then I only have $1.3 million over the next six years, and I know I'm going to get the parcel. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's not going to work. So we'll figure that out. Um, so the last item is this WASA new facility, $9 million. Can you talk a little bit about that? <coughs> Certainly. So um, WASA has been um, operating out of some very... Um, attractive real estate. Real estate has been attractive that's become very attractive since the revitalization of the neighborhood down at the Capitol waterfront. And um, the city would like to 
uh, work with Wausau so that we could actually take advantage of the value and the, and the development potential of that site. And pursuant to that, we are working with Wausau to find a way to relocate their uses there to another site outside the city. Not, I beg your pardon, another site in the city. And what is there? What what, is, what are they operating there? What they have they a locating? they have a maintenance facility, okay. and they have um, they keep their sewer maintenance trucks um, and other operating equipment there. So it's like a garage. Oh, it's a it's a, it's a surface lot with a with a maintenance facility on it. Yes. And so we're buying it. Um, we are no. We the money is there to work with the transfer and potentially acquire an, an alternative site for for them. If they go on a district-owned site, well, that's that's a different story. But right now, we have money in the budget to actually purchase a site as well and build them a, a new facility. How many vehicles are they servicing there? Uh, we'll get that number for you. Yeah, we should get that number for you because I okay. don't think we know exactly. We have how a many potential now. site. We are talking with them about a, a couple of sites. One, one of which might be one of which may be a city-owned site. So we would just. So what are we paying them eighteen million dollars for? Well, part of it is actually the the construction of the new thirty-five thousand square foot building that they will need. And we will then in turn get their parcel. And That's what correct. It's, it's a swap. It's, exa it's exactly right. It it's a swap. A, well, it wouldn't be a swap because yeah. we're paying eighteen million dollars. Uh, well, I'm s sorry. We would. We would. We would pay $18 million to relocate them so that we could take control no, of the sorry. site upon Nine, which oh, they Yeah, $18 million over two years. Right. Nine, $9 million over two yeah. years. Right. So we would, we would pay to uh, either acquire a site or put them on a, put them on a city site and build, their, build a new 35,000 square foot facility for them as well as construct their parking, the, the parking facility they need. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is, what is sparking our interest in this move? Think there is value uh, at that site. It's right next to Canal Park. It's right adjacent to where uh, DDOT is located now. Uh, it's adjacent to the um, uh, right across the street from the uh, Nationals Park. We think that it's a it's a prime real estate development site, uh, and it's, uh, we think that there's a, there's an opportunity there. Do you have some unsolicited um, interest in the site? Um, we we do. So why don't they buy the site? Um, I think that there is uh, an opportunity then for the city to capture that value in some kind of transaction. Give me that again. So the, 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 this, this piece of land was part of a larger PUD, but there is an opportunity for if for us investing $18 million at relocating the Wasa facility and getting, the, getting frankly, that, that parcel back, then we can monetize it in some way. I, I also know that I, and this is before my time, but uh, that there was an, a, an agreement or uh, some sort of deal that was related to, I think, um, uh, a developer already that's that's Four City, right? Four City that's located uh, down there for them to be the ultimate um, to build out that site uh, potentially. So, um, so is already an agreement with Four City to build this out. Uh, I, I don't know, again, the, the extent of the agreement to build out the entire site, but I know that in terms of their um, sort of the agreement that the city has um, to uh, potentially have this as a developable site, that we do have some, there is some agreement between us and them. The agreement is for us to buy it? I'm not sure if it's for us to buy it necessarily. I, to be honest, I'd have to, I'd have to, we have to get back see to the agreement to actually know that. Okay. I'm going to need some details on that. So there's an existing agreement with the adjacent development, mm -hmm. which is for a city. Mm -hmm. And so they probably nobody else, well, it wouldn't be as attractive to anybody else as the adjacent. Okay, I got it. So um, there are some things we're going to have to go over about that. Okay. And what was the other one? We're going to talk about Poplar Point and Walter Reed. Point Walter. So if we could do that, um, Deputy Mayor, I know we both are busy, but if we can make some time to do that so that we can have it resolved before the markup. Sure. That would um, that would help us a lot. Very good. So um, those are generally my questions. Um, I will under the economic development pool. I will want some more information about that. Okay, Councilmember. I also uh, when I left a second ago, I ran into 
uh, the budget off the budget office person who cl helped me to clarify a statement that I made about the the, the Great Street's TIF capacity. So I was mistaken. Um, that uh, five million dollars has been changed to PAYGO capital. So it's not debt service. It's been changed to PAYGO capital that uh, will be made available to DDOT. Uh, and again, he said that we can we, we certainly when we sit down to, to talk to you, we can talk more about what DDOTs or what the anticipation anticipated uses that DDOT would have for that money, but it is about $5 million of PAYGO that's been converted for them for Great Streets. But street just $5 million. Just $5 million. Million. Correct. So, Deputy Mayor, I really hope you give some th more thought to this um, and figure out how we can do something more similar th to what's been successful for you on 8th Street. Because you're not going to see the economic development benefits of that in a big way. You're just not. It's not, it's not enough money. And you're transferring all of your authority to DDOT. Now, God love DDOT. I love them. But if I were you, I would want a, more control over that authority. I really would. So I hope you'll think about that some more before we meet. Appreciate your input. Okay. Uh, any anything else you want to put on the record? Well, I just like to. I would just like to close with. <laughs> hopefully, my voice. <laughs> I'd like to close with saying that um, you know um, my staff uh, from Demped, which is over to the left, um, your right. Um, they, they've done an outstanding job, um, particularly in the last 26 months that I've worked with them. I don't think I've seen a team work harder or be more conscientious about their relationships and and getting the work done within the communities. And all the things that we've talked about coming up in the future, we are going to put forth um, our 180 um, percent effort um, to make sure that they happen. Uh, I've really enjoyed the, um, the time I've been here so far and uh, appreciate, you know, um, working in collaboration with you and your team and uh, look forward to um, walking through some of these issues with you uh, before the budget markup. Well, thank you. I want to um, thank you and all your staff for um, your responses. Uh, there are a number of things that we didn't get to this morning, but we'll talk to, uh, about in our, in our meeting. And we'll try to be as efficient as possible with, um, with that meeting as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we're next going to hear from the Department of Housing and Community Development. You get us done. And um, I, I did promise that we were first going to hear from some witnesses that uh, didn't make today's first panel. So let me call Marjorie Goldberg and Alex Nyhan. And as they come up, I'm just going to say something about um, our next agency. Which one of these work? I think that one is. So um, following uh, these witnesses, we're going to hear and take testimony uh, about the budget for the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, also known as DHCD. DHCD is the district's primary agency for creating and pre preserving affordable housing. Uh, it does this by financing projects, acquiring vacant and blighted properties for redevelopment, um, the administration of the Home Purchase Assistance Program that offers down payment assistance, housing counseling, rehabilitation programs um, as well. DHCD also enforces important laws regarding, regarding inclusionary zoning, rent control, and condominiums. Almost one-third of DHCD, DHCD's budget comes from federal sources, which have performance and reporting standards that must be um, complied with strictly. Another large part of the agency's budget comes from the Housing Production Trust Fund, um, which after two years of decreases um, is seeing a proposal to restore it to current uh, to prior years. Um, with more than $100 million proposed to be invested in FY13 and 14, uh, we want to make sure that there is a clear plan for spending this influx of dollars effectively. Um, so let's say a little bit about the, the mayor's proposal in FY14. The agency's operating budget is proposed to be $167.8 million, up from $42 million, or so 33 percent increase. The bulk of this increase comes um, from the Housing Production Trust Fund and will go toward financing new projects and lead safe and single family rehab pro, um, grant programs. FTEs are increasing also by 12.5 or 8.5 percent for a total of 159 employees in FY14. 
Staff levels are being increased in agency management, financial operations, as well as the divisions that handle housing regulations, including programs like including Nary zoning and uh, TOPA. Um, so we want to make sure that DHCD has the necessary staff to handle this large growth um, in their budget. And on the capital side, DHCD does not have any new money uh, proposed for FY14. Uh, um, this has been the first budget that Director Kelly has been able to um, have input on in its design and implementation, and uh, we hope that it reflects um, the goals that he set out uh, with the committee in prior meetings. So with that, we're going to call our public witnesses. Our first two witnesses, as I noted, are going to um, comment on the planning and um, economic development side of things, but we'll also hear from witnesses signed up uh, to now following them uh, for DHCD. Uh, Michael Syndrome, Michael Syndrome, uh, Cheryl Court, Jim Knight. For Jubilee Housing? Okay. Marjorie Goldberg, you may proceed. Thank you, Muriel. I really appreciate it and this opportunity. Um, what I did was uh, I printed out the five-year um, economic strategy from DEMPED. So I'm responding to each as I go. And I have a couple of um, uh, things for you, like the 1986 bill that was passed by Dave Clark and the City Council that orders 1% of all building construction in the district to um, be uh, deemed for art in public places in the district's buildings that they built, which has never been implemented in something like, uh, well, what's say 1986 to now, uh, 29 years, something like that. Um, and I don't quite understand why that was never implemented, but I have a copy of it right here. Um, the first thing on the goals of uh, DEMPED is to identify uh, Washington, D.C. as an ultimate worldwide destination spot. Um, I contend that we are already a world De class destination spot. We have the top museums in the world and they are free. Um, the ones that are not free are worth the price of admission, like the Museum, Phillips, and um, Spy, Spy Museum in Hillwood. We have internationally acclaimed theaters, dance companies, and we have international conferences here. We have one of the finest and largest parks that run through the city. We have the greatest tree, we have more trees of any city in the country, um, variety. We have incredible architecture like buildings of the Library of Congress. We have world-class embassies. Recently, we redeveloped um, and uh, we have incredible airports very close to the city, train stations and road systems, and a wonderful river. Um, the only problem with our, the biggest problem with our city and, and bringing people in here is that our federal government is poisoned the city. Um, it is vitriolic at best, and it makes most people want to stay away. We have to change the message. Written on the back of the Kennedy Center, it says, carved in stone, Civilization is not measured by its politics, but it's measured by its culture. So I think that um, redefining how we sell the city is a very important point, because nobody's coming here uh, to go to Congress. Um, to create a roadmap of prosperity in the district. Um, accountability. If you are in the nonprofit world, and last week I was here uh, speaking about um, the One City Fund, the amount of compliance that is required from nonprofits um, when they get a small grant from the city, and I'll call a small next to the numbers you've been discussing here today, like $100,000, our reporting filings are incredibly intense. I would suggest that the district could raise a lot of money if they hired a few more people to oversee the contracts, every for-profit contract that this city lets out should be very well, we should have a final um, report on those and we should understand if those people fulfilled those contracts. I bet we could find hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts that are unfulfilled. I understand we only have two people following this up. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling to an extreme. Um, 
Then it says, to bring together a meaningful business, a meaningful community of business, civic leaders, academic organizations, and stakeholders. Um, well, I thought that's what the Chamber of Commerce did, but um, in the economic partnership. But um, I know in, with myself, I have just been a part of, I am both extremely disappointed and frustrated at the Office of Planning of, at DEMPED. They, um, I was part of a bid that um, got accepted from Donahoe Corporation um, that was going to build at Fifth and I. They've done all of their due diligence. They were told in November that they were going to council for an up or down vote. They have done everything required. I was, my gallery was supposed to go in there and, and all of a sudden they did not um, let any of the um, uh, ANCers know. They did not let Donahoe give a cure period and they um, pulled it without ever taking it to council with absolutely no explanation. I went to two ANC meetings, they still gave no explanation. And they have now refused to meet with the mayor or the deputy director. The mayor's refused to meet with Donahoe. Donahoe is a 129-year-old company in the District of Columbia. Spectrum is in the District of Columbia. I am in the District of Columbia. If this is how you treat district co companies. They found this out in the newspapers. They did not do what they needed to do. They did not go to the ANC. They did not could give a cure thing to Donahoe, which didn't need a cure. They were, we, they, they wanted every, they complied with everything, and yet they found out in the newspapers. Is, is this going to give Demped credibility that they've spent four years negotiating with two mayors, two, four deputy directors, and yet they can't even get one phone call from them telling them they've just yanked their project they've spent millions on and ready to go into the ground? I mean, it is, and it's 20,000 square feet. Really? Is it really worth it? It's a third bigger than the piece of property my house is on. Really? They, they need to waste their time on that? I mean, and not just go ahead with Donahoe, who's perfectly willing to break ground next year. Okay, Marjorie, I, I, I'm going to have some questions for you. Okay. So you want to wrap, wrap up? Okay. okay. You're over um, a you know, and as far as promoting the city, I would love to see at the convention center, take 10,000 square feet, 1,000 square foot per ward, you know, and let each ward show, show off what they do, have in one location, so it's sort of one-stop shopping per ward. Let them change it out and show people, you know, and, and have tours go to each ward and take people to the wards. One big question, I have two big questions. One, you spend a ton of money going after new business. How much money, I would like to actually know the figure of the amount of money that's spent retaining current businesses versus bringing new businesses in. I can give you three examples of money that we've given out to companies like Living Social and, and the one in the uh, Woody's building of a place that barely stayed here for a year and yet businesses all over downtown were going out of business that have been here for years because they couldn't get a dime from the city. It's cheaper to retain the businesses you have than to bring in new businesses. What is the budget differential between retaining new businesses and getting new businesses? I mean, they're talking millions of dollars going here and there, and if you just took $5 million and divided it between 35 businesses, you could probably retain those businesses. So I'd like to know that. I would also like to know one other thing. But Marjorie, let me let okay. me stop you there so okay. I can get to um, to some questions. And let me turn now to Mr. Nyhan. Good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser. Good afternoon. I'm Good very afternoon. sorry that I missed the first panel. No Thanks so much for fitting us in. Um, I'm I yeah. also yeah. Um, <laughs> my boss Debbie Ratner Salzburg wanted to be here. Unfortunately, she had to be in Chicago, so I am here to represent Forest City, Washington. I've submitted testimony for the record. I think, in the interest of time and the salience of your last round of questioning, maybe it's best for me to hit a few highlights and then speak to the Wasser Project. First, I don't want to miss the opportunity to say we love public art down at the guards. I'd love to speak with Ms. Goldberg later. And I adore Deborah, so, <laughs> and it's got my favorite name of a company. Um, <laughs> Forest City is developing the yards along the Anacostia, <clears throat> which is the largest private real estate project in the city. It's five and a half million square feet, 2,800 units of housing, about 2 million square feet of office and 400,000 square feet of retail. It's mixed income housing, 20% uh, affordable to 50% of AMI. Back when the ballpark was, when the council was trying to decide whether to approve the ballpark financing, the city ran a so-called REFI process. Four city responded to that REFI process and on December 12th, 2005, was awarded the development rights to about five and a half acres of land right next to the ballpark. That's the so-called WASA site. 
that DIMPED was, was discussing earlier. Awarded under Mayor Williams, worked on it under Mayor Fenty, keeping working on it under Mayor Gray, and we're trying to get it done. What we plan to build there, and have, we have submitted a PUD on this after consulting with the community, is a new movie theater called Showplace Icon, which would be its, the first high-quality premium movie theater in, in Washington, D.C. In addition to that, 600 units of housing, the mix of incomes, and we're rebuilding uh, Diamond Teague Park as well. Let me just understand, Alex. Sure. So you were given the development rights to the WASA parcel? Correct. So we gave you development rights to a parcel we don't own? The, the district owns the parcel. It's used by WASA. The district owns it. It's Correct. used by WASA. Yeah, Under some kind of lease with the district? Uh, that's, I'm not sure of that specific detail, okay. but I'd be happy to get back to you. Okay. But you know, basically the bottom line is for a city who's awarded the rights, it's, it's a complicated a bit of collaboration, you know, helping D.C. Water find what they need, helping the city get its fair economic development impact, of course, and then for a city having a viable project that we can develop. So I think we've made a lot of great progress in the last year, and we'd love to come in and have the opportunity to brief you on where we are um, and you know, what the issues are. But suffice it to say, if the city moves forward with the project, its economic development benefits of approximately $250 million of new taxes, a new movie theater, 600 units of housing, retail, <coughs> and it's next to the ballpark. And we also have some art space, actually, that we, that we um, agreed with the Office of Planning to include in the base of the movie theater, and we need to find local art purveyors for that. So the bottom line, the highlights of both the yards and the WASA project, um, we're building a, an eclectic new neighborhood. Our retail tenants are not all national chains. We have a variety of restaurants. Two are open. Another five are opening later this year. And the, the last piece I want to highlight is on social inclusion. We've exceeded the goals that we committed to with the city. But I think, you know, interestingly, Four Cities funding our own workforce intermediary. We totally support what the city's doing with this workforce intermediary. We have a captive tenant in Harris Teeter at the grocery store. So we're working with them to figure out just very concretely how many people do you have to hire, how many people in the, you know, in the, in the florist area, how many people in the meats counter, what are their skills, when do you need to hire them, and we want to find actual human beings to fill those jobs. I can take any questions. Okay. Uh, you've got my specific testimony. Thanks again very, very much for the opportunity. Sure. Ms. Court, and then I will have some questions. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Chairman Bowser. My name is Joel Court with the Coalition for Smarter Growth, and I'm here to just briefly comment on DHCD's budget. Um, regarding their budget, you know, first and foremost, we want to say that we um, are in strong support of the $100 million commitment for affordable housing, with $87 million going to the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, we commend the mayor for this commitment, and we ask that the council support this. These funds are critically needed to address the city's escalating housing <coughs> prices, which are burdening a larger and larger share of D.C. households with higher housing costs. Regarding inclusionary zoning and uh, affordable dwelling unit management or ADU management, um, we have been collaborating a lot with um, partners and meeting a lot with DHCD about this. Um, IZ administration has experienced significant problems in the startup phase, and DHCD has indicated it's making headway addressing these significant challenges. Specifically, DHCD has, is about to propose or publicly propose revisions to the overly cumbersome administrative regulations, which have been a barrier to, um, to matching uh, individuals with units. Um, DHCD has worked with Office of Planning and the Zoning Commission to remove um, obstacles that were created with conflicts in um, requirements from FHA mortgage lending standards, and those were published recently, and that should move forward uh, as soon as the FHA letter is in hand to encourage lenders to, uh, to lend to these programs. And um, these are important steps that um, – that we that are moving forward and we're grateful to see them moving forward to overcome the administrative challenges in inclusionary zoning. We do re remain concerned that the office responsible for administering both inclusionary zoning and affordable dwelling units is understaffed. We suggest at a minimum that um, uh, more funding could be available through with a capital city fellow to be added. Um, 
we uh, we continue to see that uh, that this, a, a tiny staff of perhaps three people are responsible for thousands of units that are either coming online or have, um, or have been produced since the early 2000s. And some of the earlier units actually have a lot of problems in them that need to be corrected. And DHCD doesn't have the capacity to do that unless it has real people with the skills to review covenants and, and start to fix those. So um, it's urgent that we um, provide adequate staffing for this office. And I, I just wanted to conclude by thanking Director Michael Kelly and his staff for their openness and responsiveness to us. And also thank you, um, Chairman Bowser, for your um, interest in um, ensuring that these programs are working and, um, and uh, your interest in affordable housing in general. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Court. So Jubilee Housing, please state your name, sir. Yeah, my name is Martin Mallett. I'm Director of Special Projects for Jubilee Housing. My boss, Jim Knight, was here, but he had to go get his son. So I'm going to combine. I have, I've submitted t testimony for both myself and him, and I'm just going to combine that testimony. Um, so my name is Martin Mellon. I'm serving Jubilee as Director of Special Projects. As many of you are aware, Jubilee Housing has providing quality housing with supportive services to over 800 low and moderate income residents in the Adams Morgan neighborhood in Northwest for the past 40 years. We currently own and manage approximately 280 units of uh, units mostly for residents earning 30 percent of the area median income. The majority of our residents are full-time workers, many at entry-level jobs, which simply do not provide sufficient funds to print th permit them to access market rate housing, especially in our neighborhood. Our organization works closely with a number of sister organizations to provide additional support to our neighbors, including to quality child care services, workforce development, and primary care health services. I'm here today to comment on the portion of the budget request and support acts which pertain to the DHCD. Jubilee Housing has been an active member of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development and strongly supports this collective effort to ensure that housing for all be a cornerstone of all of District Columbia's uh, making, ensuring the diversity in all the wards of the city. Therefore, we are in full support of all of the budget requests of the coalition. We believe the budget submitted to DC City Council by Mayor Gray represents a very important investment in making his, his vision of one city a reality. In particular, we encourage the DC City Council to approve the $100 million proposed by Mayor Gray to fund a number of critical programs which will not only develop but sustain new affordable housing units, especially for residents at the very lowest income levels. We are especially supportive of the budget which will add an additional $67 million for the Housing Production Trust Fund for new housing projects and will also include $20 million to permanently end transfers from the trust fund to support current payments for the local rent supplement program. We're encouraged by the significant support for affordable housing represented by the proposed budget. A particular note is the new capital that has been identified for the housing trust fund, the planned investment of sponsor and project-based LRSP, the availability of DMH and HOPWA capital, and the emergence of the new Consolidated RFP. These are significant steps in the right direction. The Consolidate RFP, which makes capital, operating subsidy, and service dollar, dollars available at the same time, is a true step in the right direction. In fact, we would like to see this model expanded in future years through other housing types along the housing affordable continuum. But the, we have some concerns with the current budget plan, which, uh, which, which are found in the BSA. First, the BSA requires that all $5 million in new local rent supplement be made available to priority one homeless families. We support a portion of this funding being restricted in this way. However, unless a significant portion is also used under, under original LRSP guidelines, it will be difficult for, for providers like Jubilee to serve low income wage workers and fixed income elderly who are currently not homeless. The current restrictions will exclude these households from eligibility and will make it difficult for providers like Jubilee to operate to access the operating subsidy needed to house this important segment of the community. There are currently tens of thousands of DC residents who are housing burden, and the LRSP is a key tool in serving this group. Currently, $2 million in LRSP is, is available in the DHCD RFP for use in Category 1 homeless families. We strongly recommend that a significant amount of the remaining $3 million in new LRSP be made available for low-wage workers and fixed-income residents now and in this RFP. As we understand it, it would take immediate intentional and immediate effort to accomplish this, this goal. The issue seems to be that the current definition in the BSA prohibits using the remaining $3 million for rent supplement for non-Category 1 homeless families, and that aspects of the MOU guiding the RFP and RFP itself are not synchronized with the BSA definition. 
A related challenge for Jubilee has to do with the way the current priorities may create an over-concentration of vulnerable households in a single housing community. In order to meet the Jubilee mission, we need LRSP to reach the 30% AMI affordable range. But if all the households must be priority one homeless, we, we are concerned that it would be risky concentration of high-risk, high-need individuals. This concentration could potentially upset the mixed income profile of our projects and the resultant benefits of social integration. I think I will stop there, and if there are some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mallett, for your uh, testimony. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Nyhan. I think you have cleared up some things for us. Um, and I will get from the Deputy Mayor what the agreement is with the district and WASA, what the current agreement is um, with the district and WASA, if this is a parcel that we already own. Um, do you know where the, the potential relocation sites are? I know, I know that DC Water is currently evaluating a variety of options for a program fit, and basically they can't, a, 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 an option doesn't become viable until DC Water can say, hey, here's the amount of trucks and buildings that we need to put on here to execute the relocation. I think a good follow-up step might be for all of us to come in and brief you and discuss it further. Okay. Um, because it's, I would have, I frankly want to know where the trucks are going. Mm hmm Understand. And so do you know how many vehicles there are? I will get that to you in writing. I don't remember the exact number. All right. So we'll invite you, the Deputy Mayor Wassa, to come in and talk about this. Thank you very much. That's going to be critical to moving forward. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll get that done as, as, soon as, um, as soon as possible. But your testimony does uh, make it more clear. And let me ask you something. Uh, kind of unrelated to your testimony sure. because you have um, an arrangement there about taking care of the park space. Mm -hmm. Can you? And I'm asking this because I'm, I'm thinking about <coughs> Walter Reed and some sure. things that came up earlier. How how are you managing that? The so the yards park at the yards is subject to a three way park management agreement between Forest City, the district, and the local bid. And basically the way it works is the, the district in Forest City set up the rules of the road, if you will, as we negotiated the infrastructure finance documents for the yards. And then the bid is the manager. And if the revenues that Forest City and the district generate suffice for the bid to carry out their duties, then the bid manages the park. Um, so basically the bid doesn't have financial liability. On the other hand, because the net events income is an important part of the revenue stream, the bid has skin in the game to making sure that there's enough, basically to doing their part to make sure there's enough revenues to support the park maintenance. Okay, so what are the revenues for the park? So there's six revenue streams. I can give you a, a summary, and if you want to yeah. you know, delve in, please feel free to do so. There's six revenue streams. The key revenue streams are a special assessment that Forest City is paying, there was an initial startup fee that we funded via construction cost savings with bond proceeds of building the park in the first place. The third is a portion of the restaurant sales tax revenue for some restaurants we're developing on a privately owned piece of land right next to the park. Uh, the fourth is net event income. For example, last year about 60,000 people went to events at Yards Park. Many of them are free, some of them cost money. Um, the fifth is eventually potential naming rights proceeds. When the office leasing market comes back a little bit stronger and we can do office leasing, then we could sell naming rights and then remit the proceeds of those to help sp support the park. And the final is a uh, land participation payment. Basically, if we hit a home run on the land deal, then we pay some money to the city and that money goes to support the park as well. Okay, and how, much, how big is that park? How many acres? It's about six acres, 5.87, I believe. Okay. Um, and, and so at some point, we may ask you to come in and just talk about your experience Great. with that agreement. Um, we see in these larger developments huge public uh, parks being built. Yeah. Because um, that's public, or is that considered a private Oh, it's park? public, absolutely. Okay. Huge public parks. And um, maintenance of those parks and programming of those parks is really important. I'm concerned about it for Walter Reed. I'm concerned about it for <coughs> Millen, mm -hmm. um, which has 
just be almost doubled in size. Um, so we also have to be concerned about telling the truth to the the, the public mm -hmm. <laughs> that this is this is coming and, and you know we're not just going to build it and leave it there but this is what it will take um, to maintain it at the level that they expect mm -hmm. so I think that your your project can can be instructive and so uh, let's our offices be in contact to set up um, that meeting keeping Great. in mind we are on a tight schedule um, towards markup well, we're, we're available anytime we're going to want to get it done um, soon um, so Mr. Goldberg you heard my question or maybe you didn't um, I did ask the deputy mayor's office something some <coughs> cursory questions about fifth and I it sounds like the questions that you were raised are going to have to be covered in more depth um, in my follow-up meeting with them um, before before our markup I I don't know why the the <coughs> solicitation was was canceled um, they reported um, in their testimony that a resolicitation would be issued um, in the week coming so it's your testimony that nobody has been willing to meet with the selected bidder or the selected developer that is accurate nobody from the deputy mayor's office nobody from the deputy mayor's office nobody from the mayor's office Donahoe has tried I'm you know I'm speechless over the whole thing I don't understand how you could do that to a company that's been in this town for 29 years and let them find out in the newspapers not follow any of the rules that they're supposed to follow and not give them a cure period if there was a problem which there wasn't was and there, now delay it for another couple of years was there something issued to um, the select the developer in writing at all no so the only notice that you got that the city wouldn't be moving forward was the newspaper there was That's nothing got. ever and, and the ANC and, and and I was at the meeting where they they actually um, said that they notified one ANC or well is it happens that ANC they, no no I'm sorry they attempted to notify one ANC or because they're required to notify the ANC 30 days in advance if they pull something okay. like this um, but and they attempted to notify the ANC or well and they couldn't well as a matter of fact that ANC -er is no longer an ANC -er, so they didn't even bother finding out who the correct ANC -er is and contact that person everybody found out from the newspapers the ANC the developers everybody involved found out from the Washington Post is it really how we want to do business but, in this but town since then but since, since then, the I was at two meetings. They were you, asked questions, and okay. they were never answered the questions. Do you know if there have been any written uh, cancellation, anything in writing saying the district's no longer interested in pursuing this with you? I do not. Uh, I do not know that. I can find okay. that out for okay. you almost immediately. And uh, they are. They have been very much trying to get a meeting with uh, the deputy mayor. And w I mean, I, I cannot. I mean, Donahoe is built many many projects in this time that, that this thing has gone on okay it's been so four years I have gotten some other questions about it so what I'm, I'm going to ask the deputy mayor's office and we may be able to get it before we c conclude today is to get a copy of that communication that's you know stating that this the district is no longer going to pursue this with this developer um, and hopefully it, it says why um, so we'll look at that but we'll also have a follow-up discussion in this follow-up meeting that I'll have with them to go over so really that I really done. appreciate it okay it sounds good um, so uh, mr. mallet and Ms. court thank you for your testimony I have your written remarks and we'll make sure uh, we uh, consider it thank you very much can I approach and give you a copy yes. of this old bill that Dave Clark Thank you very much. Robert Pullman, Craig Pascal, <laughs> Michael Winnick, a Winchick, Bua Benite. Chris Horning, Chris, Chris is there. Marilyn Kresge Wolf.
Irma Morales. Dave Peprocki. Okay, Mr. Holman, you may begin. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser and members of the committee. My name is Robert Pullman. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the Budget Request and Budget Support Acts for the Department of Housing and Community Development. DHED is a valued partner with CNHED members in providing a continuum of housing affordable to all DC residents, and we testify today in support of the agency's FY 2013 and 2014 budgets. Specifically, we support the mayor's proposed budget increase of $67 million for the Housing Production Trust Fund from one-time FY 2013 surplus revenues, and a proposed use of ongoing funding for the local rent supplement program, which will permanently end transfers of $20 million per year from the trust fund to the local rent supplement program. Unless this transfer of funds is ended, the trust fund will have very little money going forward on an annual basis after the one-time appropriation has been spent. We request the restoration of $1 million to the Home Purchase Assistance Program to fully restore it to its FY 2013 funding level. Funding for HPAP has declined from a high of $35 million in the FY 2008 budget to $13 million in the proposed FY 2014 budget. While interest rates are at historic lows and there are still buying opportunities for low and moderate income first time home buyers in a number of our neighborhoods, now is the time to increase, not decrease, funding to HPAP. CNHED also strongly supports the Community Services Commercial Revitalization Budget request for $2,003,000 for the Small Business Technical Assistance Program and $700,000 in the additional revenue contingency list in the Budget Support Act for that purpose. This program is a vitally important tool that assists thousands of D.C. small businesses each year. The rest of my testimony is focused on the Budget Support Act. Turning to that act, I request that this committee review Title II, Subtitle H of the act, which is not consistent with the intent of the local rent supplement program authorizing legislation, and we think ties the hands of DHCD in funding affordable housing options for many of our most vulnerable citizens. It limits project and sponsor-based assistance to priority one homeless families or individuals referred by agencies under the direction of the mayor. The consolidated RFP just issued by DHCD on April 2nd already makes permanent supportive housing for homeless families and individuals a priority for the use of LRSP. Agencies under the direction of the mayor, including DHCD, DHS, and DMH, along with the DC Housing Authority and DC Housing Finance Agency, are already parties to that memorandum of understanding that governs the RFP. The consolidated RFP was designed to be the vehicle for these agencies to utilize LRSP in accordance with their respective priorities. They are already in the position of determining how LRSP funding will be used. The requirement imposed by the Budget Support Act will unnecessarily restrict the usage of LRSP in a way that was never intended by the authorizing legislation for this program. We fully support using uh, local rent supplement to house homeless families and individuals who have been assessed by DHS and DMH as needing permanent supportive housing. But this provision goes overboard in attempting to control 100 percent of the local rent supplement program, a program that's intended to serve those who need housing whose incomes are between zero and 30 percent of AMI. Further, this provision superimposes the priorities of DHS and DMH on an RFP process that is also intended to serve the housing priorities of three other agencies and is a process that's already underway. Now applicants are not quite sure what to do. While there is a possibility under the RFP that a high priority project such as housing for extremely low income seniors who are not currently homeless could be funded, the BSA, if passed, would retroactively eliminate that poss possibility. Also, because this provision only provides for referrals by agencies under the direction of the mayor, it would not allow for referrals from the Housing Authority, which is the agency in charge of the local rent supplement program. The $5 million of LRSP proposed in the FY 2014 budget should be made available and allocated through the current RFP, not through the Budget Support Act. CNHED would like to work with the committee to reconsider this Budget Support Act provision prior to markup. 
Chairman, Chairperson Bowser, we look forward to working with you, the committee, and the full council in support of permanent affordable housing solutions in the FY 2013 supplemental and 2014 budgets. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Are you Mr. Pascal? Okay. Please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chairperson Bowser, council staff, appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the fiscal uh, year 2014 and revised 2013 Department of Housing and Community Development budget. My name is Craig Pascal. I'm a fourth generation Washingtonian with a small, ba uh, strong background in community development. As some of you know, I had the honor to serve as the general counsel to the late Harry uh, L. Thomas Sr. And your father was one of our favorite constituents. Um, in addition, I have had the uh, opportunity for 14 years of serving as a community development banker and I'm currently Senior Vice President Community Development Specialist for bb and I'm also a member of the D.C. Housing Finance Agency Board. Uh, I've also been very proud to support the district over many years as uh, specifically I've been the chair of the independent review panel that was established many years ago in the Department of Housing and Community Development to review competitive grants for our Housing Production Trust Fund, Community Development Block Grant, Home and Tax Credit dollars. My uh, consistent chairmanship of that over three mayoral administrations, my work in banking, and my board position at DCHFA qualifies me to speak in support of the mayor's recommendation for $100 million in affordable housing. It is in the best interest of the district to provide quality housing for people of all incomes, especially our long-term residents. And this costs real money, which is why I support the additional funding. As an aside, I am concerned about recent and projected continued loss of federal dollars for affordable housing, and this will have a chilling impact on our continued re revitalization in the district and preservation of affordable housing. And this can be buffered by these additional local dollars. Uh, from my long-term perspective, I view investments in affordable housing and investments as investments in economic development and our people. One only needs to look at Shaw, Columbia Heights, U Street, Georgia Avenue, and several areas east of the river to see the great returns of invest, uh, return on investments of dollars spent on affordable housing in these areas in the creation of economic revitalization, public sector investments, new jobs, and new revenues to the city. If the public sector investments did not occur, I can guarantee you as a banker that many of these private sector investments would not, we see today would not exist. As a banker, I can also say that the additional public sector investment proposed will be matched by private sector debt and tax credit equity, leveraging these dollars up to hundreds of millions of dollars to maximize the benefits to the district, our local communities, and the residents. Investments in affordable housing also improves the health of our residents, saving health costs to the city, improves public safety, reducing the crime and homicide rate, improves ec and improves ec educational opportunities for our youth. If one has a safer and healthier environment to assist them, this assists them in their chances of learning. The district should be very proud of its long-term investments in affordable housing. This is one of the reasons why we are so strong as a city and municipality, and continued investments in affordable housing will allow us for continued financial, physical, and human success in our city. Um, for someone who has spent many years working on D.C. budgets at the D.C. Council, I know there is competition for limited dollars, but I know that uh, funds for affordable housing is a wise choice for the city. I just want to finish by saying Director Kelly and his team are doing an outstanding job prioritizing projects for funding using objective criteria. And thank you for allowing, allowing me to testify today. I appreciate uh, that, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pascal. Mr. Horning? Mr. Horning, yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and committee staff. My name is Chris Hornig. I'm a managing partner of Klein Hornig LLP. Klein Hornig is one of the nation's preeminent law firms focusing exclusively on affordable housing. I should also mention that I've lived in Mount Pleasant for the past 32 years, and every day I walk or ride my bicycle past the St. Dennis Apartments, and I'm grateful that the Housing Production Trust Fund helped preserve that important community asset. I hope you will support Mayor Gray's proposal to provide $87 million in additional funding to the Trust Fund. In the last 10 years, Klein Hornig has been involved with at least 17 housing transactions that were assisted by the trust fund. Those transactions produced almost 2,000 housing units affordable to low-income families and created thousands of jobs. Let me describe three of those deals. The Pollen Memorial development in the Kenilworth Parkside neighborhood will result in 125 rental and home ownership units. 
DHCD made a construction loan of $8 million using HPTF funds, which will convert to individual second mortgages for low-income buyers. That $8 million helped leverage another $19 million in other sources. Another special deal was the overlook at Oxen Run. There, $21.4 million in trust funds leveraged $54 million in other funds, making possible a total revitalization of 316 units at the former Parkside Terrace. Finally, a project we are particularly proud of is Three Tree Flats in Petworth, where a trust fund investment of $3.755 million leveraged an additional $19 million of debt and equity and made possible not only 130 rental units, but space for a community health care facility operated by Mary Center, one of the district's great nonprofits. When you build housing for low-income families, there is always an economic gap. Filling that gap is getting steadily harder. I work in communities around the country, and I can tell you that the places where projects are happening are the ones where local governments are providing the gap funding. The first reason for that is the obvious one, the ba budget's balance. But more importantly, every lender and investor knows which communities are being supportive and which are not. They want to lend and invest in places where the local government has put its own resources on the line. And when multiple lenders and investors compete for projects in a particular community, that means lower rates and larger loans and larger equity contributions. So the more help DC provides through, through the trust fund, the less need there is for, for a particular project and the more projects it can help. As a practitioner and as a citizen, I am grateful for the support the Council has shown in the past for affordable housing, and I urge you to continue that support for the Trust Fund. Thank you, Mr. Horning. Mr. Peprocki? Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Dave Peprocki, and I live in an affordable dwelling unit up in Kenyon Square uh, in Columbia Heights. I moved uh, to D.C. about six years ago to work in the international development field where I work in developing countries, helping them set up their public health systems. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to ensure that affordable housing uh, gets the funding it deserves and needs for those living in D.C. and those struggling to stay here. Um, it's important to put money into the, um, the different programs that are available, like the Housing Production Trust Fund, the Local Rent Supplement Program, and the Home Purchase Assistance Program. All of those are quite important. Uh, I'm an active member of uh, MANA's housing advocacy team, and some of my fellow team members have greatly benefited from your programs uh, and the assistance of HPAP loans. In addition, there are those who are part of uh, our team who are planning to access HPAP for, for um, purchases in the coming year. And as I've attended various hearings and meetings to testify, I've heard my friends repeatedly say how important this funding is. Uh, as a district homeowner, I want to see people have access to it so there are affordable ways to purchase a home and build up equity. It's in, terribly important for parents to be able to give something to their kids should something happen or just all of us have a chance to go up a level, and we can't really do that without having our own homes to stay in. Um, since HPAP is so important, um, I ask you to, to support it, along with uh, Council Member Barry, to advocate for maintaining HPAP levels uh, for, uh, for 2013. Uh, as DHCD did not report the full amount of the budget line item from last year, therefore it needs a, a million dollars to keep the same level of funding. Um, home ownership stabilizes neighborhoods and helps break the cycle of poverty, as we know, and by building government uh, generational wealth, um, D.C. has a very low home ownership rate, and so it's particularly important here. The uh, HPAP program helps D.C. realize those benefits by helping low-income families become owners, homeowners, and it has a far lower foreclosure rate, in part because of the training people uh, receive through the, the, um, the nonprofits that help them in those programs. So thank you for your time and support for this issue. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I want to thank you um, all for your testimony. Um, and I have, uh, I think, at least two of you have talked about um, how we can support home ownership, and we're certainly going to scrub the budget to see if there's anything additional we can do in that regard. Um, I think there's round support for increasing the Housing Production Trust Fund over the next several years, and um, we're going to uh, certainly be supportive of that. Um, now, Mr. Pascal, it's always good to see a Pascal 
at the council. Uh, and certainly um, we appreciate your service to the District of Columbia over many years. Um, but you also raised, I wanted to talk to you about one particular role that you play in um, being the chair of the independent review panel for the Housing Production Trust Fund, um, which will become even more um, important. Yeah. Uh, in the years moving forward. Can you tell me how that process works? Okay, um, and I don't want to confuse it with the Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board, which is something that is being reconstituted uh, with new members. So is that in business? I understood that it was not meeting. I think you're correct. Okay. How long and do you know how long that's been the case? And since I, I'm not serving on that, okay. I'm on this independent review panel, I, I, I don't know the answer okay. to that. Okay. I know that there's, uh, from what I understand, there's uh, a slate of people that are going to become before the council to um, uh, be moved through the council, and then uh, from my, and I've been asked to be part of that. So. Um, I look forward to serving if a subject to council confirmation. So you'll be on the advisory board and yes. chair the independent uh, review panel. So the well, the well, it's good to wear a lot of hats. Okay. <laughs> as long as they don't conflict. And so the independent review panel was established, uh, I think, about the time Mayor Williams came into office, and it was just um, to have. Uh, it's been about a half a dozen people over the years to. Um, just look at the transactions after they've been vetted by the department and if there's any consultants involved through the RFP process and they contain myself if you know Oramenta Newsom from LISC, uh, DC LISC, she's been on since the beginning uh, over the years there's been other representatives uh, that have come and gone there's usually a representative from the DC Fiscal Policy Institute uh, representative um, from the DC Housing Finance Agency and the Department of Mental Health and another I think a foundation and uh, maybe a consultant uh, over the, the various years that have a background and a long-term knowledge of it and uh, so is this an informal group? Informal, yes ma'am. So was it created by mayor's order or just by the directors? I think, it, it, Bob, do you know the? Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm not sure it was created by a mayor's order, but DHCD has a process, and it it, it is an informal uh, advisory panel, which uh, doesn't make final decisions, but it does uh, provide a third-party view of proposals, and then that's referred to the back to the department to the director, and, and they actually make uh, any final decisions. Okay, as, so as, you, as you know. this is a group of. Um, people who are more expert than an advisory, the advisory group might be in, in, in deal making? Yes, and, and back, various backgrounds uh, that contribute uh, to the, the process. And so we provide comments over the years. Again, the, the, the department always makes recommendations to the mayor who makes final decisions uh, pursuant to the law. But um, we've just basically given our input and um, over the years about what projects seem viable um, and maybe pr say make some comments about some projects that we have some concerns out based on our industry knowledge and it's worked out very well and, and I can tell you um, Director Kelly um, this last cycle I, I felt did an excellent job uh, with his final selections based on our review uh, and our input. Uh, not to say our review and, and all so was did right. So you score them? Uh, they're scored by a consultant. Uh, we um, rank them, which sometimes might be different than the consultant. So we rank them in terms of prioritization uh, of what we we feel are the best projects on down. Uh, so it's it's an informal ranking. We, okay. It's basically a one day process. So one, well, you go over a lot of applications. Right. We um, we get them uh, the application, a summary of the application several days in advance. Then we schedule a, a one-day meeting. Uh, again, under the new director, we they establish a, like a, a five or seven-minute presentation by each of the applications, and, and we so we gather some more input from okay. that, and then we uh, spend the afternoon. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, so we we, we get to uh, decisions pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, recommendations. 
Are the um, the applicants who aren't selected are they given the opportunity to debrief? I, I, it is yes. The answer is I, I understand. With your group or with the staff? With the staff. Okay. Um, I may have some additional questions um, for you. Maybe we can chat about it at a later date. I will have some questions for the director um, because it is, I don't know how transparent a process it is about the selections. And we want it to be as transparent as possible so that everybody knows how the decisions are being made, what criteria are used, and how the projects are being scored. Um, for example, is there any, um, are the projects kind of evaluated on a first come, first serve basis? Is there any um, effort given to look at geographic distribution of the resources, for example? Well, um, the, uh, in terms of the first question, it's part of an, a NOFA process, so it's not a first, so, you know, it's, okay. it's part of the NOFA. Relative to the second question, I, I can say, again, we're an informal group, so we, d and we just make uh, comments, not decisions, but we, we, I can say informally, we take uh, geographic disbursement okay. as a, uh, a consideration. Okay. And I think the department does too. Okay. And that just be maybe, and Bob, did you want to add? Yeah, could I just make a comment? I'm sure the director will go into it further, but uh, when you propose under the RFP, there's a whole set of uh, ranking points that you receive. It takes into account everything from the amount of leverage to the geographic, if there are any geographic pre preferences in that particular RFP, and there typically are some. Uh, type of housing and so forth. So all of that is done up front, and I believe, uh, Craig, if I'm not mistaken, that's the piece that's done by a, uh, initially by a consultant looking at all the proposals and, and doing ranking factors. Everything, however, I think in the final analysis is subject to review by the department. Okay. And then remember, then they just get a letter saying they're going to be subject to further underwriting. So, I got it. Yes. Okay. Well, that's helpful, um, especially as we um, look to make these uh, very needed increases um, to the Housing Production Trust Fund. We want to we want to make sure the process is as open as possible. So those are my questions. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Thank you. Um, we're going to go through uh, the list. Bua Bonitie, I called you in the earlier panel. And so I, I will say we have, um, we're on, for anybody who's following along, we're on uh, number 13 on our list of 42. Um, if you haven't test uh, if you haven't signed up, you may do so by seeing my clerk. Um, because we are many people, I'm going to ask everybody to stick to their three minutes. And also, um, I may not have specific questions for you, but know that I have your written testimony and I'm listening very um, carefully. Um, so, you know, don't take anything if I don't have uh, ever specific questions for every witness but we do want to get to everybody. Uh, did um, Marilyn Kresge Wolf come in? Irma Morales? And Michael Winnick? When, when is, did I get that right? Okay, Mr. Benitier. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members and staff of the Committee of Economic Development. My name is Bua Benitier, Managing Principal of Dantes Partners, a financier and developer of affordable housing um, transactions located here in the District of Columbia. Uh, to date, my company has been successful at assisting and financing over $253 million to create approximately 900 units in the District of Columbia. Um, very recently, on March 15, 2013, the Washington Business Journal published an article speaking to the fact that there are over 
9,000 Class A units currently under construction in the District of Columbia. The article also goes to point out that there is a lack of affordable housing units being built currently. <coughs> this along with another article published March 6, 2013, that the district is named the least affordable market in the country. In a nutshell, the district is officially increasingly unaffordable to people of modest means. This is why I am here today to work with you and your colleagues to ensure the resources are in place to stem the tide of market rate units vis-a-vis -vis workforce and affordable units. The resources, once approved, will help create and preserve anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 units. These same funds can be used to leverage approximately $300 million of private capital, be it tax credits or loan proceeds. Not to mention that these funds are loaned to the developers to generate additional income to produce even more units. Lastly, our industry is actually a major job and business creator as well as a major contributor to the district's tax basis. An example of how we've utilized Housing Production Trust Fund in the past, as you know, Council Member, is in the development located in Petworth on the corner of Georgia <coughs> Avenue and Taylor Street, the residences of Georgia Avenue, a recipient of Housing Production Trust Fund that is 100% occupied, 272 families at or below 60% of AMI. <coughs> We've also done a number of other transactions that have utilized Housing Production Trust Fund. It is my hope that you see, by approving the necessary funds, will provide much needed housing as well as create a mechanism to leverage multiple ancillary benefits that support the goals and vision of the committee in which you chair the Economic Department. <coughs> this concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, you Mr. Panettiere. Uh, Ms. Kresge-Wolf. Good afternoon. I'm Executive Director of Open Arms Housing. We are a three-and-a-half-year-old single-site permanent supportive housing project. We provide housing and on-site supportive services for unaccompanied women who have lived on the streets and in the emergency shelters of D.C. Our program uses local rent supplement su subsidies. We are ex seeking to expand by acquiring another building. We applaud the mayor's commitment of $100 million to affordable housing. We support the work of the Comprehensive Strategy Task Force with its recommendations to expand and preserve affordable housing. The restoration of funds to the Housing Production Trust Fund is a critical positive step. Our building was the result of capital funding through a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Mental Health and DHDCD. The consolidated RFP for permanent supportive housing is a long-awaited opportunity which will assist small nonprofits to apply for funds in a simplified process and will enhance our ability to increase capacity. In addition, we support the recommended recommendations of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development to add $250,000 of services funding in the RFP to fully serve 200 households. We support $3 million for project and sponsor-based local rent supplements and the addition of $2 million for tenant-based local rent supplements. And the addition of $4.3 million to the Permanent Supportive Housing Program as recommended by the Permanent Supportive Housing Committee of the Interagency Council on Homelessness. I would like to share some words from one of our residents, Ivy Thomas, who testified here Monday, but I didn't want to bring her today since she was here for four hours on Monday. Quote, I am very appreciative for this program made possible by the DHCD Housing Production Trust Fund and the Housing Authority Rent Supplement Subsidies. Women who are living in shelters and are still searching for a place to call home. They are looking for a chance like I was given a chance. The majority of us who are homeless fell on hard times. I was employed, I had a condo, but I lost it all and could no longer provide for myself. I became depressed. With a second chance and a place to call my own, I have structure, normalcy, and a place to recover from my medical problems. We need a housing strategy that meets the housing needs of all D.C. residents to give them a safe environment. Please restore the Housing Production Trust Fund program for others like me and the residents at Open Arms Housing who have mental health issues 
and physical disabilities so we too can make a contribution to society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Winnack, please correct my pronunciation. It's Winsack. Winsack. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson uh, Bowser and members of the staff. Um, I'm Michael Winsack, President of Winsack and Associates Architects and Planners. And over the last 27 years, we've produced over uh, 40,000 units of affordable housing, a large percentage of that uh, in the district. Um, I come before you today because I think we have a, a unique, intimate involvement with the residents of communities prior to uh, redevelopment and living in substandard conditions and then have a relationship that with them as it goes forward. Prior to the Housing Production Trust Fund, uh, the words for affordable housing were decent, safe, and sanitary or housing of last resort. And my firm's uh, motto is design empowering people and we really feel like that creating a high quality affordable housing does empower people it, we believe that a home is a central generator of, of self-image and self-esteem. Um, if you have a home that you're proud to point to as yours, it changes your entire outlook on your life and the opportunities that you feel empowered to, to seek. Um, it changes the entire community within the building, and it changes the entire community within the neighborhood. Um, the investment in the buildings through the Housing Production Trust Fund spurs additional improvements and investments from the private sector around these structures. Um, an example that has been talked about earlier is the Overlook at Oxen Run, originally 280 units. When I got there in 2000, it was abandoned other than 19 people living in appalling conditions. Through the use of the Housing Production Trust Funds, we were able to gut demolish the building, do major stabilization, and create a building that um, it actually is in your package that we feel um, is, uh, would be uh, comfortable in, on Massachusetts Avenue where the high-end development is, is happening. And again, that works towards the idea of, of uh, giving people a place that they can be proud of. The Housing Production Trust Fund played a major role in that revitalization, providing more than $21 million towards the project that had a $43 million total hard cost construction. We did look at new uh, removal of the building and new construction there, and that would have cost $61.7 million and would have produced much lower quality buildings out of wood construction. So there was actually a $20 million savings um, in the, the uh, renovation. Um, it acted as a catalyst for the neighborhood redevelopment and has become an icon for uh, people east of the river. Um, so the Housing Production Trust Fund in this case took those 280 units and created 360 uh, low-income senior re residents and uh, mixed-income family residents. Otherwise, the community would uh, left in jeopardy. Um, so there's a big difference between providing just a shelter and providing a home and understanding that difference is very important. The $87 million proposed by Mayor Gray for the Housing Production Trust Fund will allow more projects like the Overlook to become a reality, creating not just habitable buildings, but true living, nurturing, and sustainable mixed income communities and a place that people can call home. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Morales, I recognize Ms. Morales for five minutes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Irma Morales, propietaria del negocio Little Blessing Child Development Home. Soy residente del Distrito de Columbia desde hace nueve años. Estoy aquí para pedirle al Consejo que apoye la recomendación del alcalde Gray de incrementar los fondos puestos en el programa de asistencia técnica para pequeños negocios aquí en el distrito. Good afternoon. My name is Irma Morales, owner of small business Little Blessings Child Development Home. I've been a DC resident for the last nine years. I'm here to ask the council to support Mayor Gray's recommendation to increase funding for the Small Business Technical Assistance Program in the district. Mi negocio ubicado en Fort Torrent ofrece servicios de cuidado infantil para niños de tres, años, de tres semanas hasta cinco años. Procedente de Guatemala, vine aquí para salvaguardar la vida de mi familia. 
fue difícil al principio para mí, pero salí adelante y decidí estudiar. He sido una persona emprendedora y con proyecciones en negocios. Fui maestra en mi país. My business, located in Fort Totten, offers childcare services for children from three weeks to five years old. Originally from Guatemala, I came here to protect my family. It was difficult at first for me, but I moved ahead and decided to study. I see myself as an entrepreneur with a knack for business. I also was a children's teacher in my country. En el 2007 decidí trabajar para ser una proveedora de cuidado infantil. Quería ofrecer un espacio donde los papás podrían dejar a sus niños con tranquilidad y ofrecer un buen servicio. Pero para lograrlo me di cuenta que necesitaba ayuda con el lenguaje y asesoría en algunas áreas del negocio. In 2007, I decided to become a child care provider. I wanted to offer a space where parents could leave their children with tranquility and offer a good service. But I realized that I needed help accessing information in my native language and advice in specific areas of the business. Por medio de unos amigos me contactaron a LEDC para poder apoyarme aclarándome el camino que emprendí hace cinco años. Hace cinco años con mi daycare, aprendí a ordenar mis finanzas y he mejorado en cuanto a llevar a un mejor orden en mi negocio. Tomé clases de computación y he recibido apoyo técnico esencial y deseo continuar mejorando. He aprendido a cómo proyectarme como una exitosa empresaria. En el futuro tengo una meta de expandir mi negocio. También conocí mi reporte de crédito y estoy trabajando para mejorarlo y así obtener el sueño de mi propia vivienda para expandir mi negocio y atender a más niños bajo una nueva licencia ofreciendo un poco más amplitud y un lugar verde cerca donde puedan jugar. A few friends connected me to LEC, helping me understand my path forward that I began five years ago with my daycare. I learned how to organize my financials and my business is more organized. I took computer classes and received technical support to improve what I do. I've learned how to visualize success as an entrepreneur into the future, and I have plans to expand my business. I also learned about my credit report, and I am working to improve my credit score so I can buy a home and expand my business and intend to more children under a new license, offering more space and a green area nearby where children can play. Siempre los cambios suelen ser difíciles. Pero esta ciudad y su gente han sido muy amigables y aún mejor cuando se conocen instituciones sin fines de lucro dispuestos a servir a la comunidad en diferentes áreas. Agradezco a LEDC que nos apoya incondicionalmente y de antemano gracias a quienes les apoyan como entidad del gobierno y el programa de asistencia técnica para pequeños negocios. Mil gracias por ayudarnos a salir adelante. Change can be difficult, but this city and its people have been very friendly, and even more so when there are nonprofit organizations ready to serve the community in different way areas. I thank LADC for supporting us unconditionally, and I thank the DC government and the Small Business Technical Assistance Program for helping to make their work possible. Thank you for helping us progress and move forward. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony, Ms. Morales. Um, and I have all of the written comments from each of you uh, in, in supporting various aspects of the budget. And I thank you for your testimony. Manuel Ruiz. Colleen Daly. Jenny Reed. Tori Goldhammer. Mr. Ruiz, you may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser and committee members. Uh, my name is Manny Ruiz, and I'm a tenant organizer with the Affordable Housing Preservation Program at the Latino Economic Development Center. I'm here today in support of the mayor's proposed investment of $100 million towards affordable housing, particularly the $67 million towards the Housing Production Trust Fund and independent funding for the local rent supplement program. LADC is currently working with 20 buildings that are home to approximately 650 families, most of which are currently up for sale. Today you will hear from some of the tenants that are looking for funding to purchase their buildings either on their own, as a co-op, or by partnering with a developer who will own the building and preserve it as affordable housing. 
As you know, there are currently many opportunities to preserve affordable housing and prevent the displacement of long-term, low-income residents from their buildings and from the district. Just since the beginning of the current fiscal year, 56 buildings that house an estimated 2,000 families have gone up for sale. As I tell residents, a sale of a multifamily building in D.C. is both a risk and an opportunity. It's a risk as the new owner may try to take units out of affordability. And it's an opportunity for residents to preserve affordability for the long term and get improved conditions by purchasing the building themselves or by assigning their rights to a company that will have a contractual obligation to fix, fix up the building and preserve it as affordable housing. I have seen that when tenants have good options and technical assistance to understand their options, they make good decisions, meaning that when there is a party interested in purchasing and preserving the building as affordable housing, residents go with that option over buyouts, displacement, and the loss of affordable housing. When there is funding to support preservation, there are better options for residents. Over the last year, it's been extremely difficult to work through the TOPA process. There have been very limited funds to support preservation and the lack of clarity on how exactly how much funding is available. <laughs> Development consultants are reluctant to work with tenant groups to apply for DHD funds when there is uncertainty if there are even funds available. Without financial support in the form of low interest loans and tax credits, there is a missed preservation opportunity whenever a building goes up for sale. The tenants I work with and I were very pleased to see the mayor's proposed budget, which dedicates an additional $100 million to the production and preservation of affordable housing. We are working with projects that are ready now to access trust fund dollars to both acquire and renovate their affordable housing. Through research that the DC Fiscal Policy Institute has been conducting, we know that investing in tenant purchase projects is an economically and socially responsible investment of city funds. These funds will ensure that low and moderate income residents can remain in D.C.'s diverse neighborhoods and that the prosperity that the district is currently experiencing benefits all residents and communities. It is my hope that the city continues to fully fund these programs in the future and that its commitment to affordable housing creation and preservation remains firm. Thank you for, the, for supporting these important programs and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. <coughs> Ms. Daly? Good afternoon, Councilmember Bowser and committee staff. My name is Colleen Daly. I'm the interim executive director of LEDC and former vice chair of the board. For more than 20 years, LEDC has helped Latinos and other DC area residents to acquire, acquire the skills and financial tools to buy and stay in their homes, to keep their rental housing affordable, and to start or expand small businesses. As a community-based organization, we support key commitments within Mayor Gray's FY14 budget. After years of proposed cuts, the mayor's investments in affordable housing and small business development position residents to benefit from the city's economic momentum. We strongly support commitments to the Housing Production Trust Fund and the Small Business Technical Assistance Program. But we ask the DC Council to restore funding for the Home Purchase Assistance Program to preserve home ownership opportunities for DC residents. In support of renters who have joined their neighbors to advocate for affordable housing, LADC strongly encourages the council to support $87 million for funding for the Housing Production Trust Fund. We must immediately commit local funds to help jumpstart the city's production and preservation goals, with a particular focus on helping tenants to buy their buildings using the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. DC residents are fighting to live in decent, affordable housing, and the recent creation of the 5741 Colorado Avenue Cooperative in Ward 4 is just one example of how tenants can exercise their legal rights and preserve long-term affordability in their communities. As the district strives to complement the housing opportunities with job creation, the mayor's proposal to increase funding for the Small Business Technical Assistance Act program positions more entrepreneurs to start and expand small businesses. These funds help businesses access loans, integrate technology into their business models, expand childcare slots for parents, and access private public partnerships such as loans that LADC makes available through Kiva City DC. Since October, LADC has leveraged funding from the Small Business Technical Assistance Program to inject more than $246,000 into the local economy. And in fiscal year 2012, we supported the protected, um, sorry, supported the projected creation and or preservation of 231 jobs in the district. This program provides critical support to small businesses that want to be a part of neighborhood revitalization efforts. 
To, pervert, to preserve home ownership opportunities, we strongly urge the council to restore funding for the home purchase assistance program. The $1 million cut across home buyer assistance programs jeopardizes the ability of residents to move across the continuum of housing to rebuild equity in their communities. Since October, we have submitted 79 applications for the HPAP program, 70 of which have been approved and 30 have successfully uh, purchased with HPAP, well ahead of where we were in fiscal year 2012 at this point in time. While home buyers juggle many challenges in the marketplace, the demand for HPAP is significant and should be supported as housing prices continue their upswing. Please help us meet this demand for this valuable program by restoring funding. LEDC is fully committed to working with DHCD to create a better future for more than 5,000 district families with the funds that have been allocated in the mayor's FY14 budget. These programs play a crucial role in the district and we will continue to look for opportunities to strengthen our partnership with DHCD and to increase our impact on families and communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Reed. Chairman Bowser, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jenny Reed and I'm the policy director of the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. I'm here today to testify in support of the proposed 87 million in increase in funding for the Housing Production Trust Fund, as well as the need for increased transparency of the trust fund. The Housing Production Trust Fund, which is managed by DHCD, is DC's main source for affordable housing construction and renovation. It also assists tenants who wish to purchase their building when it's put up for sale. Under legislation enacted in 2002, approximately 15% of deed recordation and transfer taxes are dedicated to the fund each fiscal year. This funding rose substantially after fiscal year 2002 during DC's real estate market boom. In addition, deed taxes were raised in fiscal year 2007 to expand funding for trust fund and other programs. However, starting in 2008, DC's real estate market substantially cooled and as a result, there was a sharp decline in support for the trust fund. As the real estate market began to heat up again in fiscal year 11, uh, resources began to rise, yet in both fiscal year 12 and 13, the mayor's budget cut approximately 20 million in new funding for the trust fund. And those cuts were set to stay in place through approximately 2016. The mayor's proposed 2014 budget and revised 13 budget would significantly increase resources for the trust fund. Funding for the trust fund in the revised 13 budget is 82 million, which is nearly three times the fiscal year 12 funding level. And proposed resources for 14 are, will be 36 million and more than double the resources available in the 13 approved budget. It's also notable that the budget no longer contains the proposed cut of $20 million that would have extended through fiscal year 16. The increase in funding will help kickstart the mayor's goal of creating 10,000 new units of affordable housing by 2020. The 87 million should help create and or preserve roughly 1,200 units of housing affordable for very low income, low income and moderate income families. Looking ahead, proposed funding for the trust fund beyond fiscal year 14 is expected to be relatively flat, growing less than 1% over the financial plan period after adjusting for inflation. A $36 million annual contribution to the trust fund would produce approximately 480 units a year. This is by no means the only mechanism DC has to create affordable housing, but as our main source for affordable housing construction and preservation, it highlights that other resources will be needed to reach the mayor's goal of 10,000 net new units of affordable housing and 8,000 8, units of affordable housing preserved by 2020. Infusion of funds like those made for fiscal year 13 will be needed in future years to meet these goals, which were also recommended by the recent housing task force. Um, and just to wrap up, as funding for the trust fund is restored and the fund becomes more active, it becomes increasingly important to have solid information on how it's operating. Um, we can estimate how much the trust fund is expected to produce, um, but without the reports, the annual reports that DHCD produces on the trust fund, we don't have a, a real accurate sense of what resources are available, what projects are committed or obligated in the pipeline, whether the fund is oversubscribed, and what's the availability in the coming years. We haven't seen a report since the last quarter of fiscal year 11, and so we look forward to a new report from the trust fund, particularly since it's getting such a big infusion of dollars to see how those will be spent. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Ms. Goldhammer? Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Goldhammer. My name is Tori Goldhammer, and I am the founder and leader of the DC Falls Free Coalition. I'm also an occupational therapist working in the Metro DC region. 
My employment and advocacy efforts are focused on helping older adults in the district remain safely in their homes. My primary role as an OT is to perform home assessments to determine what equipment and modifications would be helpful to improve accessibility and safety. Typically, these recommended items and modifications are not covered by insurance, but require out-of-pocket payment. These costs are often out of reach for low-income residents of the district. Fortunately, the district has developed programs to address this inequity and help defray the costs of home modification, for example, to construct a ramp or install a stair lift. The Single Family Residential Rehabilitation Program, run through the Department of Housing and Community Development, operates the Handicapped Accessibility Improvement Program, or HAIP. Council Member Bowser, at DCHD's performance oversight hearing, you called attention to these programs. You noted that it would be beneficial to increase funding for the programs in fiscal year 2014 to serve additional district residents. <clears throat> we would support such an increase. Independent of this increase, however, we recommend a thorough evaluation of the process, procedures, and regulations governing these programs. According to the information provided by the fact sheet, the HAIP program provides a grant of up to $30,000 for improvements needed to remove physical barriers within a home for persons with mobility or physical impairments. This program would be very helpful in assisting low-income seniors remain in their homes. However, the process is often overwhelming for older adults. In my written testimony, I have described the process for application and procedures for getting the work done. <clears throat> As you will see, the process is cumbersome and lengthy. In my experience, the older adult often abandons the effort. This is also the experience of several community-based social workers in D.C. who were contacted by our coalition. I have included two of their examples at the end of my written testimony. By not securing basic modifications for safety, the older adult is at risk of isolation, falls, and possible nursing home placement. This is unfortunate because it not only affects their quality of life, but it can also lead to substantial costs for the district. For example, the cost of a set of grab bars and a stair lift is approximately $3,500, whereas a 30-day stay in a district nursing home costs DC Medicaid anywhere from $6,000 to $13,500, depending on the facility. I would like to emphasize that the HAIP program can play a significant role in the ability of the older adult to age in place, but the process and procedures are very difficult for an older adult to navigate. Our coalition would like to request the HAIP program be revised to streamline the process and remove some of the burden from the older adult. We appreciate that the district continues to fund these programs and respectfully request that the district evaluate and revise the procedures using best practices from other jurisdictions. It is our hope that this will allow low-income older adults to remain safely in their homes and help DC achieve the goal of becoming an age-friendly city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Gohan. -Marin. Thank you for um, your attention uh, to this because we did uh, actually ask the department for some clarification because we noted that nearly seven million dollars, and, and I want I'm hoping I'm looking at this wrong, but nearly seven million dollars was unspent in this category. Um, so what, what we understand is that the affordable housing funds previously budgeted in this activity uh, will be at reallocated to other affordable housing activities. Um, so I'm going to ask I'm going to ask some questions about that um, because I think what they're suggesting is that some unspent money that they have in, in, the, in the order of seven million dollars can be um, reallocated into um, these single family um, rehab programs. So we'll we'll have some questions about that. So thank you for thank you. that. Um, so Miss Reed. Um, Thank you for giving us the, the history of it and for calling attention to the fact that we'll level off in the coming years if we aren't, if we, you know, we don't start thinking ahead mm -hmm. and that the, the $100 million was going to get us about 10% of the way um, to, to the goal of, of $10,000. So we'll have to just continue to keep our eye on the ball. Um, and uh, if, if we want these new units, we're going to have to make some choices about how to fund them consistently over mm -hmm. the next several years. So this is helpful. Um, and I want to thank my friends also from the Latino Economic Development Corporation. And we look forward to uh, having you in the neighborhood also. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Tom Wilson. Thank you. 
Robin Billings. Robin Billings. Okay. Diane Richardson Spate. Reverend John Graham. And I'm going to take just two minutes and I'll be right back with you to start your testimony. Okay, Mr. Wilson, you may begin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Tom Wilson. I live in Jim Graham's ward at 1919 Calvert Street, and I've lived there off and on since 1981. I'm the president of the 1919 Calvert uh, Street Tenants Association. This building is a uh, single room occupancy accommodation or rooming house. We have 14 units uh, on four floors with bathrooms on each floor, and we have uh, basic kitchen facilities in each uh, room. Uh, when I moved here in 1971, there were numerous SROs in the area, 
but since about 1981, uh, because of gentrification, we're one of the few remaining SRO, SROs providing affordable, affordable housing in the area. Uh, last February, the owner put the uh, building on the market, and a Maryland developer signed a contract for $925,000 to purchase the prop property. property. Naturally, we were uh, concerned that we were going to lose our affordable housing uh, to development. With the help of Manny Ruiz, who was just up here, of the Latino Economic Development Corporation, and John Mangin of the Harrison Institute for Housing and uh, Community Development, we have been able to exercise our rights under the uh, our, first, uh, our rights of first refusal to attempt to purchase the building under the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase or TOPA Act. Uh, when I was here and, and testified in uh, May in uh, last February, we had until May 12th uh, to put something together. Um, we have applied to the Department of Housing and Community Development for a $1.4 million uh, low-cost mortgage to purchase and rehab the building. We have obtained $36,000 in earnest money deposits for the down payment for the building and $15,000 in pre-development costs from First City Enterprise Bank on U Street uh, and are working with the Institute for Community Economics uh, for a bridge loan to get us past May 12th. Development since uh, I testified in February has been that with the market study, uh, we have uh, put together a market study that has determined that the value of the building will be more than the loan uh, when the renovations and repairs are done. And a needs assessment uh, uh, study, uh, both of which are required by DHCD, uh, has determined that our estimates of the cost uh, of the re renovations and whatnot will, are in line with what uh, we've projected. In addition, uh, we, uh, the owner of the building, Mrs. Henry, has agreed to extend the TOPA process for 90 days. The advantage of this to us, of course, is that we're going to be able to hold off on the bridge loan and the cost of the bridge uh, lending uh, and possibly actually move into the uh, DHCD uh, financing. Um, I'm here today to ask the committee to provide the financing for the 1919 Calvert, Calvert Street Tenants Association to purchase the building in order to preserve affordable housing in Adams Morgan to help us become first-time uh, homeowners. Um, I'm also asking the committee to continue to prod the uh, DHCD to move this thing forward. I'm also here, also here to support the mayor's allocation of uh, a proposed allocation for uh, uh, $67 million for the Housing Production Trust Fund and uh, the other uh, affordable housing uh, initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Richardson Spate? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I've gotten out myself out of order. Ms. Billings? Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Bowser, and to the rest of the councilmen. My name is Robin Billings, and I live in the Valencia Apartments in Ward 4. I am the Vice President of our Building Association, Tenants Association, and I'm here to represent 32 families. Today I'm here to testify in the support of the programs that Department of Housing and the Community Development Fund to help tenants preserve affordable housing like the Low Income Tax Credit Program and the Housing Production Trust Fund. I am pleased to hear that the mayor has committed $100 million to the fund of various programs DC renters rely on to preserve the improvement, to improve their affordable housing. The new fund will be critical to help the association keep the fight our building affordable. I have lived at this property since 2003. I love the community. I love the communication of living in Ward 4. My building is located very close to the 14, 16, and George Avenue corridor. Steps away from the new site, steps away from the, the new site of Walmart. In addition, I love living in this building that is diverse. I appreciate the development currently in the neighborhood that will, that will bring new jobs in retail. However, I fear that these, change, these new changes could currently increase the rent and displace DC residents. My home is DC, 
and I do not want to leave. In August of last year, we were notified by the landlord that our building is up for sale. This alarmed several of our neighbors, and we sought the help of the Latino Development Economic Development Center to learn about our rights and explore our TOPA opportunities. Since then, we have organized tenants associations, submitted a purchase contract. We have the help of our tenant lawyer and are seeking out potential <coughs> partners to buy the building on our behalf. The goal for this partnership is to make renovations to keep rents affordable for all of us and future tenants. In order to achieve our goals, government funding would be essential either from the Housing Production Trust Fund or from the Low Income House Tax Credit Program. Currently, we are meeting with potential buyers, and once we have identified which partner we will be using, will help to, to use to us meet our needs and goals, our next step will be seeking out funds from DHCD. In the past, because of lack of funding available for the preservation of affordable housing, our attempts to get money would have been nearly impossible. But now that the mayor has committed to full fund the, pro the housing program and trust fund, we have a newfound opportunity to upgrade our building, keep, keep rents low, and avoid displacement of families. In closing, Housing in the District of Columbia should be first and foremost for D.C. residents, meaning myself. When the time comes, I hope that DHCD will give us great consideration to help us restore our building and keep the property affordable. After all, it is our home. Also, we hope that the same consideration would be given to our sister associate in our neighborhood, the Concord and the Velasquez, so that they may also achieve their goals and prevent and preserve the affordable housing. We're all in this fight together. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the council. Thank you, Ms. Billings. Thank you very much. Um, Diane Richardson Spate. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. My name is Diane Richardson Spate and I work with MANA as the head advocacy and organizing officer. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. We are very encouraged by the investment in affordable housing programs this year across the continuum of housing. With that said, we ask you to find funding in order to maintain the FY 2013 HPAP funding levels. DHC did, DHCD did not report the full amount of the budget line item from last year, and therefore the program needs $1 million to be restored to keep the same level of funding. We also know that you're aware of the administrative issues with the HPAP program, and we hope that these problems will be improved over the next year so that the district will be poised to meet the growing demand for down payment assistant loans and home ownership opportunities while the interest rates are still low. Two weekends ago, I had the opportunity to attend Manus East of the River Home Buyer Education Fair. In addition to the realtors, and mortgage brokers, and nonprofits who provided resources, they were joined by folks like Ms. Twitty and Ms. Phillips who are willing to encourage others to join their home ownership journey. Last year, MANA had 100 people who showed up, and this year we had 150 people attend the event. A 50% increase in attendance demonstrates the district's residents' desire to be homeowners. If this isn't evidence enough, as a part of the one-time city lift program, MANA was granted $7 million by Wells Fargo to lend as down payment assistance this past fall. Over 1,300 people came to this event in early October, and 527 of them pre-qualified for a mortgage and left with down payment reservations, while the rest were signed up for counseling appointments at MANA. Of the 527 with reservations, 198 were D.C. residents that made under 80% of the area median income, which is the income group that HPAP serves. We continue to have 20 new people a week contact, contact us about the City Lift program, and we direct all of the D.C. residents to the Greater Washington Urban League to access HPAP. As of March 31st, um, you asked for a report, we have 217 folks um, who have closed on their homes and 113 of them have closed in DC. 
Of that number, 75 are under 80% AMI. And in order for them to continue to have access to home ownership and for this to be a reality, the district must maintain HPAP funding levels. This past Thursday, Mayor Gray and Director Michael Kelly joined MANA at our next 24 unit affordable condo rehab project, the Buxton. Future Ward 8 homeowners dedicated to purchase these homes are depending on HPAP funding in order for them to become homeowners. Let's ensure those seeking to invest in the district have access to HPAP. We still believe HPAP is one of the best investments that the city makes, helping families to get out of systems of poverty and improving our neighborhoods. Thank you. Reverend Graham. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and staff of the committee. I'm Reverend John Graham. I'm rector of Grace Episcopal Church in Lower Georgetown, and we're members of the Good Faith Communities Coalition, a group of churches and other places of worship that work directly with our homeless neighbors. Uh, my ministry as an ordained person began 30 years ago in Chicago when Harold Washington was mayor. Mayor Washington worked hard to implement what he called linked development. This policy meant for him and those around him that every dollar spent or tax break granted for construction in prosperous and up-and-coming neighborhoods should be matched by one spent on housing and neighborhood amenities in poor and working class communities. Jesus of Nazareth taught his followers to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Mayor Washington's tenure put this preaching into practice. He combined consummate political savvy with a genuine and deeply felt love for his city. He wanted his Chicago to make a place for everyone. In an act of considerable political courage, Mayor Washington went to the mat with several socially conservative African-American churches, arguing the Human Rights Ordinance of 1986, which included gay and lesbian persons in its purview, represented an extension of the civil rights movement. Likewise, he stood firm with downtown and lakefront developers, letting them know that their preferred parts of Chicago could not thrive unless they brought the rest of the city along with them. As you'll recall from news reports at the time, uh, terrible racial division and hostility accompanied uh, Washington's 1983 campaign for mayor. His reelection in 1987 had an entirely different feel. Many who had worked hard to defeat him in 1983 had come to realize that he had the interests of the whole city at heart. With patience, his vision of responsible governance through linked development translated itself into a platform for re-election by a broader coalition than the one that initially brought into power. So much of Washington, D.C.'s situation now reminds me of those years in Chicago. The time has come, really, it never left, for our own version of linked development. The Housing Production Trust Fund represents a powerful expression of this principle. Mayor Gray's proposal to invest $100 million in low and moderate income housing will bolster this fund. More is needed, though. A long-term, consistent revenue stream for the fund would link our communities one to another in a more definitive way than a one-time infusion. We cannot undertake this commitment at the expense of the local rent supplement plan, though. The Housing Production Trust Fund promises long-term linkages, but many homeless persons and families in the district need assistance now, and we're obligated to do all we can to help them care for themselves and their families. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth said his work would not be done until there was one flock and one shepherd. Mayor Washington kept the church at arm's length. Being both African American and probably gay, he had experienced his church's proclivity for exclusion in more than one way. But he had certainly internalized the one flock gospel and translated it into a philosophy for both political success and responsible governance. Robust and sustained support of the Housing Production Trust Fund can help us do the same here and now in Washington, D.C. Thank you, uh, Reverend Graham, and I want to thank you uh, all for your testimony. And uh, Ms. Billings, just to clarify, has, have the, has the Tenants Association made a request of DHCD as yet, or is it forthcoming? It's forthcoming. Okay. We have another buyer who's interested in purchasing the property, and we will be seeing them this evening. We okay. saw one uh, Monday, and then we'll be seeing the next one this okay. evening. And then we, could, we will make a decision, and I guess it would be, it would be submitted to your office so 
at least you know which which direction we're going in okay. as far as um, picking the buyer. Well, thank you for being here and bringing us up to date. Certainly, you live in a beautiful neighborhood. I know. Um, and I know that <laughs> you it. want to. We want to keep it that way, and Definitely. we want to keep you um, um, there as well. And Mr. Wilson, I'm going to ask my staff to follow up to see if we know what the status of your request is. Ma'am. We're I'm going to follow up to, on the status of your uh, engagement with DHCD. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it. We've moved forward. Uh, the LEDC and Harrison Institute has done just yeoman labor to get this done, and, and uh, uh, we've complied with everything they've asked. Okay. Well, thank you all for your testimony. Thank, thank you. you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too. Uh, Kevin Wright. Tanya Davis. Tanya Davis. Darren Davis. <coughs> Marilyn Phillips. Leon Wells. Uh, I called too many people. Okay. <laughs> sir, <laughs> sir, what's your name? Leon Wells. Leon Wells. Mr. Wells, can I ask you to come in the next panel? Would that be okay? Okay. Um, Kevin Wright, you may proceed. Good afternoon. Chairman Bowser, committee staff, my name is Reverend Kevin Wright and I'm the Director of Social Justice Ministries at Founder United Methodist Church, which is a member of the Good Faith Communities Coalition, a coalition of congregations devoted to standing with those among us who are without a permanent place to call their home. I and the members of my congregation want to live in a city, do not want to live in a city, in which one in four children live in poverty. We do not want to live in a city in which 600 kids do not have to look back someday and remember a shelter, car, or alleyway as their childhood home. We want to live in a city where greatness is not solely determined by the number of cranes framing our skyline or the brain power attracted to our think tanks, but also by the way in which our compassion compels us to care for the poor, the vulnerable, and the disabled. We applaud the mayor's investment of $87 million in the construction and renovation of affordable housing. This is a tremendous first step in helping all of our neighbors to thrive and flourish. However, it is only a first step. There must be a continual stream of funding invested in the Housing Production Trust Fund year after year. Furthermore, our city must invest more in programs that provide permanent support of housing so that our neighbors receive the social services necessary for their journey towards reasonable independence. The mayor's proposed budget calls for a $1 million increase in Housing First funding. We believe that this amount is too low to adequately address the ongoing needs of our neighbors. Additionally, the local rent supplement program helps make affordable housing by providing rental aid through vouchers. The tenant-based rental assistance alone with an investment of $9 million in additional funding could have assisted about 600 families more or individuals get into housing more quickly. It is my congregation's conviction that these two programs need additional and more regular sources of funding if we are to make a dent in the number of homeless individuals in Washington, D.C. A budget is not simply a series of numbers or even priorities on paper. Rather, it is a moral document that reveals the character and ethical core of a community. Our budget actualizes the commitment of our hearts to uphold the dignity of all people regardless of the size of their paycheck or the balance in their bank account. As the epistle of James remind us, reminds us, the purest religion rising above all doctrinal differences is that of caring for orphans and widows and those who cannot care for themselves. While it is my faith that compels us to this cause, it is my basic belief that we are all in this together that has brought me here today. I want Washington, D.C., my home, to be a great city. But that greatness is contingent on how we act now on behalf of our brothers and sisters in need. There is no time to delay. For a person's need for safe housing, just like a city's call to greatness, cannot be deferred. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Reverend. Um, Ms. Davis Moore? Okay. Morris. Morris, you may proceed. Okay. Um, 
Thank you for the opportunity um, to speak here before you today. My name is Tanya Morris. I live in the District of Columbia, and I've been a resident in Columbia Heights for 14 years. Um, I'm here because I care about affordable housing. I care about making sure that decent people have a decent place to live. I knew when I moved to Washington, D.C. that I wanted to stay. I also knew that I wanted to become a homeowner. With help from community-based nonprofits like NANA, I was able to prepare for home ownership. And one resource that I learned about was the Home Purchase Assistance Program and how it could give me the opportunity to become a homeowner. In 2007, I purchased an ADU in Columbia Heights. I live in the, in the Kenyon Square condo building. Um, and I was only able to do so because I received an HPAP loan. Um, when I purchased my unit in 2007, the market rate for the unit that I live in was well over $500,000. Still, um, I was able to, to take advantage of the opportunities given to me in the city, uh, but I still could not have done it without the HPAP grant. Um, a quarter of a million dollars does not go far in the District of Columbia. And unfortunately, a lot of city workers don't make the kind of money that they need to make in order to remain in the city. So without HPAP, um, a lot of valuable community members could not remain, <coughs> excuse me, in the city. And uh, although we know that home ownership stabilizes communities, um, DC has a very low home ownership rate. Um, and we know that getting people out of poverty and creating generational wealth uh, can be achieved through home ownership. Um, and Columbia Heights is a great example of that very thing. So I'm proud to be a part of that community. HPAP also helps to lower the foreclosure rate um, due to a lot of home ownership training from the nonprofits. And though I personally have had many issues as an owner of an affordable dwelling unit, um, I wouldn't trade the opportunity to be a homeowner for going back to being a renter. Um, so I would like today, Council Member Bowser, for you, uh, along with your colleagues, to continue to advocate for fully funding the HPAP fund. Um, it's the only way that families like mine can continue to stay in D.C. and be valuable uh, members of this community. Additionally, the Housing Production Trust Fund um, provides a means for uh, people to remain in the community that don't necessarily want to be homeowners, that want to that, that are, are renters, that are coming out of situations of homelessness, and by fully funding um, the, the trust fund with the dedicated income stream, uh, it, to me, it indicates to us, your constituents, that you are not only concerned, but that you're also fully committed. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. For it, Mr. Davis. Good afternoon. My name is Darren Davis. I live in Ward 8. I'm the owner of Anacostia River Realty. We specialize in real estate sales and development in neighborhoods east of the Anacostia River. I'm interested in speaking here today because I believe that it's important the HPAP funding be restored to the 2013 levels. As a real estate broker, I have worked with many clients who have benefited from the program. These are buyers who are in need of some form of insist assistance in order to purchase a home. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, the country's home ownership rate is 66.3. The district's home ownership rate is 45 percent. The HPAP financial closing assistance is important. It is one way that we could help increase home ownership in Washington, D.C. For instance, on a home price of 250000 the closing cost could be upwards of $15,000. Even though the resident might be able to afford the monthly payment, they won't have the upfront money needed to close the deal. These funds are especially important for those residents who are seeking housing in neighborhoods east of the Anacostia River. 
where home ownership is 40% in Ward 8 and a dismal 24% in Ward 8. I'm sorry, 40% in Ward 7 and a dismal 24% of home ownership in Ward 8. Affordable housing and home ownership programs like HPAP should be readily available to those residents who qualify. As DC neighborhoods changes and prices and gentrification increases, I'm afraid that within the next few years, home ownership would not be an option for low to moderate citizens. HPAP has lower foreclosure rates than the average regional average due to the training uh, by nonprofits. And as mentioned here today, home ownership stabilizes neighborhoods and it helps break the cycle of poverty by building generational wealth. The Home Purchase Association program helps DC residents realize these benefits by helping low to moderate income families become homeowners. Since HPAP is so important, I ask that you advocate and maintain the HPAP funding levels from 2013. DHCD did not report the full amount of the budget line item from last year. Therefore, we need the $1 million to be restored to keep this level of funding the same. In conclusion, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to give voice to the many voiceless individuals in which I serve. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Ms. Phillips? Thank you, Council Member Bowser. I am Marilyn Phillips, a resident of the District of Columbia in Ward 8. My husband is a first-time home buyer and has recently signed a contract for the purchase of MANA's newest condominium project in Ward 8, the Buxton, located in historic Anacostia, which recently had a groundbreaking ceremony with Mayor Gray last week. As first-time home buyers, we plan on utilizing the district's HPAP to help us with the purchase of our new condominium unit in Ward 8. Also, I am an active member of MANA's housing advocacy team working towards affordable housing justice for all in the district. My husband has worked very hard over the last five years to develop, to develop a pristine credit report with a favorable FICO score. My personal situation is that after 35 years as a legal assistant, I was diagnosed in 2006 with breast cancer. I went back to work in 2008 and was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer to the bone in 2009. I have been advised that this type of cancer is very slow growing and one can survive for 15 to 20 years or longer. I have many doctor's appointments and cannot place that burden of time out for appointments on a new employer. So I stay at home and help others when I can by composing letters, creating resumes, or by making phone calls, all on a volunteer basis. The good news is that I am in remission and have been since 2010. My only income is SSDI and will use whatever I need to ensure that we get the keys to the door. As I am sure you will agree, renting in the District of Columbia is quite expensive and the first time home buyer's opportunity and all that it offers is more conducive to our income and expenses. Home ownership stabilizes neighborhoods and helps break the cycle of poverty by building generational wealth, but DC has a very low home ownership rate. The Home Purchase Assistance Program helps DC realize those benefits by helping low to moderate income families become homeowners. HPAP also has a lower foreclosure, foreclosure rate than the regional average due to homeowner training provided by nonprofits. Both of us are very excited about signing the contract with MANA for a unit at the Buxton Condominium, and we strongly urge you to advocate for maintaining the HPAP funding levels from 2013. We know DHCD did not report the full amount of the budget line item from last year and therefore needs $1 million to be restored to keep the same level of funding. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to thank you all for your um, testimony, and I certainly share your um, 
your passion about making sure we're doing all that we can to assist um, folks in the District of Columbia to become um, homeowners. I couldn't agree with you more, Ms. Davis Morris, and um, the the ability to create wealth for families uh, in uh, and buying a home is so critical uh, to, to pass that wealth on uh, to, to the next generation. Um, we know that there are some areas of our city where home ownership rates are very high, um, like the one I represent, and we know that there are other um, areas where it's not. And I, I've joined uh, Council Member Barry in, in um, being concerned and being focused on making sure that we increase home ownership opportunities in, in all parts of the of the city. So I look forward to to uh, reading um, your testimony in detail and incorporating it to, into our thoughts. So thank you all for coming okay. down. Thank you. Okay, Leon Wells, Gabriella Massi. Simone Hostin? Is Simone Hostin here? Lachelle Rivers? Ms. Rivers? Will Merrifield? Okay, Mr. Wells, you want to start? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Leon Wells, and I live at the Concord Apartments in Ward 4. I'm the president of the Tenant Association, and I represent 82 families who live at the property, and I'd just like to say thank you, first of all, for this opportunity. Um, again, thank you, Committee Chairperson Bowles, for sending one of your staff members to our Tenant Association meeting on February 23rd as you said you would. We appreciate your efforts to make certain that we were authentic in our request for affordable housing and to assess the strength of our tenant association. I believe that we were able to demonstrate that we were serious about preserving affordable housing and that we understand what we are about to embark upon. We were deeply moved by your concern which generated a great deal of trust in you and your office. So thank you again. I'm here today to testify in support of the mayor's budget proposal to invest $100 million in affordable, $100 million in affordable, in the affordable housing in the district. Our building is applying for low-income housing tax credit and funds from the Housing Production Fund to ensure that our property can remain, affo remain as affordable housing for the current and future residents. I've been a resident of the Concord Apartments since, 19, since August of 1992. I'm one of the longest term residents of the property along with a few others who are seniors and retirees and some who may be on medical disability. Our building went up for sale in August of last year and since then we have been proactive in trying to maintain it as affordable housing and to ensure we can stay living in this beautiful city. We have been working through the TOPA process with the support of LEDC. We retained an attorney from Nixon and Peabody, and we have received an earnest money loan of almost $311,500 from LISC. We are organized, and we have been working very diligently as a group after interviewing multiple developers, we have chosen one to partner with, Urban Manners, Matters, who will purchase the property and renovate it while preserving the affordable rents. At this time, we have, we have completed and assigned off on all the documents necessary for Urban Matters to, to ensure that they can purchase and receive tax credits and trust fund money. There are two other buildings in the neighborhood which were mentioned earlier. Um, currently have the same owner and uh, represents 49 additional families. They are also for sale and are working through the process as well. We all want to preserve our housing as affordable and remain in the neighborhood. We are grateful for the support we have received so far through DHCD and LEDC and ask that uh, the Housing Production Trust Fund is fully funding 
funded so that the DHCD can continue to support tenants in preserving their affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Ms. <coughs> Massey. Hello, Councilmember Bowser. Hello. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment today uh, on the fiscal year 2014 budget uh, regarding funding for DHCD and the money that goes for small business technical assistance. Um, I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of all our team, of course our President Angela Franco as well, and the many business owners that we help through our program. My name is Gary Ramosi. I'm the Director of Program and Resource Development for the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Now through this neighborhood assistance funding, uh, the Chamber has been able to strengthen its presence in Ward 5, especially in the corridor of Rhode Island Avenue Northeast, helping small businesses in that area. Last year, we engaged approximately 440 businesses and entrepreneurs through our activities, which include individualized technical assistance, educational seminars, networking events. We do some very large events like our expo, and you, uh, many of you have participated in the Small Business Expo, which is, was a great success, and it helps over you know, 1,700 people in one day and other promotional events for the corridor and to promote small businesses in Ward 5 and other minority-owned businesses in the District of Columbia. Uh, at this time, we have already reached last year's numbers with a grant that is similar in size. So I think that these monies we use very effectively in helping our small businesses in the district. So I am going to submit my testimony with details of our activities, and I would rather just read a couple of phrases from testimony submitted by four small business owners who could not be here today, and these are some of our technical assistance recipients. We have quite a, a range of businesses in size and in the length of time that they have been serving the district through their services. Um, and we have, for starters, a business, a food business called Lot 1644. And she writes, I can personally attest to the great value and impact that it had on my business located in Ward 5. I am opening a business on the 1600 block of North Capitol Street. My business will be located along a stretch of North Capitol Street that has been dormant and dilapidated for years, if not decades. This is a section of the district that the residents of Ward 5, Ward 5 leadership, and even the district's leadership has acknowledged is in dire need of revitalization. Providing business owners access to the level of expertise offered by the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation staff and consultants is one of the tools we can and should continue to use to lure entrepreneurs to this stretch of North Capitol Street. We also have testimony from a very popular business, uh, Uncle Chip's Cookies. We were able to also help them uh, with expert technical assistance. And she says, I hope my relationship with the Chamber continues into the implementation process of the assistance that we are providing her. We have Ms. Christine Davis, and Ms. Davis is a first-time entrepreneur in the district. She has, she said, I have hundreds of questions and a head full of ideas, but without guidance, nothing will materialize. The one-on-one -on -one assistance I received from my chamber small business consultant helped me find answers to my questions and plan strategically to make my ideas a reality. I've been a client since October 2012, and, just, and in just a few short months, I know that I'm on track to open my business, a dance, education, fitness, and wellness company next year in Ward 5. I also have testimony from a business called ETN Angel Care. They have been in business for about five years, and they provide in-home health care through nursing aides. And in the two years that we have helped them, they, have, they now have 40 employees throughout the district providing this type of assistance. <clears throat> and we have helped them with their strategic growth planning and securing additional funds to, to be able to, you know, prepare for some, some more of this growth. So this, these are some of the things that the funding from DHCD makes possible. So we are here to support the budget uh, that has been, you know, that has, uh, the budget the mayor has proposed for this specific uh, line item. We, uh, again, we are not sure if we will be getting this funding. We compete for the money, 
But whoever gets his money and what, whatever nonprofit that serves the district receives the funding uh, will benefit, you know, if this is, uh, again, kept in the budget. Hopefully this will remain as is. All right. Thank you, Ms. Mossy. Uh, Ms. Rivers? Yes. Can I be heard? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Um, I'm going to keep this as brief as possible. How are you doing? Um, I've miscut a couple times because my name was like 100 on the list. But I'm going to make this. Um, do you have my paperwork before you? I'm checking now. Yes. Okay. This has to do with me being epileptic. I have a mental disability. And I have been on the housing waiting list for a little over 10 years. Let's just say my son was three years old and now he's 13. I do not want to live in Southeast. Um, I have a boy. He is a straight-A student, has been for half his life. I'm comfortable in Northwest. Uh, there are some things I can't afford. However, they do go according to your income, your yearly income. It might be an apartment that's $900 a month, but you've got to be making $50,000 a year. I find that very discriminatory, but that is happening Northwest. Everybody keeps saying, move to Southeast, move to Southeast. I don't drive. I'm not going to be walking around with a bunch of groceries on the Metro bus. I need to be where everything is within walking distance. Where my son can walk to school, I can walk to the store, I can get around walking distance because I do not drive. And I suffer from seizures and epilepsy. Things need to be more convenient to me. I was blessed with the SSDI, therefore I only get 24000 a year. I used to make double that because I do have a college education. But due to me making the 24000 a year that the government has blessed me with, I cannot get housing under that amount of money per year. There are places that are affordable, like in Northeast, $800 a month for rent, but you've got to be making over $30,000 a year. It's very discriminatory. Not everybody who is on low income is hood, or whatever you want to call it. They're very educated people. But I just do not see myself, I mean, it's ridiculous because not only have I been reapplying, I've been to the homeless shelters. One of them, D.C. Village, that not, was knocked down for Metro to put more buses. I've been to, to Williams. I've been through a lot of people as far as homelessness goes just to bump my name up the list. Please let me get something because I make 24000 a year through SSDI, but 14000 of that goes to rent. That leaves me with, what, 9000 to play pay cable, electric, and all that stuff. By the time it's all done, do not ask me what I get for food stamps, sweetie, because $16 a month for food stamps is BS. $16 a month for food stamps, and that's because they go by my yearly income from SSDI. And it's just to the point where, what else do I do? Because I've done it all, darn near. I've done the protesting. I've done so many things. But it's going to get to the point where he's 18 and gone before mama gets some help. So that's basically what it comes down to because I have all the paperwork. Every year I go down to housing and I renew myself as homeless on the list. I've had lawyers look into it and they've said that it's over, it's over 21,000 in front of me as far as homeless goes. And that was in 2009. So to be honest, I just, I really need to know what can be done for me because it's, it's, it's help for all. I'm wearing this, you know, housing for all sticker. But right now, it's just me and my son. And I'm living in a place where there is no air condition, no garbage disposal, no things that I need to be paying over $1,000 a month for. And the rent is going to get raised every year, at least for the next four years. And then what's after that? I can't even afford to move if something better comes up for me because all my money goes to rent and everything else. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and I'll have some questions. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Merrifield. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Will Merrifield. I work as a housing advocate with the Affordable Housing Initiative at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. At the Legal Clinic, we primarily represent individuals making 30% or less AMI. Our clients are senior citizens, disabled individuals, people in school or job training programs, and the working poor. These are people who serve and cook the city's food every day, clean the office buildings at night, and perform a variety of other tasks that keep D.C. functioning. Furthermore, many of these individuals have lived in D.C. their entire lives. 
due to the systemic un due to the underfunding of truly sustainable affordable housing options for district residents as well as the reality forces and as well as the reality of market forces in DC many of the people I just described have been marginalized and now find themselves living in the streets sleeping with their children in emergency rooms and eking out an existence where they are literally living minute to minute and day to day Although the mayor is committed to producing an additional 10,000 affordable housing units by 2020, that number does not come close to meeting the actual demand for this housing. Furthermore, it will take an ongoing annual commitment on par with the mayor's recent $100 million investment to actually reach the 10,000 unit by 2020 goal. Currently, there are approximately 70,000 people on the wait list for subsidized housing at DCHA. That number is so large that DCHA recently closed the list in order to effectively manage it and to prevent people from having false hope they will receive this subsidy anytime remotely soon. As a community, we need to address the lack of affordable housing stock in DC for these residents. In order to create an affordable housing stock that actually meets the needs of its residents, the district must develop a truly effective preservation strategy. DHCD must be a key player in that strategy and should be actively working with the mayor and other agencies to set clear annual goals for preserving existing affordable housing and establish collaborative interagency response protocol for when affordable housing is threatened in the district. Agencies such as DHCD, DCHA, DEMPED, and DCHFA should work with tenants and affordable housing advocates to prioritize properties at risk of losing their affordability and create protocols and or consolidated funding schemes so that they will be poised and empowered to act collaboratively when, the properties, when these properties in the district are threatened. Furthermore, to truly address the current housing crisis, the agency must focus on preserving those units that are affordable for tenants below 30 and 60 percent of AMI. Fundamentally, to create an adequate supply of affordable housing and dig our way out of the crisis that district policies have created, we must start to take affordability seriously and make it the number one priority for all future development in the city. It is the Legal Clinic's hope the DHCD will play a vital role in providing thoughtful planning of future development and clear preservation strategy moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your testimony. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to see that you're, you're proceeding and it sounds like the tenants have been fully informed yes. and you're moving forward with the purchase of your building. So good luck and definitely um, keep us posted. Um, and Ms. Rivers, I do have a packet of information uh, from you. And so um, I think I would have to ask, you know, some offline questions to figure out if there's something that we can do to help. Yes. Um, yes. So why don't we make sure we have, and I think I have it here, your contact, but I'll make sure that we do your contact information to see if there's anything that we can do um, to help. Yes, okay. Um, and so I want to thank, uh, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Holston. Rachel Johnson. Rachel Johnson. Kenyatta Hazelwood. Kenyatta Hazelwood. Johnson. Brian Person. Angela Adrar. Ms. Holston? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to, to testify. My name is Simone Hostin, and I am a resident of War 6 and an employee of DC Fire and EMS Department. I am here because I support the continuum of housing. Before I was a condo owner, I was renting in an apartment over in East of the River. I now own a condo in downtown DC. 
I am very thankful for the opportunity to access HPAP and EHAP. The two programs provided significant support uh, for me to move from renting to becoming a homeowner in Washington, D.C. If more money is not put into the program, other people will not be able to access the resources. I am now a three-year homeowner because of HPAP. Four years ago, I learned about a new condo high-rise development literally through my office mail. I work in the fire marshal's office and a flyer came in, adverti came in advertising the new development in the HPAP and EHAP incentive program for firefighters, police, and teachers. If it was not for the HPAP and EHAP, I would not be able to afford my unit. HPAP provided me with home buyer education, home inspection, $70,000 from HPAP, $10,000 from EHAP, and assistance with my closing calls. I worked hard to become a homeowner, and HPAP EHAP was there to assist me on this road. Since HPAP is so important, I ask that you advocate for maintaining the HPAP funding levels from 2013. We know DHCD did not report the full amount of the budget line item from last year and therefore um, needs $1 million to be restored to keep the same level of funding. Home ownership stabilizes neighborhoods and helps break the cycle of poverty by building generational wealth, but D.C. has a very low home ownership rate. The Home Purchase Assistance Program helps D.C. realize those benefits by helping low to moderate income families become homeowners. HPAP also has a lower foreclosure rate than the regional average due to the homeowner training for provided by nonprofits. Thanks to HPAP EHAP, I was given financial opportunities that other programs and financial institutions don't offer. And most of all, I would not have been able to afford to move from renting in east of the river to owning in downtown D.C. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Hostin. Uh, Ms. Johnson? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, council members, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Rachel Yvonne Johnson. I am a resident of D.C., currently living on the streets. I am here today to talk about the DHS's increased investment in the housing First Permanent Supportive Housing Program. Housing First is an important program for ending homelessness for nearly 7,000 people like me. I'm here because the system has failed me. I worked since the age of 15 until illness and injuries forced me out of the workforce. I've lost things others would have committed suicide over. But not I. My higher power encourages me to keep fighting and never give up. As he encourages me, I encourage you, council members, to make a commitment to address chronic homelessness mm -hmm. and invest this year in the Housing First program so it can serve additional people, provide assistance, and building repairs. We deserve to have dignity, respect, a home, and the rights promised to us by our forefathers. Please support a budget that meets the needs of housing for all. I'd like to remind you of a story. You can follow along as it derives from the Holy Scriptures. Um, and I'm sorry, um, it has Luke uh, 19, 30 in yours, but it's Luke 10. Um, I'm sorry, it was a uh, type of typing error. In reply, Jesus said, I, um, that, that there was a certain man that was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this man um, be, uh, was beaten and left half dead. But there was a, uh, and a man um, saw um, that was coming down the road, um, which was a priest, saw the man, looked at him, and went to the other side of the road. And to a Levite came by, saw the man, looked at him, and he too went to the other side of the road. Then a third man, a Samaritan, came down the road, looked at the man with compassion, and said to himself, probably, I'm going to take this man and take care of him. He took the man, bandaged him up, put oil and wine on, on, his, on the man, mm. took him and put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn, probably a hotel for us, and, and made him uh, and told the innkeeper, if there's even, until this man gets well, 
I want to take I want him taken care of and if there's more money that needs to be I will give it to you when I come back and I need to, um, people you see that live on the streets like me are the or I want to ask are these the, the are we the people that the Bible are talking about um, just to add um, a little humor as honey boo-boo said you better recognize scriptures you see Again, it's what our forefathers fought for with, for all Americans. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. One more scripture, please. Proverbs 28, 27 says, He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them have many curses. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Mr. Person? Hi, my name is Brian Person. I own a home with my sister in uh, Ward 4, where we are presently uh, working with CHCD trying to get a roofing uh, voucher, a roofing grant, and a rehabilitation loan. We've been working with them closely for quite a while now. We started off with in a tug of war where they were trying to turn us down by telling us that we weren't uh, eligible. Then we went back and forth. I finally got one of the employees, uh, Mr. Hill, to uh, see the light that I wasn't really stupid and that I knew I was eligible for the program. So he, uh, to date, there's no work being done in my home. Um, we still are going back and forth. The process has gotten longer. I've gotten many stories from many people, right? Uh, to, uh, I've called to make complaints to the Head of CHCD, and I've got no response. They've kicked me right back down to Mr. Hill. Uh, from what I understand, Mr. Hill has been terminated now, huh. and my case is still in the upper, is still not uh, being handled properly. As a matter of fact, they're trying their best to dismiss it, right? And I'm not going to allow them to dismiss it because in the amount of time that they have taken to play these games with me, they could have at least. Get, uh, make sure I had the roofing grant so it would stop raining on the inside of my house. But uh, they seem to make, come up with educated, ed educated excuses, and I'm frankly tired of it. What I need, what I want, is to meet with the heads of CHCD and maybe someone from your office and get this straight, so they can start to work on my home the way it's supposed to be. Okay, thank you, Mr. Person. I'll have some questions for you. Um, Ms. Adrar? Yes, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Good afternoon, my name is Angela Adrar. I'm a proud homeowner and have been a DC resident since 2009. I'm here to ask the DC Council to restore funding for DC's Home Purchase Assistance Program, HPAP, which helped me, a single mother of two young ch children, buy an affordable home in one of the most expensive cities in the nation. I moved to D.C. after Peace Corps and grad school and began working at my dream job, a policy nonprofit that advocates for socially disadvantaged small farmers internationally. I lived in a group home with other women trying to desperately pay back mounting student loans, and the thought of owning a home was a joke. Then I had my first child, and I realized that renting a two-bedroom apartment in the city would be so expensive that in, in addition to my student loans, I'd need to also receive public assistance just to get by. I started researching and realized that it was a buyer's market, and a friend told me about the LEDC program and their partnership with HPAP. And we enlisted in the orientation courses together. From that point on, my hopes to provide a safe and stable life for my children and still work at a nonprofit in D.C. helping those that are also in need became a reality. D.C. has a vibrant community that includes people from various backgrounds, income levels, cultures, and lifestyles, and I want my children to benefit and contribute to that community for many years to come. I attended LEDC's first time home buyer seminar and got informed about the entire home buying process. These seminars really do help new home buyers understand the risks and the responsibilities of owning a home. I was exposed to all the facets of buying a home. For the first time in my life, I felt really ready to buy a home and make the investment in a community where I could set down some roots. 
My experience with LEDC and HPAP was engaging, positive, and very professional. In February 2012, I became a homeowner and a proud and engaged member of Ward 5. I have an edible front yard garden that I teach my neighbors about, two bedrooms for me and the kids, and I am um, getting married in 2014. Programs like HPAP help retain educated entry-level professionals within the city, not only building the local economy, but contributing to a vibrant D.C. community instead of having them move and spend elsewhere in the Beltway. This program is essential, especially with the market bouncing back and getting more expensive. Please restore $1 million to the HPAC program, and let's work to find an alternative solution that can benefit future district homeowners. Thank you. I want to uh, thank you all for your testimony. Um, and Ms. Hostin, thank you for putting the e the e EHAP program you described. That's for district government yes. workers, correct? Um, and we hear so often that D.C. residents can't afford to live in the district. And I'm so glad you came down to testify because you're living proof of programs that exist um, that our employees can take advantage of to buy and stay in the District of Columbia. So congratulations on that decision for yourself. Um, and, and also thank you for helping us spread the word to our 30,000 other employees, um, many of whom qualify for these programs. And uh, we want them to be able to consider them as they're considering um, their moves. So thank you for doing that. Well, and, I will say, yes. um, in, in me, me receiving, you know, a lot of money because I'm hearing now that HPAP has been cut down, um, my son's school, you know, I have a, a teacher that lives in Baltimore and she stay, She says she has to stay there because she cannot afford. Um, I have another teacher at my son's school that took a part of the program um, where it was uh, I believe MANA and one of the city banks that provided money mm -hmm. um, to purchase in DC and Maryland. So I'm thinking maybe three, four years ago it was, but I'm hearing now, even from the firefighters when they find out where I live, they're like wow I couldn't even you know I couldn't afford to stay so um, I'm fighting for the funding but I'm still hearing from professionals such as teachers and firefighters they cannot afford to move um, and I think a lot of it has to do with credit as well okay. for um, you know some is some persons just cannot afford it and for others it's the credit problems but I'm hearing a lot of people say they tried to get in DC they really wanted to stay um, but they had to go on to um, Prince George's County or Virginia. Okay. Well, thank you again um, for putting that. We want to explore to have as many programs as we can because, as, as you know, how much easier it is for your life to live close to where you work. Yes. Um, how would you like to you know, have to travel an hour both ways every day to come to work? I don't know what traffic. When I, I'm actually closer. Um, so I'm eight minutes from right. door to door. That's a blessing. I don't have traffic. And it's, it's good for us um, because you also are shopping. Your child is in school close by, so you're invested in our local schools. Um, your eyes on the street in your neighborhood. So having people who work for us live here um, is a win-win is a for the District of Columbia. Because so you, we care about to, your community. you care about your community. You care about your community. That also affects the service you give to our residents, and we like that too. Yes, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Brown, I'm so sorry. I, I was having some challenges when I was trying to, to do my speech, some physical challenges because I'm, I am ill, um, but I'm being healed. But um, I, I forgot to, the last part where the misconceptions were. No, I got uh, it. I have your, and I do have yeah. a written copy uh, okay. of your testimony, so, so thank you for that. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Person, I don't know the details of this issue. Um, and I'm happy to have my, my office work with you to see if there's something that we can shake out. Um, and uh, when the director comes up, I'll ask him to give us an update. Okay. Okay? All right, thank you. Thank you thank all for you. your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Juanita McKenzie. Ms. McKenzie. Aaliyah Osborne. Ms. Osborne. Robert Wooten. <coughs> India Fuller.
Ms. McKenzie, Hi. welcome. Thank you. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Honorable Chairwoman Muriel Bowser and committee members. My name is Juanita H. McKenzie and I live at 930 Randolph Street Northwest and I have lived here since October 25, 1974. My tenant association is the 930, 940, 960 Tenants Association and we were founded on August 12, 1981 and I have been a member since our conception and I currently serve as the president. We are a very strong association consisting of 61 members in an 81 unit complex. I am here to testify today on behalf of the tenant associations, seniors, low income, disabled residents, families, and single moms with children, native Washingtonians, and immigrants concerning the proposed 2014 budget. The Housing Production Trust Fund is the only local fund for the production and preservation of affordable housing. It finances all types of affordable housing from transitional, permanent, supportive housing, rental and limited, equity, cooperatives and home ownership. It is one of the most successful housing trust funds in this country. I want to thank the mayor for dedicating $100 million for affordable housing, and I ask that the council support his recommendation. My building, 930 Randolph Street, was sold on December 1st, 2011. This is the second time that my building has been sold, and it went from rent control to a tax exempt credit program now, which of course benefits the, the new owner. But still, this year, the one year after he bought our building, our taxes have risen tremendously. When we interviewed prospective buyers, they said they could not get financing from D.C. because there was no funds available in the Housing Production Trust Fund. There is a possibility of the involuntary displacement of long-term residents, such as myself, because of the threat of the increase of rent by the new homeowner. I have lost my job and I know that I cannot afford market rent. My building on Randolph Street is located in the historic neighborhood of Petworth in Ward 4, where you live. The community where I live is a fantastic, multicultural, diverse group of people, just like the people in my building complex. Petworth Apartment Homes is next door to Wendy's, the Chez Billy French Restaurant, Three Tree Flats Apartments Complex, which houses 119 brand new apartment, which has a stunning view of D.C.'s monuments, and houses the Murray's Health Center, the Yes Organic Market many churches and schools and the newly renovated Petworth Library. These are all in my neighborhood and I love my neighborhood and I want to continue to live there. Most people know my neighborhood because of the Petworth Metro Station that has high-rise apartments over top, which is the Park Plaza, which has a panoramic view of Washington, D.C. downtown. As you can see, I live in a wonderful neighborhood and I want to continue to live there and so do my neighbors. I cannot tell you how often I look around in amazement to see the new development and this is good. But I wonder if one day I will have to move. I am a native Washingtonian. I have lived in Northwest for over 60 years. There are seniors in this city such as myself and I just want to say that you continue to support the mayor in his proposal in this credit um, year for the $100 million in support of affordable housing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And if you keep up that description, I'm going to have to take you on the road with me. <laughs> Thank I'm going to have to take you on the road with me. We're very proud of your neighborhood. You live in a beautiful neighborhood. We've been working real hard to get all that new development that, that you mentioned. Um, and one thing I will say, and I'm just pausing right now, is because I go to a lot of neighborhoods where there's development happening. Um, but in Petworth, it feels different um, because I think that the neighbors have been at the table the entire time. 
Um, so the type of development that you're seeing in Petworth has had the support of people who lived there for years, and it now has the p support of people who are, who are just newly moving in. Um, and so uh, I hear you. Um, we have a lot of um, older housing stock in Petworth, multifamily housing stock, and we have to watch how it's being um, changed also. So uh, we stay in close contact with you. Yes, and, uh, I will. let's continue to do that so we make sure everything is happening the way it should. Thank you. Okay. Um, Aliyah Osborne. Right yes, ma'am. Good afternoon to you, Ms. Bowser and the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, sure. I'm sad to be here. Um, there you go. Yes, uh -huh. Okay. Um, I'm here to ask for individual help for, for myself and family. Um, I am just want to kind of make it short, and I don't want to exploit anyone's name, but I mean, you know, because it's just a limit, I will not go. You know, but um, when I went to the house, I've been on the waiting list since 1992, and I've been waiting um, for my home ownership voucher since 96. Okay, I did receive a letter in 2003 telling me that, um, you know, with some, along with some forms to fill out for the credit history of the persons that were going to be living with me. Okay, after I'd done all that and I returned this information back in to the person, and um, then, uh, you know, they began to act funny toward me. You know, they're very evil, unkind. They start, I start getting telephone calls and telling me to go to uh, some kind of website for a mortgage. You know, these are dangerous things. I mean, they were really rude. And I'm just going to, like, leave it like that. But I do have information here. If you're willing to look over it, um, you can read it as it is. Because I'm trying to, it was really um, written out for Mr. Uh, the Honorable well, Mr. Vincent Gray. But um, since I'm here, I don't know how far it's going to get. But I'm not asking for much. But why give a person a letter and tell me my name is at the top and I was supposed to get my voucher, I need to move. And it's really emergency why I needed to move. And inside my document, you're going to see how I live when I came to Housing Authority for help. And the only thing they could tell me is you got a roof over your head. And I just feel like this, that people out here, is, you have a choice. You know, regardless if my income is low, they turn me down, also uh, is disabled. And so just because your income is low, doesn't give them the right to want to place you where you don't want to be. Or if you're disabled, you have to go in a, uh, you know, a place that's for disability people or whatever. You know, they got a lot of programs out here for low-income families and disability, 501K. They got things that prevent all this, you know. And I think I have a right to live that where I want to live, where I'm going to be comfortable at, you know. And I'm not asking for much. The only thing I want is my voucher. I need to move. The area, every, it, it's just disgusting. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't want to put anyone out here on the line. They know who they are, what they did. And I went through some weird things with uh, the members, the staff members that work up under the officials and maybe two or three officials that were in on it. But as I'm going to say, I think that maybe some of our officials don't know the people that they bring in to work for them. And we, you know, try to get help and get to the person over top of them, and they don't want to assist us, um, or they do something wrong. And I just think they make the officials look bad. And those people that's doing that need to be removed and have somebody come in that's going to actually care about us. You know, very low. I hear money going into um, all these programs and what they do and help. But I've been on that list all these years. I've been to every program in D.C., and I have not gotten any help yet. And I okay. just think it's unfair and it's wrong. Okay. So if you want to look at my information, I can give it to you and take it from there. Because, like, again, I don't want to just put everything out Okay. There. If you have a copy, I would like I got to, copies. Oh, if you have copies, you can share it with my clerk, and I'll take a look at it. But hold okay. tight one second. Let me just hear from the entire panel. Mr. Wooten? Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Come now. Um, my name is Robert Wooten, and I have a complaint against DCHA and with Habitat concerning these programs. First of all, the government has funds, vouchers, and other resources to help very low to low income families buy a home. Yet, we low income families are treated bad and unfair. All the government do is take from us and want us out of DC. And if we luck up and get, a, and get help, they treat us different from other people who have money. We are put in condos and bad areas and in a building with someone else. We want our own home in a decent area of our choice. 
DCHA, and Habitat staff, which was with Reuben Graham, Anderson Graham from DCHA and Mr. Orlando from Habitat, he told me in order for me to get help, I had to make thirty to $40,000 a year. This to me makes no sense at all. All of these programs, all these programs, all these programs that people help people who work with these programs are not doing what the program was intended for. They are helping their families, other people they pick. And tell us that there is nothing for low income families. The government even takes our food stamps and we get 10, 12, 60 or maybe $200. Food is high. And some of us need special food due to health problems. The government takes that from us. We need to eat and live like everyone else. So please give us our vouchers or grant money so we can find our own place to live. Mainly the ones who have been on the waiting list for many years. I think it was counted. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fuller? Yes. Hello, hi. My name is Ms. India Fuller. I live in the Greenleaf Gardens Extension. I'm speaking on behalf of my deceased mother who died two years ago from cancer. I'm a 32 year old disabled woman who is trying my best to survive. Well, I want to start off by briefly stating at first I choose to speak up for my family's neglect of repairs in public housing, meaning um, I had put in a um, request for them to do some work and it took them like two years to respond in public housing and I think that's kind of unfair and I have to call the mayor command center to go over top of their head to even get them to even address the issue when by law I know that I'm not supposed to be living any old kind of way. Okay, then when I took time to humble myself and look around, I began realizing over a short thought out time, this fight is much greater and much more important than to just concentrate only on the needs of my family. I wasn't raised to be selfish nor without compassion for humanity. This fight is about the improvement and positive development of my community society which influenced our nation. We are talking about generations of mix, mixed people trying their best to make a better way with what little they have for the betterment of their families. I see generations of suppressed, depressed, stressed, and frustrated people. People who really aren't given the fair opportunities that this world offers. I see people who are miseducated or no education at all. These people have been misinformed about a whole lot of information. The lack of proper education has put them in the mental state of I can't do better or don't know how to do better. I know that public housing could be saved, redeveloped. I know that it also could be expanded with upwards levels with the luxury of mandatory washing and drives in each unit. The reason why I say that is because a lot of people that's been there for years, they, they're going to refuse to move. And I think older people that's, that's been there for years, you know, it's like if you take them from public housing, that's all they know. They would die. You know, that's what I see. Um, central air and heat needs to be in the unit. Baseboards are properly, should be properly sealed and checked to control the mice issue that's in public housing. This process should be done every six months. I know a solution could be formed like merging with department stores. When I say merging with department stores, I'm simply suggesting that the development of shopping centers with the mandatory employment of public housing residents will restore a new hope to residents. How I see it, if you live better, you will think better and should make better positive, productive choices for you and your family. By merging with these department stores and ideas, it should be a way of positively renewing the mindset along with the positive exposing the residents to a positive, productive way of better living, along with the benefit of residents earning an extra income which will contribute to their homes and communities. To displace public housing will be very heartbreaking along with traumatic to people who live there all their lives. Public housing is all they know. I would like to thank the chairperson and the city council for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I, I want to thank you all for um, coming down. We did have uh, the housing authority before us on um, on Monday and we will be carefully considering their budget. So I noted, uh, so you have some open issues remaining at your unit? Yes. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll also to talk, talk to them about where they are with uh, Greenleaf Gardens. So that's, that's helpful. So thank you all for coming down and testifying. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce Johnson Coker. 
Johanna Squires, Yarnell Artis, Helen Ortiz, Ms. Johnson Coker. Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? You may proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Joyce Johnson Coker, and I, too, bought my home through HPAP, and I am a district employee as well. But I'm here today because I want to um, just complain about um, an issue that I have with DHCD and the Single Family Rehab Loan Program. Um, I bought my home through HPAP, and it needs to, needed some, to have some work done. And my, my neighbor, Mr. Dudley, told me, suggested that I apply for the Single Family Rehab Loan Program, which I did. The work was done. My, um, I guess my loan specialist was, was Ms. Grace Cofield. Um, so when, once we went through the, through the, um, the work was done and we went through the final stages of getting the papers signed, Ms. Cofield told me that um, the loan was, um, I got a forbearance for five years before I started paying the money back. But she said that if, when the loan came due, if I had had a hard time paying the money back, to let her know, and that they would um, write a modification so that the money money would be be due once I sold my home. So five years went by, and I and I really wasn't sure when that um, the time would come for me to start paying the loan back. So being a district employee, I sent Ms. Cofield an email, which I have a copy of it here, to, in 2008. I didn't get a response. But in 2011, I sent Mr. Lindsay an email talking about my issues with the Single Family Rehab Loan Program and my ability to pay the loan back. I got no response. Later, the, later that year, I forwarded the same email to Ms. Cofield, and um, she responded and told me what I needed to do. So um, I gave Ms. Cofield my documents. I wrote a hardship letter. I gave her my tax statement, my tax statements, and my loan. Um, I mean, and my pay stubs. And Ms. Cofield rewrote my loan, modified my loan. I got a phone call from Ms. Ms. Um, Cofield telling me that to listen out for the call from the lawyers to come in and have my paper signed. That call never came. So in 2012, I sent. That's when I found Ms. Cofield had retired. Um, I sent Mr. Hill an email and asking him where my paperwork was. Well, um, all of a sudden, I got assigned to a new um, loan specialist, and that was Mr. Calvin Marshall. So we're talking about 2012 now. Okay. Calvin Marshall got my paperwork in March of 2012. Um, Around, sometime around June 2012, I got a phone call from Mr. Trent at the at DCHD, and he told me that he had my paperwork and that he was not going to approve my modification because he looked at my pay stub and I and he felt like I should be, be able to pay the loan. I asked him where was the money going to come from. I didn't have the money to pay. He didn't respond. I sent Mr. Trent an email in in, in June to have a copy of it here too, 2012, and I asked him what constitutes a hardship under DACD standards, and I wanted it in writing so I could address it. I, didn't, I never got a copy of that. I never got a, got a response to that. In November of 2012, Ms. I Coker, just... What, um, Ms. Johnson Coker, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up and okay. tell me, because you're beyond okay. your time. Now. Well, it's 2013, Ms. Um, Ms. Bowser, and I, I just actually got... Um, the, the modification process through D DHCD, and I asked for a copy of that. And, you know, I'm looking because the issue is that I, I decided to just try to get my house refinanced to pay them off just to get rid of the whole issue. And I wasn't getting the support from them that I needed, needed to do that. And okay. Is it resolved now? I, but I, I need a copy of the, I want a copy of the, of the modification, and I, I don't have that. That's the issue. Was it modified? Yes. Okay. All right. So let me let me get here from the rest of the panel, and we'll see if we can get some answers from DHCD. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Squires. Thank you, Chairwoman Bowser, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Joanna Squires, and I'm here to talk about the budget for the Department of Housing and Community Development. 
I work as a care advocate at Metro Teen AIDS where I provide risk reduction counseling and HIV focused interventions to the city's youth, particularly those living with HIV. This work takes me all over the city, though disproportionately to some of our lowest income communities. All the clients I serve, both individuals and families, seem to have a common primary concern. They have nowhere to live. I go into homes of multi-generational DC families where bedrooms, couches, and floors are full. I serve youth who pay several hundred dollars to sleep on a common floor or a couch because there are no other options and see entire families, adults and children, living in a single room. The word squalor comes to mind as I witness our housing crisis and I often wonder how living conditions came to this in our nation's capital. I regularly explore shelter options with youth, but, on, but not only is there a scarcity of beds in youth shelters, but youth often feel unsafe in the greater shelter system. Living couch to floor to couch, at the whim of the leaseholder, youth frequently engage in survival sex just to keep a roof over their head for a night. Drastically increasing the level of affordable housing is consistent with HIV, STI, and teen pregnancy prevention efforts. Youth often get a bad rap, but DC youth have a particularly tough future. Can you imagine staying in school while living in conditions like I've described? Or having any hope when your basic necessity for housing is somehow impossible? Not only do I come to voice support for increasing affordable housing for all low-income DC residents, but to ask you to think of the community we are presenting to our city's young people. Let's show them that they are worth a promise of at least a roof over their head. I tentatively support the mayor's budget, which increases resources for the Housing Production Trust Fund and the local rent supplement program. I say tentatively, for while this commitment of resources is a start, much more will be needed to address a problem that never should have progressed so far. At a minimum, I ask that you support the $100 million affordable housing initiative proposed by Mayor Gray and the $87 million for the Housing Production Trust Fund. I also ask that you increase investment in tenant-based vouchers through the local rent supplement program so additional people can be served in 2014 and beyond. By approving the, major, the mayor's proposed budget, we can begin to create affordable housing for low-income D.C. <coughs> residents. The D.C. Housing Authority has 70,000 people waiting for housing, and as a community, we need to start doing something about this. The city turned its back on the housing needs of low-income D.C. residents long ago. Please think of the stories you heard here today when deciding on this issue, and remember your low-income voters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Squires. Ms. Uh, Artis? Yes, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Yonel Artis, and I'm a resident of the Luther Place Night Shelter in Ward 2. And I'm here today representing the 25 residents there, as well as the ladies on the fifth floor recovery housing at N Street Village. There are people with disabilities who are discriminated against as far as getting a place to live, places to shop that are accessible, and transportation that serves the needs of the disabled. The elderly don't have any hope at all. There are people who don't have income and cannot pay the one dollar that it costs them or more for medication. These people are left hanging and fall through the, cra the cracks. <clears throat> Those who have been arrested or incarcerated feel hopeless. The same for small crimes as well as large. These people are left hanging as well, even after they have paid their dues for the crimes that they have committed. A landlord could use a parking ticket as a reason to not rent to a person. This doesn't mean that the person will not pay their rent or be a good tenant. Sometimes people make bad choices, but when you decide to turn your life around and do something different, you should be given an opportunity to approve yourself that you are worthy of being able to be a productive citizen of society. Here we are again, left hanging and falling through the cracks, homeless, no medication, and not being able to live properly. Then we're told that we must wait seven years or more before we can have a place to live. It is unjust, and even after seven years, we still can't get a place. I'm advocating for increased investment in tenant-based vouchers through the local rent supplement program. Using the lo local rent supplement program and the Housing Production Trust Fund together, as the mayor proposes, will create housing that is affordable to extremely low-income tenants like me. I encourage you, council members, to make sure that there are sufficient funds allocated to the local rent supplement program tenant-based vouchers so it can serve additional people now and beyond. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Artis. Ms. Ortiz? Mm -hmm. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. Mi nombre es Helen Ortiz. Represento el edificio 7611 y 7601 Georgia Avenue, Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I represent, uh, my name is Helen Ortiz, and I represent two buildings, 7611 and 7701 Georgia Avenue in Washington, D.C. Trabajo en la mesa de la directiva de la Asociación de Inquilinos. 
I work on the board of directors uh, for our tenant association. Muy buenas tardes a todos de nuevo, representante del gobierno de Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon, everybody again, representatives of Washington, D.C.'s government. Le doy las gracias por permitirnos estar aquí para llevar este mensaje tan importante para nuestra comunidad. I thank you all for allowing us to be here to bring you this message that is so important for our community. Quiero ser breve, pero quiero enfocar en el tema de vivienda. I want to be brief, but I want to focus on the topic of housing. Nuestros edificios están en venta y somos personas de bajos recursos y estamos solicitando ayuda para comprar nuestros edificios. Our, build, our buildings are for sale and we're, uh, we're people with low incomes and we're asking for help to buy our building and form a co cooperative. Y esto nos ayudará a mantener nuestra vivienda económica. Nosotros no queremos quedarnos en la calle. Uh, this will help, help us maintain affordable housing. We do not wanna, want to live in the streets. Tenemos que luchar todos, esperando que nos ayuden a nuestro representante de Washington, D.C. So we all want to fight for our housing. We hope that our representatives in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the Washington, D.C. government will help us. Somos personas que trabajamos, que luchamos, pero no tenemos dinero para comprar nuestra vivienda. We're people who work and who fight, but we do not have money to buy our own housing. Somos todos afectados. Nuestros edificios están compuestos de 92 unidades. We're all affected. Our buildings uh, include 92 units. Estamos luchando no solo para nuestro edificio, sino para toda parte de Washington, D.C. que tiene ese problema. We continue fighting not just for our buildings, but for every part of Washington, D.C. that has this problem. Queremos quedarnos en nuestra vivienda con tantos años que tenemos aquí. We want to stay in our homes with all the years that we've, we've spent here. Y este es un sector muy bueno. Está cerca de nuestro, de, no, de todas las mejores áreas. El metro de Tacoma, metro de Silver Spring, para mí, forma parte de la metrópoli. Uh, our, uh, my neighborhood is a good part of the town. It's near the metro, the Tacoma metro, near Silver Spring, and for me, it, it is part of the city. Por eso estamos apoyando que los 100 millones de, para vivienda de bajo costo y más que todo para el fideicomiso para producción de vivienda. Uh, that's why we're supporting the 100 million dollars for low cost housing and mainly for the housing production trust fund. Porque solo con el apoyo de este programa podemos comprar nuestros edificios. Because only with the support of this program we will be able to buy our building. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you and thank you Ms. Ortiz. Now we've had the chance to talk about your building before, correct? Gracias, sí, hemos tenido el tiempo de hablar con su edificio acerca de su edificio antes, correcto? Sí. Okay. Thank so, um, has any requests been made to the government yet? ¿Alguna petición se ha hecho al gobierno aún? Directamente no, solo que estamos luchando ya dos veces hemos ido sí, a testimonio. Sí, sí. Uh, directly we haven't uh, uh, submitted the application yet. We've, uh, you know, gone and advocated and we've met with uh, the city, uh, with the uh, individuals so far. Okay, so this is at Georgia and Hemlock? Uh, Georgia, Georgia Avenue. Georgia and Juniper, right? Uh -huh, Georgia and Juniper. Okay, Juniper. okay. Juniper. and so it's, it's two buildings. So yes. Two buildings, okay. So, um, have, have you found a development partner yet? Sí, ya lo tenemos. Okay. Yes, we, we do have it. And so, how soon do you think you'll be um, ready to apply for a loan? Ya estamos trabajando para eso. We are, you know, our... Uh, our representatives are working on the application right now. Okay. All right. Well, definitely keep me in the loop. Um, as you know, I like to come out to the building before um, before d everybody makes a decision, right? So that I'm sure that everybody understands the process and their rights, 
um, okay. as they move forward. So please invite me, um, and I'm going to have my staff reach out to you so we know where that's where that's going. Invite me to have a decision because I want to go and review all the people who are ready and know the process of all the inquilinos because I want to make sure that everything is okay. So my people are going to communicate with you. Okay, thank you for this invitation, and we will be in contact. Thank you for, for thank that, you. and we'll be in contact with you to invite you. Thank you. And it, it, as you can hear from a, the number of Ward 4 buildings that we talked about, and I'm, I don't think that uh, these neighborhoods are um, that dissimilar from others, uh, that the pressure is, is, is coming back um, to sell some of these buildings. Um, and we, we, are, we want to make sure the money is available for tenant purchase, but we also want to make sure that the support is there when tenants decide to purchase because we want everybody to be in a better situation at the end of it. Okay. Thank and I want to thank you all for your testimony and Ms. Uh, Coker Johnson. We, we need, Ms. Johnson Coker, excuse me, we need to um, get additional information from DH CD about what you need. Okay, and thank you. Thank you both ladies for your testimony. Okay, um, next up I have Massapol uh, Siddle. Okay, please have a seat. Thank you, Mr. Sitole. What is on this list now? Um, now, I'm told that an additional 10 people want to testify. Is that right? That it didn't sign up? You tried? How? I'm sorry? They didn't sign up? They didn't make it on the list? Okay, this is what I'm going to do in, in kind of fairness to everybody. I'm going to try to accommodate everyone. Um, we have had 42 witnesses and I still have to get to the government, so we're kind of beyond our allotted time. Um, so if you would bear with me, and I'm going to allow people to come up, but I am going to ask you to reduce your testimony. Um, so uh, and, and that's hard to do, I recognize. So you may have prepared to have three minutes. If I could ask you to deliver your, your testimony in 90 seconds, I can get to everybody. Okay? Does that sound like a plan that we can live with? Okay, thank you. Um, and so, Mr. Masupo, I'm going to have to ask you to make room next to you because other people will be joining you. Um, Anna Panana, Frederick Hill, Claudette Bathia, Ms. Pineda, okay, I need a microphone. Ms. Ms. Pineda, I'm not sure your microphone. Oh, is, for you. is, is okay, it on? Okay, that's it. Okay. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ana Margarita Pineda. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ana Margarita Pineda. Uh, soy la presidenta de la Asociación de Inquilinos del 1445 del Spring Road Northwest. I'm the president of the Tenant Association of 1445 Spring Road Northwest. Um, ed, um, hay 13 apartamentos en, en el Distrito 4. Uh, my building has 13 apartments and it's in District 4, uh, Ward 4. He vivido en este edificio con mi hija desde el 2002. I've lived in, my, in this building with my daughter since 2002. Mi hija estudia en Capital City. My daughter uh, studies in Capital City School. Y asiste a la Clínica del Pueblo. And she also attends a uh, Clínica del Pueblo. Um, yo soy miembro activa de la Iglesia El Sagrado Corazón. I'm an active member of uh, Sacred Heart uh, Church. 
y también uh, asisto al centro católico. And I also assist the Catholic Center. Estamos involucradas en esta comunidad del, cerca alrededor del edificio todo el tiempo. We're always involved in our, uh, in our community. En el edificio la mayoría somos um, salvadoreños, afroamericanos y vietnamitas. Our building is composed of Latinos, African Americans and Vietnamese. Algunos tenemos viviendo ahí por décadas. We've been living there for decades. Estamos contentos en este edificio porque nos queda accesible la, el trabajo, la escuela de nuestros hijos. We're happy here because everything is accessible. Y es cómoda la vivienda. And housing is uh, comfortable. Um, esta, en esta ocasión el edificio está puesto en venta. So our building is up for sale right now. Hoy tenemos la oportunidad de comprar nuestro edificio. And we have the opportunity to buy our building. Estamos en proceso y estamos ejerciendo nuestros derechos topa. We're exercising our topa rights right now. En el futuro esperamos que logremos hacerlo y y esperamos contar con la ciudad, con los fondos. Uh, we hope that in the future uh, we uh, are able to count with the city, uh, with the funds. Quiero agradecerles por el dinero que han puesto en este fondo. I would like to uh, thank you for the um, money that you have placed in the fund. Y les pido de que continúen apoyándolos al grupo de de inquilinos igual que nosotros para que tengamos la oportunidad de ser propietarios de nuestro propio edificio. And I ask that you continue supporting tenant groups like us so that, you know, everybody can have a chance to exercise these rights. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pineda. Gracias. Mr. Hill? Yes. Hello, my name is Frederick Hill III. I'm the former single family rehabilitation program manager at DHCD. I was recently terminated and retaliated against for raising the concern of why program vendors are not and have not ever been paid on time, and for the request of termination of a close friend of Robert Trent. Although my MSS position I held can be terminated without a cause, the collaboration which led to my dismissal is, as stated, nothing less than criminal. I have moved forward growing my business. But as a concerned resident for over two years, I've witnessed the agency CFO operate without a standard or regular method of dispersing payments to vendors through the single family rehab program, <coughs> which has led to constant late payments, some as far as five months. The contractors are afraid of retaliation like what is taking place currently with IS Enterprises. I've also requested the term position of an employee named Kimberly Rohn not be reinstated due to a large number of serious violations surrounding lack of quality in the work. In, this, in November of 2012, I discovered 20 loans that had not been sent to the recorder of deeds. I found approximately 67 loans whereby the files did not contain proof of recordation. This means that if the homes are sold, the District of Columbia and taxpayers could lose approximately $3,685,000, not including recordation taxes. I recently did not receive my pay deposited to my account due April 16th. It was the responsibility of Lamont Lee and Robert Trent to ensure the pay was input. Uh, as of today, and just checking a few moments ago, I still have not received that check. I've raised questions to Director Stokes and the staff of DCHR as to the legality of how I was dismissed uh, while on approved sick leave, which the doctor's statement was delivered and received by Lamont Lee on March 25th. But during my exit interview, Mr. Bolt from DCHR stated he never knew anything about it. Uh, Director Kelly may seem surprised when the council questioned the position on payments, however, he, as well as his supporters, have known about this problem since early November. I have emails to prove that. This is a 10-minute uh, presentation, but I've left you a copy of it. And uh, I'd look to have you take a look at this to see what it is you can do to help me 
close out my stay with DA City. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hill. I may have some additional questions, so thank hold you. tight. Um, Mr. Sitole? Sitole, yes. Sitole. Yes, hello. Um, nice to meet you. Thank um, you. You too. I'm at a cross section of issues uh, that I would like to speak to. Um, I've been in DC for about 10 years. I initially came for graduate school. Um, I'm only on the tail end of that. Um, <clears throat> currently have three papers to go to finish. Uh, I suffer from bipolarization and bipolar blessing. Uh, in 2010, I lost my apartment. Uh, I'd fallen behind in, in rent. Um, two months prior to actually being constructively evicted, I'd been hospitalized involuntarily. Um, partially, I'm, I'm still need to backtrack into that. I uh, recently, about three weeks ago, received a voucher. I received a voucher and I'm currently searching for an apartment. Uh, over the course of the years and to this day, and to this day, there continue to be issues between the agencies and how the programs are administering the waiting lists. I would like to ask you to use my situation, use my um, situation as a way to explore some of the issues that have been going on uh, with the waiting lists in particular. Um, There are inconsistencies. Some people are on waiting lists and don't have vouchers. Uh, other people have vouchers and are on the end of the waiting list. Um, I would also like to um, make an appeal for more uh, disclosure for um, uh, at-risk communities, those in the mental health community in particular. Uh, I would like to see more um, dialogue with them. They are truly the ones that have the answers and we need the, their uh, experience um, to be brought to the table to try to figure out how the budget should be spent and what things to do. I would also like to okay, see us. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to Sorry. cut you off there. Um, I'll have some questions for you. Um, Ms. Bathia? Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman Bauer, staff, and public. My name is Claudia Pathea. I'm a resident of Ward 6. First of all, I would like to thank Mayor Gray for the $100 million infusion into affordable housing. These housing programs are badly needed. All that said, it still only serves a small amount of people while the need is much greater. We have 70,000 persons on the wait list for the Housing Authority, an additional 7,000 people homeless, uncounted others couch surfing doubled up with friends and relatives wherever allowed. The Wednesday Express dated April 17, 2013, boasts that rents soar across the Washington region. What really is needed, along with the $100 million, is to force the landlords to bring the rent down. We need to bring back the rent cap, which keeps rents from rising. Do away with rent control, which allows rents to rise and has various loopholes, allowing room for abuse and manipulation. I suggest having a fair balance between the minimum wage and rent as a foundation. This would decrease the number of rent burdened people and will house more people than all of D.C. housing programs combined. I ask also that more money is put into the local rent supplement program and also into vouchers. Once again, I thank the mayor for his sensitivity in realizing we have a crisis here. With that being said, I ask that God be blessed and thank you, Councilman Bauer, staff, and public for hearing my testimony. I want to thank you all for your testimony. Now, Mr. Hill, your um, issue is that um, beyond the 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 how you were separated is that the district still owes you money. That's correct. Okay. And so we need to, and you're, you expected 
um, to receive that money by April 16th. That's correct. Okay. Most recently, uh, I was also told uh, by Mr. Trent on the 17th, actually on the 16th, uh, which was a holiday, that he was going to call me on the 17th. Um, I didn't speak to him. I called the director, Kelly, on the 19th. He told me he would call me back. I heard from neither one. I called Mr. Trent on Monday. He told me I was going to get the payment on Tuesday of this week. It still hasn't happened. Um, Director Kelly did come to talk with me today to find out had it been taken care of and was su seemed, seemed surprised that it hadn't been done. Okay. So let me let me see what I can find out here. Um, obviously, I, I, I think when the district owes you money, they have to pay. Yeah. So if it's taxes, if it's some other kind of fees, if it's um, anything result, resulting from employment or any other issues, uh, we take that very seriously. I do have a packet of information, um, and I want to thank you for sharing it today. I think I've also heard about this from um, a, a neighbor. And so there, there are a number of people in the District of Columbia who care very much that you're treated fairly. Okay, so thank you for coming thank out. You. Thank you all for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Heather Crouch, Gail Varga, John Freeland, Brian, A oh, that's four, okay. Oh, Brian Adams, is Brian Adams here? Heather Crouch. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Heather Crouch, and I work on tenant purchase projects at Mikasa Inc. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to give my testimony today. Many of the cooperatives that I work with are at critical points in their development, and many are in need of either acquisition or construction funding to move forward. Mikasa has seen many buildings in high rent areas of DC coming up for sale, providing an opportunity to preserve long term affordable housing with a one time investment of city funding and we mainly serve residents with below 30% and 50% of AMI. Um, throughout the last several years, due to the lack of funding available at DHCD, there are many opportunities to purchase that were either lost or put on hold. With restored funding for affordable housing, tenants in all wards throughout the city could see their opportunity to purchase become a reality. In addition to having funds available for tenant purchase, as critical is the timing of, ac of accessing funds in keeping with the TOPA timeline. Our newest cooperative, the 5741 Colorado Cooperative, who you'll hear from today, is located in Ward 4 and just purchased their building by exercising their TOPA rights. The members of the cooperative were extremely motivated and were able to over overcome many challenges throughout the process in order to purchase their building. Not only did they overcome the usual TOPA challenges of a difficult seller and coordinating among all the tenants, but they faced additional obstacles related to financing. At the time of the purchase, DHCD was not able to provide funding in the time frame needed under TOPA. Ultimately, we were able to get the DHCD commitment letter, but the cooperative and Mikasa needed to secure two bridge loans with community banks in order to not miss the window to purchase. Ensuring that DHCD has funds for TOPA and that the timing of these funds follow the TOPA timeline will prevent the loss of preserving hundreds of units of affordable housing in the future. In addition, we have many projects that were purchased in 2005 and 2006 um, using DHCD funds and need renovation. Um, I encourage the council to make a commitment to funding affordable housing through maintaining the $100 million commitment. Um, and we urge you to also have a steady flow of funding available for tenant purchase acquisitions in addition to the rehabilitation, since we never know when a tenant purchase project may become available. Thank you, Ms. Crouch. Ms. Varga? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Gail Varga, and I have lived at 5741 Colorado Avenue Northwest for 33 years. And I'm the secretary for the board of the 5741 Colorado Cooperative. The tenants in my building have lived through various owners 
where we have had to beg for our basic needs. I personally have been without heat for three years. These owners have only been concerned about us paying rent. Two and a half years ago, when the owner tried to sell the building out from under us, we decided enough was enough and formed a tenants association with the help of Manny Ruiz at LEDC. As the struggle progressed, we decided that moving in the direction of a cooperative was the way to go. Mikasa came on board and they have guided us, excuse me, through all the steps and paperwork to achieve our goal. As of March 15th of this year, we have purchased our building with bridge loans from City First and LISC and have a promised take from DHCD. It has been our dream that our, I'm sorry, I'm emotional, that our building would always stay affordable housing for the residents of the District of Columbia. So when, since we have purchased our building, we have hired a management company and are repairing things such as leaks and other items that cannot wait until we go to construction. We've hired an architect in order to renovate our building since it was left in major disrepair by past owners. Having control of our building and our future feels like we now have the, excuse me, life has much to offer us now. Residents should not have to take owners to court or have DCRA find them to have their basic needs met. Tenants should know that they can take the route that we did with the same outcome. Funding should be made available so that D.C. will have affordable housing available not, and not more slumlords buying buildings with no intention of maintaining or improving them. If it had not been for the determination and guidance of Mikasa, we would at this moment be stuck with yet another owner who only cares about themselves. So I'm here today to ask for money to be put excuse me, to be put in the budget so more residents will have the opportunity to achieve what we have achieved. Thank you, Ms. Vargas. You did a great job. <laughs> Mr. Vreeland. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, John Vreeland here representing the 52-unit uh, Bitewood Gardens Cooperative on Longfellow and our fair Georgia corridor. I'm here to testify about the funding for the Housing Production Trust Fund and to support the commitment to put $100 million into affordable housing. Um, I'll cut this down a bit, but I will say in, um, in 2006, when uh, gentrification was proceeding apace, gobbling up all the undercapitalized uh, dwelling units in the Georgia Avenue corridor, our building was put up for sale and the membership quickly organized and with the help of a DHCD loan, we purchased it. Uh, this was only supposed to be the first part with our inadequate, antiquated wiring dating from an era when many people were fortunate to own a radio and electric fan, it was put up by a Poland during the Second World War. Um, with our ancient pipes and our roof that was over 70 years old, we needed the rehabilitation loan, which was promised to us. Unfortunately, 2008 happened, and I don't need to tell you that story. The promised loan was not going to be forthcoming. So since then, we struggled to do what we could to survive. We performed what repair work we could do, and we, uh, we so unsurprisingly, I guess, uh, we managed to fill every single unit we had because we had been at half capacity expecting the renovation. But we're, so uh, we now have full occupancy. We uh, are operating a small profit. We have a skilled, conscientious board. Uh, we're cursed with very active membership that votes. Our uh, board members do not run unopposed, and they're always asking for more transparency and more information. In short, we have a, a vibrant, democratic community. But we're still faced with these enormous capital needs. We've got rotting plumbing, a hazardous, disturbed electrical system, and a roof held up by the bountiful power of hope. Hmm. We uh, need the additional promised funding to assist with our renovations and to assure our long-term sustainability. National Housing Trust recommended recently raising our carrying charges 50% in order to secure a 100% commercial loan. Uh, if we did that, we would no longer be affordable housing. So that's not on our agenda. So we are, for this reason, extremely supportive of the investment of $100 million for affordable housing, in particular for the $67 million for the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, furthermore, we hope that DHCD will be flexible, and they should look at the individual merits of each projected case by case basis. And finally, we at Brentwood Garden, Gardens understand that pro uh, projects will not get 100% funding, but we hope that the agency will not forget the cooperatives that were promised renovation financing 
and have been operating successfully on their own for these years. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeland. Mr. Adams? Thank you, Councilman Bowser, for the opportunity to testify before you here today. My name is Brian Adams. I am a World One resident and also a resident of Jubilee Housing. My building named the Mozart, which is located in Adams Morgan. I have been living in Mozart now for over six years since its renovation. Renovation was mostly due by the Housing Production Trust Fund uh, during that time. Um, I'm also concerned about the rental submit, local rental submit program because that, although that made my apartment affordable, although it made my apartment affordable, I'm also concerned about the vouchers, that uh, the tenant-based vouchers that is in, in the program and whether it's threatened to be cut or eliminated altogether. Um, for wealthy programs, affordable housing will be non-existent. That is why a program need to be sustained and funded. Eighty-seven of the hundred million dollars is dedicated to how to the trust fund by the mayor proposed budget plan. As uh, with that said, I'm also concerned about the waiting list at DCHA uh, on threat of being eliminated. It's, uh, so I encourage you and the council to make sure that after funds are allocated to LRSP and that the waiting list be there for those who need to apply for affordable housing at DCHA. I would like to see more people be given the same opportunity as I have received because of these programs. As a person who was once homeless, I cannot begin to tell you how much these two programs have changed my life. To have such a beautiful place to wake up in the morning, I can only thank God for you, for thank God and all of you for your support. But as we all know, more is needed. There also, there also needs to be more investment in the housing first program to help end homelessness in the district, especially people who have special needs or the chronic disabled. I encourage you and the council also to increase investment into this program. Finally, I encourage you and the council to make sure adequate funding are allocated to the housing pressures assistance program, known as HPAP, for those who are seeking to be first time home buyers and also become first time homeowners. Affordable housing is very important to me. It plays such a significant part in my life growing up here at home in the district. So once again, I urge you and the council to support this budget and provide housing for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams, and I appreciate uh, your testimony as well. So you were very specific about the local rent supplement program and the housing production trust fund because you feel like those programs really help you um, get into an affordable home? Uh, right now, if you if you could come by and see what I'm living in, I tell you right now, I'll be very proud to show you. Thank and you. Then, and then it will tell the whole life, it really has changed my life. Okay. Well, it, uh, really, it really made a difference. And I know also about the other ones, and, and me being a, a person that was once homeless, the housing first is also important to me as well. So help those that are here homeless today. Yeah, so now we, and I'm glad you brought that up because this budget doesn't really do anything for Housing First. The last two, in fact, haven't. Um, and it's been a stepping back from a program that said the way to cure homelessness in the District of Columbia is not to build shelter beds, but to provide people with a permanent supportive home. Yeah. Um, and so there are a number of proposals that w that we've heard um, that we could uh, reinvest in housing first instead mm -hmm. of disinvesting in it, which is what we've been doing the last couple of years, and really maintain our commitment. Yeah. In our city, you know, and this is going to sound, given all of the needs that we've heard today, we can't end homelessness. We can end homelessness. It is within yeah, our grasp. I believe that. It takes money. Yeah. It does. And it will take a consistent, sustained commitment to investing in it. But it is within our grasp. And the other part of that equation, of course, is preserving the affordable housing that we have. And that's why I know that Ms. Varga um, was so passionate about her story um, in her home and the steps that she and her neighbors are taking um, to maintain um, their home. So congratulations. It sounds like you've moved forward. You've just completed your purchase? Yes. Okay. March 15th. 
March 15th. Well, congratulations. Now tell me, what else do you need from DHCD? So you did they assist with acquisition financing and rehab? or um, What we got from uh, DHCD was a promise take. Already, they've made, they've given a, the commitment letter that once we have everything ready for construction financing, that they'll come in and take out the bridge loans from acquisition, and then the cooperative can actually support a construction loan on their own. Okay. So what what is DHC committed to? They're committed to doing the complete acquisition. Right now, we have bridge loans in place until the money is available, um, but they just weren't able to do it in the timeline we needed. Okay. And so, Ms. Varga, all of um. Well, uh, you've already been through the process of all of the residents uh, agreeing and understanding, and so now you're moving towards the, the process of um, the actual acquisition. Well, we've, yeah, we've purchased, and it's amazing how it's everybody different. in the building has changed. Okay, well, good. So if there's anything that we, of course, can do to be helpful, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, now, Mr. Vreeland, where's your building exactly on Longfellow? It's a 931 Longfellow, so half a block from Georgia. A half a block from Georgia. Um, and this building had, it, um, I recall being there, there was a lead paint. Were you doing a lead paint? Yes, uh, okay. we made use of the lead safe program. Okay. To the, and one of the greatest benefits of that was actually they, they had to do some rehabilitation and they put new windows in for us, which lowered our energy expenses enormously. Because the ones we had were the old casement windows in which badly cut plexiglass had been put in over the years, and everything was just a drafty winter mess. So what remains? You have an outstanding loan request with DHCD for rehab? We are um, we're apparently going to have to try to get a commercial loan and then ask them to bridge over whatever, they, whatever they're willing to offer. We still have those large capital needs that are going to have to be addressed at some point uh, in the near future. Um, if nothing else, and just to reduce the enormous, um, the enormous maintenance expenses giving us, we, we have a major flooding incident twice a month from pipes breaking in walls, just because they're, they're so old. Um, and, and we're always being scared by people telling us the roof's about to fall in. I don't know. Uh, our developers are, are telling us that. so. It hasn't happened yet, and it might not happen for another 30 years, but you never know. Uh, we don't have the money standing by to replace the roof if it does fall in. Okay. So we'd like to deal with that. And um, uh, I, I believe NHT was exaggerating about the 50%. I've done my own back-of-the-envelope calculations, and it wouldn't be that bad. But still, um, you know, even a 25% raise in carrying charges would force a lot of people out of the building. Okay. Um, if we can get a 49% loan from DHCD, that would be outstanding. But um, I need to get our uh, I need to get our development company and our legal team on board with that too. I, I haven't been getting a lot of encouragement from them. Okay, so they, are you? They didn't even tell us about this meeting. So I got. Are you working with any of the groups we've heard from today, like LEDC? LEDC told us about this meeting today. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known about it. Okay. I got you. So um, let's stay in touch so we can um, make sure that our office is, is helping in any way that we can with DHCD. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for your yeah. testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Gilma Marino. Clara Velasquez. Denise Speed. Yes, yes sir. You know, want me to read her testimony on behalf of her? Because she's legally blind. Okay. So. Welcome, Ms. Marino. Thank you. Okay, we'll hear your testimony from Mr. Adams. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, council members, for giving me this opportunity to testify today on behalf of my family and my community. My name is Gilma Marino, and for me, the local rent subbing program has a fundamental impact on my life and my community at Jubilee Housing. I am here today to support the local rental subbing program and the housing with supportive services. The local rental subbing program and supportive services, I have access through my community at Jubilee Housing have made, have been a miracle in my life. 
in my community at Jubilee Housing, it is a miracle that I have the chance to stand up with pride in my life, my family, and myself. The local rental supplement program is a bridge that helped make my dreams come true, and I have been empowered to lead my children to follow their dreams. It hurts my heart to think that others still have to experience the challenges and pain of being without a home. And I want others to experience stability provided through a place to call home, a place where they can have opportunity to pursue more for themselves. By living in this community, I have learned the importance of helping others and to be of service to other people. Because of the support I have experienced, I have learned the importance of living with kindness, humility, and compassion. I am here to show my kids and others that supports available through me, housing are very important. LRSP is a dream come true, and you as council members have the power to help many people experience a new hope. I have faith in you and ask for your continued care and support. LRSP and supportive services connect to my community at Jubilee Housing have made a lasting impact impact on my on the life of my family and me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. God bless. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Marino, and thank you, Mr. Adams. All right. Uh, Ms. Speed, is that right? Uh, That's your name? What's your name, ma'am? Clara. Oh, Ms. Velasquez. Clara Velasquez. Yes. yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, you council members, to let me testify here today. My name is Clara Velasquez. I am resident of Jubilee Housing. I have lived in Washington, D.C. for 35 years. I am here today to talk about the great result of the Housing Production Trust Fund. I ask you to support the mayor's plan to fund the trust fund so the others can have what I have. I would like to ask you to consider investment this money in places like Jubilee Housing that offer affordable housing with support, support service. Thank you to the House Production Trust Fund. My building, the Mozart, was renewed and is safe and clean place for me to live in Adams Morgan. I am close to so many things, the store, the doctors, and transportation. I can afford to live in a place that is convenient for me. As senior, I cannot work anymore and do, do, do not have much money to pay rent, just like many other seniors living here in D.C. With the economy how it is, will struggle to pay rent, but programs like the Trust Fund allow to have a place to call home. Jubilee House offer, offer me service that made me feel I belong. This has become my second home outside my country. I am able to take computer classes, English classes, can go to inside gym. I feel I have everything I need in my home. We have to pay a lot of money for so many things. Without a commitment from you to affordable housing, our children, our seniors will not be safe and will not be able to have somewhere to live. I am here because I care for everybody else in the Washington, D.C. For this reason, I really ask you not to forget about ours. You had the power to make a big difference for many people. I encourage you, you council members, to pass the 100 million proposed by the mayor in the investment to su supportable service so we can have, we cannot live without worry. Please do, do not forget ours. Thank you so very much, and God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Velasquez. I appreciate your um, testimony, and thank you all for coming down. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Is Denise Speed here? No. Okay. Audrey Jewell, Ms. Jewell, please come up. Uh, Leona Redmond.
Have I gotten to everybody? Okay. Ms. Joel, good afternoon. good afternoon. Please proceed. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Audrey Joel, and I come before you today as a resident of the Wesley House Senior Apartments to give my support and state my individual need for housing assistance program for unsubsidized seniors. The increase in our rent not only gives me concern as to whether I will be able to remain at the Wesley House Senior Apartments, but also it is a health concern for me. I work full time and I have good insurance. However, in the last year I have incurred an increased cost for medication. The additional medication has increased 60%. Even though I have medical insurance as mentioned above, the out of pocket copay is what I'm having a difficult time with. It has become a choice of which medication to purchase or should I take half of the prescribed amount. I am not the only resident at Wesley House Senior Apartments with this dilemma. We either go without enough food or medication. HAPAS would greatly assist me and other residents in affording their rent. Without this assistance, many of us will not be able to continue to live at the Wesley House Senior Apartments or in the District of Columbia. I thank you for your consideration in granting of the Housing Assistance Program for unsubsidized seniors for myself and other seniors throughout the city. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jewell. We're trying to hape us. Which program is that? <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you going to speak Good to afternoon. Okay. All right, yes. Ms. Redman, I recognize Good, you. Uh, Thank Good you. afternoon, um, uh, Chairman Bowser. Um, I'm going to try to stick within the, that 90 seconds, but this is very broad. Uh, my name is Leona Redman, and I live in um, Fort Lincoln, uh, Washington, D.C. What is HAPUS? HAPUS is the proposed housing assistance program for unsubsidized seniors. This subsidy program is being sought to help sen senior citizens throughout the city who are threatened with displacement because their fixed incomes are not keeping pace with their housing uh, costs. If you would, uh, just in the interest of the time of your schedule, Madam Chairperson, you were not chair of this committee back on October 11th when I uh, sent a letter to the mayor with copies to uh, the chairman of this committee. And, and if, if you will um, not take this as a disrespect, but as a point of information for you, I would like to go to the document and just pull out a, a couple of, of uh, statements. Uh, Mayor Gray, you have many seniors in this city that are in serious trouble because their fixed incomes do not afford them the opportunity or ability to pay their rent and in some cases their condo assessment fees and still have money left to purchase medication that was once covered by insurance but is now over the counter or doctor prescribed foods to enhance their, enhance their health. There is something fundamentally wrong here. Recognizing that many seniors do not have this problem, far too many do. We call the increase in housing costs that are not met by an increase in income, upside down incomes. We are appealing to you, Ms. Bowser, Chairman Bowser, to allocate $5 million of the FY12 surplus to establish a housing assistance program for unsubsidized seniors effective October 1st. 2012. Uh, trying to stick with your time frame, I can. Uh, you know, I can remember a time in the city's history when the welfare of seniors was a top priority. Now it seems as if not many people care outside of the Office on Aging and DHS, and it is more than a shame. It's a blemish on the on the city's moral character. This is the city where anyone can come from anywhere in the world and find refuge in the city's shelter system and live a good life year after year. Yet, the people who made all of that possible are being left behind in the cold. During the FY13 budget hearings, we presented testimony to the city council seeking rent supplements for residents uh, of the Wesley House Senior Apartments who were being priced out of their homes. Okay. Our needs took a back seat to other special interests. 
Even though the local rent supplement budget was increased by the council, there was no rental assistance given to the seniors. This was a great disappointment to the seniors that had appealed by way of a petition directly to the mayor and to the council. Um, I'm trying to do what you said do, Madam Chair. Let, let me ask you, because I'm intrigued by what you're saying. So yes, your, your um, HAPIS, yes, and this is your proposal, right? This is a proposed program to the city. For, okay, got it. And it would say that if a senior, I guess, of, of a certain limited income. Yes, ma'am. If uh, that senior's housing costs were more than 35% of their income. Yes, ma'am. Then there would be some kind of payment to get that senior's housing cost yes, below 35% of their yes, income. Yes, ma'am. I got it. It would operate pretty much like the LS. Uh, our people, but uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to tell you, we, we've been working on this problem for a, a couple of years now, and existing existing programs don't don't seem to want it. Uh, they don't seem to want it. And let we, me ask you this, Ms. Redman, what would be the upper income on, on this program? Forty percent of median, okay. which would be right uh, between 34 and 35. So in your proposal, the unsubsidized means that these seniors don't qualify for any other program? Well, actually what it means is that they, they do qualify, but the, the, uh, the existing senior housing developments have waiting lists that will go from here down to the capital. Right. And the, um, um, we also think that this needs to, to be taken a look at, but we'll provide you something further on, later on. The new developments for seniors uh, that use the tax credits, low-income housing tax credits, whether it's 4 percent or 9 percent, even though it says that it's for low-income housing, it's not, it's not low income. If, if I think that we need to take a look at the demographics of the district senior population and see what low income means uh, when compared to what their actual incomes are, as opposed to using the regional approach to that, because a lot of seniors' incomes do not, they don't, they don't exceed $26,000, a lot of them, and some of them are below 18000 And so when you say, quote, affordable housing development or affordable housing finance, that doesn't necessarily fit the needs of a whole lot of people, Ms. Bowser, a okay. lot of people. And what's happening in our building and what made us take this citywide was last year the, uh, some council members told us that they couldn't do a rent supplement just for our building. And so we looked at it. We didn't realize just how, how huge this problem is. But uh, at our building, if you went online to dchousingsearch.org, you, you would see our property and you would see that uh, the minimum income to move into our building is $18,000. Well, the person who moves in $18,000, 30% of that income is $600 a month, but the rent on a one-bedroom apartment is eight seventy-five. dollars and, and 901. So that's, that's a huge discrepancy there. And literally, we, what we've been able to see the last few weeks, we were surprised that this program wasn't in the budget. So when we found out it wasn't in the budget, we just reached out across the city. And we are amazed at the, at the level of need for seniors, Ms. Bowser. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have, some, we have something else that we're going to give you at a later date to help just really show you just how bad that problem is. But if a person's income will only afford $600 in a tax credit property, right. uh, but the rent is $850, there's something wrong there. Okay. And the other thing about this program is we, uh, we know that uh, we feel in our hearts we're going to do everything that we need to do to show you, to demonstrate I feel in my to you. heart you're going to do that, too. Uh, but that. Uh, uh, what, we don't, <laughs> what we don't want to happen, we don't want, to get the, we don't want this program to get muckety-mucked up. In some, we want it to be a freestanding program. We're going to be proposing to Council Member Barry, we don't know what's going to happen, that the office on aging becomes a department on aging. And if it becomes a department on aging, we would like to see HAPUS administered by the Department on Aging. Well, I, 
I don't, I don't know that I have an opinion on where it well, sits. Okay. It probably okay, is it, best situated. And I'm not just saying this because I oversee housing. I know. I know. I wouldn't do that. Okay. But it, it, it would be a housing program. Yes, ma'am. Um, and, frankly, the local rent supplement program, if that's analogous, I'll read it more to see if it's analogous, is administered by the housing authority. It is. Um, so let me, let me think on this because you may not know this, but I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we can make um, housing for seniors more affordable. Thank We've you. examined tax policies that have been passed through the council but not funded. We looked at Schedule H that's passed through the council but hasn't been funded. We look at all of the properties where the district is involved. I spent a long time earlier talking to the Deputy yes. Mayor for Economic Development about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And if the district is going to sell its land, then we have to get some ha some things that we need, like affordable housing. Um, and affordable housing for seniors um, is, is very important as well. Um, and Ms. Redmond, you put a, a point on it. A society that doesn't take care of its seniors is you know, not a society that I don't think, it's not one I want to live in. Um, so we have to figure it out. Just like I said about homeless, where we have 1,800 chronically homeless people that are living on the streets in the district. Yes, ma'am. That's solvable. We yes, have, you know, 100,000 seniors. Um, yes, ma'am. Every income yes, in the district. Um, so we want to be able to figure these things out. So I think that you have a, a very discreet um, and feasible proposal, um, and we, I'm I'm going to ask my uh, committee to see if we can cost it out because that's something that we can ask the Office of Tax and Revenue to do. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I, I can't make any promises for this budget, but what I can promise is we're going to see if we can cost it out. And I don't know if that's been done by the committee before. No, the the, co the it was never costed out. Okay. But, uh, but um, I I do think that the what the committee uh, would have done is that uh, the hundred million dollars that the mayor has appropriated for the housing production trust fund very easily uh, are very w what we believe, but it's up to the council is that $5 million can be carved out of that. Okay. And $95 million left is still a lot of money. Yes. And that it can begin to address some very serious issues in the senior community. Right now, as we go about uh, looking at it from a broader view, if you will, but the people who are in place right now spending all of their, most of their money in rent and not being able to take care of other quality of life issues. No, I, I recognize that. And this is a question that's come up, um, as you might imagine, uh, oh, since the, the proposal came over to us. Um, there's actually $87 million that's dedicated to the Housing Production Trust Fund over two fiscal years. And the, the ma remaining $13 million in other services to support housing needs. Mm -hmm. um, and how much, if it's at all possible, to move that $87 million around in different buckets? We're going to address that um, with the director. <clears throat> and the actually, the deputy mayor, I believe, has been tasked by the mayor to, to have a strategy of mm -hmm. how to make um, the, the investments. So, yes, there is money. Yes, we're going to figure out if there are certain buckets. Um, and even as I look at it, they have um, the local rent supplement money that they did include in the budget. They put some other parameters around it. For example, housing um, priority one homeless. Uh, we heard testimony earlier today. And, the, and the, uh, Madam Chair, I just want to say to you that I live at the Wesley House, but before I went to the Wesley House, I had a series of many strokes that I didn't have income for four years. I actually was a resident at CCNV Shelter for 18 months. Yes, ma'am. And, and so when you see me with this on, you know, Bob knows that I'm going to work very hard to try to get this program put in place because there were a lot of seniors in the shelter, too. And yes. there are a lot of seniors in the shelter. Yes. But uh, uh, I, I, if there's any way to get back, to work when I was in the shelter, there was a 10-year plan to eliminate homelessness. Yes. I think we got off of that, but if we could get back on that track, I think that we can eliminate homelessness in 10 years going forward or less. Well, I believe if um, 
if we do it, you you are going to help us do it. Yes, ma'am. I, I stand ready. Uh, we're ready. The, we're seniors yes. ready to get this done for ourselves because nobody else is doing it for us. But we thought that if we came to the council once again, that we would find the uh, the interest and compassion there to allow us to work with you to do something to help us. Ms. Redman, can you uh, give us a couple of days to kind of go over this at the yes, committee? And then I'm going to uh, I have your contact information here. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to want to reach out to you to see um, me or one of my staff and have a longer conversation with you uh, after we have some, some time to go over with the director and see what our possibilities are. But um, I'm going to ask, because this, we've done this with other senior programs, we can estimate, just looking at tax records, or mm -hmm. tax office can, how many seniors fall into that category of 40% of the median income. Mm -hmm. um, and we, they may be to make some estimates from there about who would need to tap into a program like this. Yes, ma'am. And so let's, let's see if we can get, if we can put a dollar figure on it, then we know what we're working with. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, Bert, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. You give us great hope, and we're ready to help. Uh, we'll roll up our sleeves thank right you, away. Ms. Thank you, Ms. Redmond. Thank okay. you for thank your you. testimony. Thank you. So next we're going to hear from the government, and uh, the government is represented by uh, Director Michael Kelly, and we're going to start in five minutes. Thank you.
I'm Uriel Bowser, and I'm resuming uh, this hearing, this budget hearing for the Department of Housing and Community Development is 445. Uh, we've heard this morning um, from uh, about 55 witnesses about housing in the District of Columbia and the budget for the Department of Housing um, and Community Development. It's now uh, the committee's opportunity to hear from the government and um, I would like to recognize Director Michael Kelly uh, and for him to introduce his staff. And Mr. Kelly, we have your statement and we'll take your testimony. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon. And to the members of the Committee of Economic Development, to Council Members Bonds, Orange, Evans, and McDuffie, and to the committee staff, I'd like to use this opportunity to recognize the, the incredible work of Robert Hawkins and Judah Gluckman in working with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michael Kelly. I'm the director of the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm joined this afternoon by Andre Chanman, the agency's fiscal officer, uh, Nathan Sims, the chief program officer, and Robert Tripp, the agency's chief administrative officer. I'm pleased to testify before you today on Mayor Vincent Gray's fiscal year 2014 proposed budget for the department. But before proceeding, I'd like to really take this opportunity to recognize and thank all of the hardworking staff at the Department of Housing and Community Development. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget submission focuses on three priorities, growing and diversifying the economy, educating our children and preparing our workforce for the new economy, and improving the quality of life for all of our residents. The Department of Housing and Community Development plays an important role of all of these priorities. Chairman, as you well know, the, the DHCD's mission is to create and preserve opportunities for affordable housing with economic development activities that revitalize underserved communities throughout the District of Columbia. The Department's strategic objectives include preserving and increasing the supply of quality affordable housing, increasing home ownership opportunities, and revitalizing neighborhoods by, prom by promoting community development and providing economic opportunities. DHCD strives to fulfill our mission through the efficient administration of our housing regulation, such as rent control and inclusionary zoning, and through its management of programs such as development finance, single family residential rehabilitation, home purchase assistance, lead hazard abatement, and small business technical assistance. DHC joins the mayor in requesting approval of the proposed DHCD operating budget for fiscal year 2014. DHCD's proposed FY 2014 budget is $167.7 million, a net increase of $41.9 million, or a 33% increase over the approved fiscal year 2013 budget of $125.2 million. This net increase in DHCD's overall FY 2014 budget is mainly due to Mayor Gray's commitment to affordable housing in the form of $37.8 million in local funds added to the Housing Production Trust Fund, an increase in special purpose revenue of $3.1 million, and an increase of $2.6 million in federal grant carryover. DHCD's full-time equivalent positions will increase by 13 full-time equivalent positions from 146.5 in 2013 to 159 for fiscal year 2014. The increase in FTEs can be attributed to the need for additional staffing to implement the Mayor's Affordable Housing Initiative and to support agency operations for local and federal objectives. The Mayor has also recommended an increase in salaries that will be absorbed in the Department's baseline budget. From an operational standpoint, DHCD's budget is comprised of several revenue sources. There's local funds, there's federal entitlement grants, there's special purpose revenue, and intra-district funds. Approximately 24.3% of DHCD's budget is from federal entitlement grants, and 63.3% is from intra-district sources, which includes the Housing Production Trust Fund. The balance of the revenue, approximately 12.3%, comes from local and special revenue funds. The majority of DHCD's proposed budget requests will be used to support seven fundamental program areas. The development finance, the residential and community services, our property acquisition and disposition, our portfolio and asset management, our program monitoring, the Housing Regulation Administration, and the Rental Housing Commission. These programs comprise 89.89% of the budget, and the remaining 11% supports agency management and agency financial operations. 
In support of Mayor Gray's priorities to improve the quality of life for all of our residents, there are several DHC activities in the fiscal year 2014 budget that I'd like to highlight. Again, as you well know, under the Mayor's uh, new affordable housing initiative, uh, committing $100 million for affordable housing, 86.9 will be allocated to the Housing Production Trust Fund, which is administered by the DHCD. Under the 2013 supplemental request, 66.9 will be made available to DHCD for fiscal year 2013, and an additional 20.9 for fiscal year 2014. The Mayor has provided guidance on how these funds will be utilized. The new Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board, whose nominees are before the Council for consideration as submitted by the Mayor, will assist DHCD in addressing the recommendations raised in the Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force Report, Bridges to Opportunities, which was issued in March of 2013. One of the Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force recommendations is to conduct a housing needs assessment to help target these resources for the best outcomes. The, department, uh, the Deputy Mayor's Office will be leading this component. Our objectives will be to research the best practices across the country that will leverage these resources while targeting expenditures needed to maximize DHCD's contributions to the creation of 10,000 affordable units by the year 2020. DHCD will work diligently to commit its additional affordable housing development funds and to ensure that development projects are completed. The projected time frame of expending these funds is two to three years for funding commitment through our traditional competitive notice of funding availability process and three to five years to complete the construction and to achieve full occupancy. This timeline takes into account an average of about six to nine months of post-award to closing on all financing, and 18 to 20 months to complete the construction, and two to four months for full occupancy. The Fiscal Year 2014 Budget Request Act and the Fiscal Year 2014 Budget Support Act recommend that the portion of the Housing Production Trust Funds that had been statutorily allocated to the D.C. Housing Authority administer local rent supplement program will be dedicated to the Housing Protection Trust Fund for the production of affordable housing initiatives on a recurring basis. In, F in FY 2013, approximately $20 million is allocated to th the Housing Authority for the local rent subsidy program, which now DHCD will allocate toward its affordable housing programs in 14. The Department of Housing and Community Development's Housing Protection Trust Fund program in 2014, in fiscal year 2014, will include the projected expenditures of dedicated tax recordation and transfer taxes and interest to be used for the new community's bond payment, project delivery through the annual notice of funding availability, uh, present year obligations, and administrative costs totaling $64.8 million. The Housing Protection Trust Fund budget also provides budget authority for the Mayor's housing initiative using local funds totaling $37.8 million. These funds will be used primarily as follows. $20 million for affordable housing, $1 million for the Housing uh, Purchase Assistance Program consistent with the recommendations from the Housing Task Force, carryover budget, and associated administrative costs. The total FY 2014 Housing Production Trust Fund Budget Authority request is $102.6 million. In FY 2014, DHCD will dedicate funds to enhance residential housing services to improve the preservation and sustainability of the city's existing residential housing stock. DHCD proposes $6.9 million in new funds for the Single Family Residential Rehab Program, which will anticipate providing 75 grants or loans, and $7.6 million in new funds for the Lead Safe Washington Program to assist approximately 200 uh, units at an average cost of $25,000 per unit. Both of these programs have been very successful in serving low to moderate income families and seniors. The increase in the funding of the single family rehab program is essentially uh, giving the growth of the aging population of our existing residents, as we've heard this afternoon, Madam Chairman, and the unique opportunity to provide seniors with the ability to age in place. The increase in funding to the Lead Safe Washington program will allow a far deeper reach to single family homeowners multi-family developers and renters in the remediation of lead hazards and the greater promotion of healthy homes. Given the age of many residential structures in the district and the potential of lead-based paint in these structures, we see this increase in funding as a huge step to a healthier Washington, D.C. Another goal for fiscal year 2014 is to improve the marketing of, our, of all of our programs, particularly the neighborhood-based programs, which consist of housing counseling services, facade improvements, 
and small business technical assistance, as well as the Home Purchase Assistance Program, the Single Family Rehabilitation Program, and the Lead Safe Program. These are the community development initiatives that touch individuals and families in the ways that improve their lives and the quality of their lives in the district's growing and increasingly diversified economy. DHCD will continue its unwavering commitment to advance home ownership rate in the district. Our home buyer assistance programs, which enable purchasers to meet the down payment and closing cost requirements of owning a home, will continue in full force. With improved market conditions, DHCD's housing counseling programs and the home purchase assistance program will help families and individuals meet stronger lender underwriting requirements along with up to $44,000 in assistance as a second trust. In FY 2014, the budget for HPAP is $643,000 less than the FY 2013 approved budget. However, the FY 2014 allocation set aside for implementation of the Mayor's housing initiatives also includes $1 million for HPAP. Thus, the net increase for HPAP for 2014 will result in an additional $357,000 for HPAP programs over the 2013 budgeted amount. DHCD anticipates that the Mayor's additional enhancements to HPAP programs for 2014 will be fully absorbed. The agency funds the Employer Assisted Housing Program, which provides up to $11,500 to D.C. government employees who are first-time homebuyers in the district. DHCD also funds the Negotiated Employee Assistance Home Purchase Program that provides up to $26,500 uh, 26, to eligible union employees. Finally, the Home Purchase Rehabilitation Pilot Program allows HPAP buyers to purchase homes that require limited repairs when financing with an FHA 203K Streamline Rehabilitation Loan. To support home ownership, our current development finance pipeline addresses the supply side of the demand for home ownership. The pipeline contains 21 affordable home ownership developments that will create 472 units to serve a broad income base between, between 30 and 80 percent of the area median income. In fiscal year 2012, DHCD awarded $28 million for development projects. Currently, DHCD pipeline consists of 39 projects. 19 of the 39 projects are substantial rehabilitation of existing units that currently support low and moderate income families. Over the next 18 to 30 months, these 39 projects will produce 740 rental units including 20 single room occupancy units, and 98% of these units will serve low and moderate income families. Construction was recently completed on Roundtree Residence along Alabama Avenue, southeast of Ward H, which provides 91 rental units for senior citizens. We also closed on Severna 2 project, which will create 103 units of affordable housing in Ward 6. The current Notice of Funding Availability announces DHCD's competitive funding for fiscal year 2014 totaling $38 million, which includes $1.7 million in 9% low-income housing tax credits. This NOFA also introduces a special initiative to address the housing needs of the homeless. Several district agencies, including the Department of Mental Health, the Housing Authority, the Housing Finance Agency, uh, and DHS, have entered into a memorandum of understanding to work together towards the creation of 100 new permanent supportive housing units. The impact of this MOU is that developers will be able to make single application for all the resources necessary for permanent supportive housing. This includes the capital funding resources of DHCD, uh, DMH, and HFA. That's the Housing and Community Development, the Department of Mental Health, and the Housing Finance Agency. The operating sub subsidies of the Housing Authority, that is federal vouchers, low rent supplement program vouchers, and public housing operating vouchers will be included in this, as well as the supportive services for the Department of Human Services. Consolidating the application process helps to ensure that projects built will provide the support these families need to regain self-sufficiency. The inclusionary zoning program is another tool used to assist in the production of affordable units in the, in the neighborhoods where rents and home prices are most challenging for low and moderate income families. There are 1,000 inclusionary units currently in the pipeline and 27 inclusionary units have been produced to date of which 21 are rental and 6 are home ownerships. The first 7 rental inclusionary zoning units have now been leased and we are expecting additional inclusionary rent, uh, units to be leased shortly. DHCD has been working with the Deputy Mayor's Office, the Department of Community and Regulatory Affairs, and the Office of the Attorney General, 
and the Office of Planning to revise the administrative regulations to more efficiently operate the program, particularly with respect to the selection of eligible households. DHCD is seeking creative ways to address the issues to preserve and develop new affordable housing in light of the city's growing population and gentrifying issues. Our strategy is to focus the activities of the Property Acquisition and, and Disposition Division, which we call PAD, on concentrating neighborhood development, development along major transportation corridors, and incorporating sustainability into our revitalization strategies. To this extent, DHCD has forged a relationship with the District's Department of General Services to redevelop district-owned land for affordable housing. Our joint demonstration project is for a property on Spring Street, Northwest Ward 4, which is an abandoned nursing home for which we are planning to release a joint solicitation to create affordable housing later this fiscal year. DHCD is looking forward to expand our relationships with DGS to find ways to work with uh, the DC regulatory agency on extensive blighted property list. DHCD is also exploring public-private partnerships that will bring new private financing resources to facilitate these affordable housing initiatives. DHCD has made a commitment to be a catalyst for the rebirth of the Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue Good Hope Road corridor in Ward 8, the historic Anacostia area, to bring back basic retail services for residents. DHC owns several properties and proposes to work closely with other vacant property owners along the corridor to eliminate blight and to collaborate with the community to revitalize historic Anacostia. Of note, a new classy consignment shop just opened last week there, and the Anacostia Playhouse re relocated from downtown to historic Anacostia to support our, our, our facade approval program. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, I would like to bring to your attention um, the upcoming fifth annual DC Housing Expo, which DHCD hosts every year in partnership with the Greater Washington Herbal League to showcase the myriad of housing resources available to district residents. This event is to be held on Saturday, June 1st, 2013 at the Washington Convention Center from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. It will offer a host of services including but not limited to an opportunity to obtain free credit reports and to consult with a credit counselor. In addition, there will be workshops on home, on home ownership, home repair, housing resources for seniors and developers showcasing affordable units that are coming online in the near future. A new feature this year is a focus on financial readiness for our youth using video games and hands-on household budgeting simulation devices. Lastly, DHCD will, for the first time, hold a lottery for the opportunity to purchase two homes to low-income families at one half of their appraised value. Anyone interested in the home lottery should call 442 7200 or go to our DHCD website, that's dhcd.dc.gov, for information on how to register. The deadline for the lottery registration is Tuesday, April 30th. I would like to thank you, Chairman Bowser, for your leadership in all of the issues. I look forward to continuing to work with you in, uh, in, in addressing some of the challenges that were presented this afternoon and uh, for allowing us to present our budget. As you know, our goal is to expand housing opportunities to meet the diverse needs of our growing population thereby improving the quality of life for all of our residents across incomes and family circumstances. I've submitted this testimony in writing, and my staff and I are now available to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, uh, Director Kelly. Um, so let, let me just understand, we've got a, quite a lot of testimony today on the um, on HPAP. And your testimony is that there's no real change? There's a slight increase. There's a $350,000 or so increase in the budget amount from last year. Um, now, there was $2 million in the budget from last year, 0.5. And now there's how much? Okay. So the current budget um, that is reflected in the HPAP program line is currently at 12 $12.7 million. In 2013, it was at 13.3, or rounded up to 13.4 million. The difference is that there's an extra million dollars that is come through from the mayor's initiative that is not yet reflected in the HPAP program line. That was loaded in the affordable housing line to be reallocated um, in accordance with the mayor's initiative. Um, and that what would be housing, What line is that that you're referring to? That currently would be loaded in the 2020, 2010 
program, affordable housing, the DFD. That is where the new um, influx of the mayor's initiative for housing production trust fund um, affordable housing initiative was initially loaded to then be reallocated to the various <coughs> line item initiatives of which a million dollars is de designated for HPAP. So when that million dollars is reallocated from 2010 to 3030, the HPAP program, that budget will now increase from 12.7 in 2014 to 13.7, giving it a net increase of 300, approximately 350,000 as the director spoke. <coughs> what else is coming out of uh, 2010? Um, in the 2010 budget, you also have the additional $19 million for the affordable housing initiative there. So minus $19 million, minus $1 million, that's it? Um, and I think the program, um, that, uh, there are, that's it for now because um, the reallocations occurred um, to the lead and the single family from other, from other um, reallocations within the agency. So what else does 2010 um, fund? That's primarily their project delivery for the development finance program, the affordable housing dollars that go into 2010 for their NOFA and their current uh, construction costs. But not costs. Housing Production Trust Fund. That is funded partially with Housing Production that Trust Fund. That is funded by yes. Housing Production Trust Fund. As well as federal grant yeah. funds. It's multi-funded and most of the programs are multi-funded from all of the sources. Okay, so all of the testimony that we got was wrong. The people were misinformed. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think when you just look at the budget book, which is what the public has um, to offer, what they don't see is the additional million dollars from the mayor's initiative because that detail was not part of the initial um, publishing of the budget book. Okay. So it should have, it probably would have been more clear to have it loaded appropriately in the first place. Yes, however, when we first received the information, it came in as affordable housing, and then um, we're now seeing that, that there's that additional million dollars that is being dedicated okay, to Okay, so you part. don't see that coming over as some kind of a, a, in an errata, but later as a reprogramming? It's actually within the current baseline of the $167 million and $20.9 million was physically loaded in the affordable housing line of which a million dollars is for HPAP. Now, let's talk a little bit more um, directly about the, the Housing Production Trust Fund. So I'm looking at a chart, the AFO. I was given, I guess, by – tell me your name again, ma'am. Um, hello. I'm Andre Chen, ma'am, the agency fiscal officer. Andre. Yes, with two E's. Okay. <coughs> Chan Mandy. Chan Man, C H A N hyphen M A N N. Got it. Forgive me, because I do know no. that. Okay, so I think that you provided us this this chart that yes. talks about the um, housing production trust fund um, in the the various um, lines that make up the various lines that make up this hundred million dollars. So. Um, Director Kelly, tell us how the government is going to approach or if there's any different approach to the expenditure of the Housing Production Trust Fund monies. Well, we'll be using the bulk of it will go through our existing development finance de uh, department, which uses a notice of funding availability to let developers, both prof for profit and non profit, know that there's government dollars available for them to um, support gap financing for. Uh, development deals that would include affordable housing. Uh, it would also include funding from uh, the federal resources such as CDBG and HOME as well as, as the 9% uh, the tax credits. So the bulk of it, will, I, I anticipate, uh, will go through that as a, as a funding source. Okay, so you do this NOFA once a year? Correct. 
So the monies that we make available in 13, when will they be out on the street? We, uh, we well, with council approval, we hope to be able to use those funds later this summer. For, for all, this current NOFA? For, those, for this current NOFA. For all those projects, that are the, calling them the AAA projects, the one that, that uh, meet threshold and, and meet the, the mandates and mission of the district, we'll be able to tap into those funds immediately. Now, the... Um, the testimony I heard earlier about your independent review process, what is that? It's been a practice here that's, uh, that, in, that allows for some uh, outside uh, resource and consultation to see if the underwriting uh, that we've done internally meets um, um, industry standards and real estate standards. It's a practice that I think that we, I'd like to continue. For so you, you have an outside consultant that reviews all of the NOFA applicants? Well, uh, both. This is a little unusual this year. We've revised our underwriting criteria, and we've kind of gone out of our, our way to do workshops and to work with our, our partners to let them know what the new requirements are. Um, we, will, we have um, some HUD technical assistants, and they've been really helpful in both uh, developing these new underwriting requirements and will be available to sort of be with us as we're reviewing these projects. So that, that's, the, that's the, the, the consultant side of it. Uh, we will continue to use um, this kind of independent that, that Craig Pascal talked about, this independent review panel on top of those guys to ensure that, that uh, there is uh, again, real, uh, proper real estate standards. So when you say independent, they're independent from what? From our, they're not staff people. Okay, but you hire them. Oh, you you appoint them. Yeah, yeah. Just as request yeah. is a better word for it. They volunteer essentially. I mean, we we put them together. Request, yes, yes, yes ma'am. So they're not really independent from you. They, no, they're independent in terms of their level of this. Uh, they come back with their own set of comments. They come back with their own set of, of scoring. Uh, at the final piece, uh, when uh, DATD and other pertinent agencies sit, sit around to make a decision, um, that does factor into the conversation. Okay, so tell me what the consultant does again. The consultant has already been working with us to revise our existing underwriting criteria. So they're already on board. But what were they doing before? Oh, they, weren't, they didn't exist. You didn't have a consultant yeah. before. This was right? actually, uh, frankly, part of the district's problems that we had with the administration of our home program and other federal programs. Uh, the, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development provided technical assistance to us and other agencies across the country to provide uh, experts from around the country to assist us in, in our basic um, uh, administration of the programs. Uh, one of the things that we, they were tasked uh, to do is to look at how we underwrite and evaluate the projects that come into our, our program. Okay. And so they've already helped us in terms of establishing a revised underwriting standard. They are also available and will be available to assist us as we're reviewing them this summer. Who is the consultant? It, uh, it's the uh, Run Through Enterprise Foundation. Okay. And so once you get the applicants, they're going to help you score them, or this, they're going to advise the staff. And this, you have a panel that reviews them among your staff? Absolutely. What are your, um, generally speaking, your criteria for picking a project? Is there a geographic consideration? Uh, depending on the funding source, yes. We do have, as part of our consolidated plan, award five, seven, and eight uh, priority. Although, um, again, it, that's, that's, that's something that for local dollars, it's, it's really the priority is, is uh, more mission driven about what projects provide the, be the best bang for the buck in terms of the providing the most housing resources for whatever neighborhood the developer is responding to. Part of the listing of, of um, activities that become threshold, and we're trying to do the best job we can right now to educate our partners to don't, that they have to come in with these things done or their proposals will not be uh, consider things like site control, um, zoning uh, clearances, um, sort of a review of the regulatory eligibility for the various funding sources like CDBG or HOME, uh, the development team's capacity and their experience in those types of things, that, they, that the development team is in good standing, that there's credit worthiness, that there's a, a plan to deal with green building um, uh, requirements, architectural reviews, appraisals, sort of the phase one environmentals, and um, 
and, and just the completeness of their application. These are sort of tr uh, fundamental requirements. And then what goes beyond that, which is in our notice of funding availability, which is on the street right now, is a clear uh, and objective um, set of criteria that follow this. This is the things I just mentioned, Madam Chairman, are required just to get the projects through the door. After they've gotten through the door, then there's another set of requirements that we listed that we list in our notice of funding availability that actually uh, gives points to how people have responded. So there is an objective uh, system that we actually tell folks on the front end what it is to uh, that they will be su successful, and the the independent evaluators as well as our own team will be looking at those pre-established indices as uh, how we should rank these proposals. Now, you, this um, Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board, when was the last time it met? It's been a while. This is something that we've... Tr it's we, been more than how long? Jeez, did anybody know? Do you guys know? It's been a while. Does anybody know? Two years as a guess. It hasn't met in two years. Why? I can't really answer that, Madam Chair. Okay. This is, all right. So we have, so are you committed to staffing and convening that board? You're the staff, right? Yes. You are committed well, to it? Yes. Are there any existing board members? Uh, exist I know that we have uh, some nominees that came over, but are are there any existing board members or they have expired terms? I, I think at this point the terms have expired. I think it's safe to say that these are fresh. These are, even though they're, they're people we all know, their applications are fresh to the, to the process. Well, I would be interested to know what happened with this board such so that it won't happen to it again. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think mean, there's nobody at the, the, the department now. I can, I can research it for you. Okay. But I think the uh, almost embedded in the exercise, though, is a commitment to regularly reporting to your committee, as well as to you know the the public at large about okay. how the how the housing protection trust fund funds are being allocated. So this um, housing projection, this board, this advisory to you. How do you how do you um, plan to lean on the board? Well, um, looking to. Um, Actually, after after meeting and getting organized, um, to uh, set a set a calendar of regular meeting dates, probably quarterly, and to uh, run by major policy issues with them right off the bat, to see what what input that they would be uh, using. It's not only for DHCD's benefit. Obviously, it's with working closely with DEMPED. Um, for example, we have this uh, study that's being uh, procured to do uh, housing needs analysis. For example. This would be something that we'd, we would like to um, engage the Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board uh, for their input in, as well as other, as other uh, recommendations that have come out of the, housing, uh, the Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force. Now, what, is, what exactly is that housing needs assessment? And we, we noticed it in uh, the DEMPED budget uh, with an allocation of $100,000. There's a procurement right now to look at getting some um, professional assistance in identifying, um, you know, throughout the city what the needs are per income strata as well as per other uh, demographic strata. Isn't that what the housing the housing task force did? Not to the level of detail that's being anticipated right now. So there's a scope out now. There is. It's on the street. Okay. Right now. And for and when is it going to be complete? I need to, to check. Okay. So it, it'll, be, it'll be the summer. It'll be before this. Okay. So the investments that we're going to let um, to go in the production trust fund for 13, do they await this needs assessment? No. We will be looking to, again, those projects that come in in response to this notice of funding availability, we will be looking to tap on that right away. And that, um, and that uh, there are other projects that we think that we, that we are safe enough that fit within just sort of common sense that won't necessarily require a detailed housing assessment for us to pursue okay, fully. Okay, so give me this needs assessment again. What is the deliverable for $100,000? Again, this is being run through the deputy mayor's office. I know. I and so I to ask him about Yeah, it. and I, I, I know that it's something that, it's something that is, it's, it's really looking at identifying uh, again, citywide, a more granular um, um, identification per income strata, per geographic strata, 
and per demographic strata what the um, what the city's needs would be around housing. Well, I do hope that you will um, plug into that. Oh, no, we are very much a partner. About, um, it would, you know, why they're doing it, I don't know. But okay, so it is. Um, you expect to get that in the summer. You would have already made the six or begin to make decisions about the $67 million um, in housing production trust fund money that you'll get in 13. Mm -hmm. Now, you won't expend that. No, this will be now, You had in your testimony how you thought you would be expending it. Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, an elongated process. We, we, we are careful not to use the word award. Uh, we are actually um, you know, based on how uh, complete and worthy these proposals come in, we engage the developers, both nonprofit and for profit, in further underwriting um, questioning and further further uh, uh, project uh, information. That takes a little, that takes a little while before we actually get to a, a hard contract. Okay, so tell me what uh, this proposal uh, changes for your single family rehab program. It really does look at, at uh, adding uh, substantially more funding to the program. It's a program in which we think is one that um, um, is very valuable for the preservation of, of existing housing, particularly for seniors, where uh, if you can actually provide some government funding for low income folks to, to replace major systems that are broken, almost by definition you're preserving that housing. So this particular initiative is looking to put $7 million into that uh, around $7 million into that particular effort, uh, as well as another $7 million into the lead-based effort. This is about twice as much as has been traditionally put into those programs. Now, we heard from a former employee. Uh, does the district owe him money? Yes, and uh, the check is available and it can be picked up tomorrow morning. Okay. Is there a new director of that program? Not yet. We're still looking to fill the position. Okay. Is there any backlog in that program? Uh, there is. Can you talk to me about that? Uh, Robert, do you know the backlog off the top? you know the, the okay. status at the top of your head? I don't have the numbers in front of me. We are working on that. It's approximately 40 or so units. Do you know the numbers off the top of your head in terms of backlog? I think we have uh, about 40, uh, 40 to, to 50 um, applications. The, the staff is working very diligently um, to uh, blast through those. Who's responsible for that program at the table? Uh, Nathan. You are? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you have a, you have 40 applications waiting. What's the balance for this year? How much money do you have to spend for this year on this program? I believe it's 3.2 million, I believe. That's remaining? Uh, of, re of what was remaining? Um, I'm not sure about yeah, that one. Yeah, Um, I think what you've reported to us is that you spent about 35 percent. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. That sounds right. Um, how many how many people work in that program? Uh, we have about six individuals, seven individuals in those in that program. So, are you concerned, director, about the number of applications waiting? Yes, in heaven. Uh, this is actually, we have a, uh, a schedule, irrespective of the leaving of the director, that c calls for all the backlog to be caught up by the end of the calendar year. Um, so we've, we, are, we've already, I've already recognized that as an issue. Uh, are they getting any new employees? Uh, right now, no. It's not you're, you're increasing the work, it sounds like. With board appro with council approval, yes. Well. I like this program a lot. I think that it has a great benefit to preserving housing. Mm -hmm. um, so you are proposing to increase the number of employees that you have, right? If I can clarify that, do you have to, Robert? Good afternoon, Councilmember Bowser. Uh, we do have recruitment in place to um, replace two positions right now. We have on the board uh, for construction analysts and also for loan specialists. But there are two existing positions? Those are two existing vacancies. That's what about correct. your director? That'll be the next one. That'll be. Okay. That'll be coming out. So those are, that will keep you at six employees? That's correct. Okay. So now you have three employees. You have three filled positions in that, in that area? No, we currently have no. uh, five. 
five em existing employees uh, currently. Okay. Well, for for in the division uh, in that program area, one additional employee is, that's detailed. Okay. So how many how many FTEs are dedicated to that program? Yeah. There are currently six FTEs. Okay, dedicated. there are currently six, yes. and you're advertising for two That's of the six? Yes. So that means that there are four people filling them? There's currently four, four individuals within that division, yes. Okay, does that Unit. match with what you know? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there are four people? That's correct. Okay, and does that include the director? Uh, no, it does not. So you the have six the plus the director? The manager of the program um, position is not yet advertised, so I'm not counting that position at this point. But the FTEs that you're asking about does include the director of the program, so six authorized positions does include the manager of the program. Okay, so there, what I'm really trying to get at is are there actually three people working right now in the program? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so you have three people working. You have two advertising. You're about to advertise for the director. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And you're about 35% expended. Well, it would no, there's actually, actually, you're actually at 45, almost 46% expended, of which 900,000, of the availability, 1.4 million available, uh -huh. 900 is available for the program. The rest is staffing and administrative costs. The rest are staffing and administrate. Yes. So not you have nine hundred thousand to Correct. spend in the program for yes. the rest of the year. That's not ob already obligated. And how much did you start with? Three three million three three point one million rounded. Okay. So you want to take the program up to seven million. Correct. And you're not going to add any new FTEs. Well, it's anticipated not at this moment. Okay. But w you're on schedule to get through your backlog. We have. A are you taking new applications? Yes. And so what then would a person be told um, about how long it takes to process their application? So our housing, so everything starts really with our housing counselors. And so they, we actually just had a meeting with them last week about the program. And uh, normally what they do is they walk individuals through the, pro, uh, through the process. Um, there are a couple of different um, couple of steps they, they do have to go through. So between uh, the housing counselors and the DHCD staff that will keep the applicant informed in terms of the next steps of the process. Okay, because you heard the testimony of um, one of the providers who says a lot of people just give up because it's so burdensome on the seniors. Would you, do you have any evidence of that? The individuals give up? No, uh, not, that, not that I have seen. I, we do talk about the need uh, to direct them through the process because as quickly as your documentation, like anything else, as quickly as your documentation comes together, is the quick, the more faster you can move um, through the process. And so, uh, part of our conversation with our housing counselors has been around um, trying to make sure that that proper balance is there, that the individuals know that in order to repair your home, these are the steps that you have to take. Um, we know the need is there, but obviously you have to put the documentation in place so everything else can, can move forward. Are you familiar with Mr. Persons on I the am. case? Yes, ma'am. Is somebody working directly with him to get it resolved? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is it resolvable? I would say uh, Yes, uh, to some extent. Yes, it's more to the it's more to the circumstances than what was discussed. But sure, yes. I'm sure. But why don't we have um, Judo follow up with you sure. so we can figure out what's going on yeah. there? Yes, ma'am. Um, now, Director Kelly, have you had occasion to re review the procedures around this with a fresh set of eyes? Yes, and it, there's when I talk about not necessarily adding new people to it. There's some we have a great opportunity, I think, to to. Uh, to revise the programs. I think one of the things, uh, Madam Chairman, this is an opportunity I think to share with you sort of the, the fundamentals of the budgets that's before you and the committee. It's really about looking at administrative foundations to really get our, our act together around record management and retention, to look at how we deal with our budget management and having that, that budget tie to, to performance, and looking at uh, just using information and technology and just getting our back office activity braced for the additional dollars that may, may come our way. The other piece, though, and Nathan uh, referenced it just a moment ago, is about outreach and communication. Really, we find folks that just have not, and it's our responsibility, we have just not done a good enough job of letting folks know what the criteria is 
to engage and to, and to really um, take advantage of the programs we have. So we're going to be really looking at trying to make that as clear as possible, streamline it as much as possible, and getting to the point that when applications do come through the door, working with our community-based organizations, they're more readily able to be approved. Um, so that's, that's, that whole effort is one that, that is very important to us. I think I've shared with you on a couple of occasions that uh, you know I was in the city for almost nine years working as a director of a housing agency, and I was not even familiar with all of the wonderful things that DHCD does. So if I'm not aware of it, then it's hard to say that all the public would not be. So I think we also have a responsibility. To are, really you, are you transferring, um, Ms. Chanman, um, balance from the single family rehab and the lead safe programs into 14? The additional funding for those two programs is coming from the from the Housing Production Trust Fund. Not from previous years? It, it would be part of the prior year fund balance that is available, that would become available at the end of 2013, available for 2014. But well, what is the yeah. fund balance from? Is it from the program's it, allocation for the pre previous year? It is from the agency's allocation from a prior year that may have not been fully spent out. And but I, not, de not uh, assigned not, to this program? Not assigned to this program. Can I also, for the record, I said six FTEs. It's really, for the record, seven FTEs. One of those FTEs is an administrative support staff person. I just wanted to clarify the record. Okay, gotcha. Um, you were talking about your back office. Now, this is not in your budget, um, but there is a $4 million allocation in Opto yes. for uh, affordable housing data. Yeah base creation. Yes. What is your involvement in that? Well, it's pretty uh, pretty direct. Uh, one of our senior staff folks, um, Jill Stucker, is, is assigned to quarterback that uh, within the deputy mayor's office. So we have a direct relationship with the deputy mayor's office in in um, in, um, in working on that. So we have a shared we have a shared agreement with the deputy mayor's office. It's one that, that okay, uh, except the money is at Octo. Right, but in terms of the administration of the program, not not okay. the larger thing. Octo is actually is actually doing the the leg work around the computer stuff, but try to you know gathering the the larger data that would get put into the system is something that's being head by the deputy mayor's office. Okay, so um, what can you tell me about that process? Well, it's one that um, it's the it, gathering of the data. Yeah, it's it's one in which uh, our immediate sister agencies, the Housing Authority and the Housing Finance Agency, and ours, and with DEMPED, uh, run a pipeline that, that we share with each, with each other all the time. So, in terms of levels of complexity, we have this. We I think we have a pretty good starting point. However, when you really talk about all the other kinds of housing that uh, that's um, that's governmentally supported. Uh, for example, the um, the housing f that, that gets done for tenant-based low uh, low rent supplement programs, for example, or or programs that are administered for the Department of Mental Health or DHS, et cetera, then it becomes a little more nuanced and a little more difficult to to track. Um, so this is a project I think in which we're now looking to try to have a a robust and real-time database that we can start to look at at um, managing. Um, the resources that we come through our, our collective agencies to target it, much like this assessment discussion we had a minute ago, but, it, but the decisions will, will be based on much more accurate data about what the district is currently providing, where it's currently providing it, and what are the, the gaps that need to be done. Do you know where the $4. million figure came from? I think it was part of a, uh, uh, there was a, a request, I think, that came from the board to look at, at developing a tool. I forget that there was actually a request that came from the, the city council that talked about having a December deadline to come up with this kind of starting point, a tool. So the deputy mayor's office and, and again, a lot of the, the, uh, the DEMPED cluster uh, was tasked to um, look at providing input and providing um, staff work to start to put together the, um, the parameters of this, this engagement. Okay, so you, you think that they did some 
kind of feeling out or getting some estimates for how much the work would cost. Absolutely. Okay. And on the, just skipping back to the Housing Production Trust Fund for a minute, um, are you, when, when is the next report coming out? We have the 2011 report, which is available now. I think it's something I shared with some of our uh, uh, colleagues earlier today. We're going to try to get this out on an electronic form right away and have a, a bound edition um, uh, produced relatively quickly. Uh, we're so probably, it will be for the, for the calendar year 2012? That's the next one that, yes, for calendar year 2012. So the calendar year 2011 is complete? Yes. And you do it on calendar year? Is that yes, as okay. a larger report. However, again, in terms of getting caught up, we are responsible, I would like to be responsible to produce this quarterly, not annually. Okay. So I would like to bring us up to this, to this point. We have 2011, we're probably another hopefully 30 days or so out from 2012, and then from this point forward, we'd be, we'd be looking at providing these reports quarterly. So um, have you, have the, the cost of administering the Housing Production Trust Fund increased? Um. Well, I, I, the way, the Housing Production Trust Fund is a source of funding for the agency's overall programs. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't say that the administrative cost of the, of the trust fund have increased, the administrative cost of the agency's programs have increased, thus the need for um, a higher proportionate share um, in terms of the burden of cost from the Housing Production Trust Fund is required. So you, you are taking more money from the Housing Protection Trust Fund to pay to administer all of the agency's programs? It's all sources of funds because our federal all grants, as they go down, and we were facing the whole sequester situation, so those costs have had to been um, moved, the sequestered dollars in terms of what we anticipate losing um, and the impact in 2014. We had to move those costs over to both our, all of our local sources, including our special purpose revenue and our HPTF sources. Now, are you um, responsible? Now, there was $86 million allocated to the task force and another 13, um, I'm sorry, allocated to the trust fund um, and another 13, um, or it says, is allocated to housing task force investments. Are you responsible for the remainder of any of that $13 million? Only the one million dollars of the HPAP dollars. Out of the one, yeah, the one million. Yeah, so of the 13.1 million under the task force, one million is designated for HPAP, the um, Housing Assistance Purchase Program. That's the only portion. The 12.1 would remain with the, the task force and the agencies that are doing that business. Okay. Those services. So you don't have, all, it's all at DHCS, it's the local rent supplement, oh, that's at Housing Authority. Rapid rehousing is at DHS. Emergency rental is at DHCS. Um, DHS, rather. And then three, four million is at between um, DEMPED and OCTO for this tool. Mm -hmm. Are the issues with the Skyland compliance um, at HUD resolved? We, Nathan, who's come from HUD, is going to probably talk about it. But the answer is uh, that it's at HUD. We've given them everything we need to that we can produce that uh, to justify the uh, the twenty eight million dollars worth of CDBG uh, uh, grants. We're still waiting from HUD to. Um, to, to respond and to, to confirm. However, Madam Chairman, we went through an exhaustive exer exercise of ensuring that the format and the, and the quantity uh, and quality of our submission met HUD's thresholds. So we're hoping that, there there, you know, that what we have submitted will meet their, the test. 
Okay, we got a, um, a number of concerns about the local rent supplement program and the uh, some budget support language that limits it the use to only priority one uh, homeless families. Can you give me the rationale behind why that's included in the Budget Support Act? Oh. Yeah, it's, I, I think our interpretation, as was noted earlier, was that it's a priority in our current notice of funding availability. I know. I mean, I think that the rationale that many housing providers use is since it's already covered as a priority in your um, NOFA, then it would be unnecessary and actually more restrictive to also restrict the use of the, the local rent supplements. Uh, to only priority one families. I'm, I'm tending to agree with them, and unless you can tell me otherwise, we'll probably remove it from the Budget Support Act. Um, well, again, I think, I mean, obviously, um, I think the intent is that we have uh, a lot of very vulnerable folks in the city, and it, that's what priority one, by definition, means. So I think the intent is to, to really try to do a deep dive into trying to meet that need. I think, as was testified earlier, though, I want to make sure that, that whatever we are doing as a uh, evaluation of our NOFA responses, that don't have to that 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 that, that whatever happens as the Budget Support Act is consistent with that, so we don't have to to change things at the end of the day. Okay. Director, is there anything else? I think we have a, a number of questions that you've provided for us um, in writing that we may have some additional um, comments on um, before we mock up your budget. I will say that we, we continue to look at the Housing Production Trust Fund, and we heard you heard a number of people suggest that was five million here or three million yeah. there? Because um, certainly there are a lot of worthy um, housing needs in the District of Columbia. Yeah. So um, I may want to have an additional conversation with you about um, that. But is there anything else you want to put on the record? Well, just that again, uh, follow up with conversations that your committee and I have had about uh, other tools that existing that, that are existing in the Department of Housing and Community Development. There are things like the property acquisition and disposition tool, for example. There are things that I'd like to continue to work with you and the committee to see how we can um, uh, breathe fresher and more robust life into those programs as well. Okay, sounds good. Um, those are my questions for now, and it is 5:45. We're adjourned. <laughs>